Network, one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Foghorn, for hire. Oh, there are other ways to say it, but down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to put your best foot forward. Especially if you want to trip up a friend. Down here, a friend is anybody who's been dead more than ten years. And then it pays to watch out, because if you relax, somebody will come along and knock you on the back of your stomach. Works out all right, though. I rent boats and do anything else you can hide in the dark. It's about all you can ask, because along the Embarcadero, nothing's perfect except the heels. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. She was a lovely girl. The sort of person you'd expect to see in a choir loft about three hours after choir practice. Her hair was red. Her eyes were as cold as rigor mortis. And you knew the first time you met her that you'd been seeing her too often. Must have been about five o'clock in the afternoon. I was walking down toward Pier 19 when she pulled up alongside of me in a cream convertible. Can I give you a lift? You already have. Well, is that love or reflex action? What's on your mind? You are, Mr. Novak, but don't put on your tracksuit. It's a business matter. Well, in that case, you've got a name. I'm Con Regan. I went by your office a few minutes ago, but you were out. I'm in now. Go ahead. It won't take me long, Mr. Novak. Stay away from Rory Malone. Well, I'm doing all right so far. Who is he? He's important to me. I don't want to lose him, Mr. Novak, so please stay away. Go tell a girl. I don't even know the guy. You will. You're not lying now. He's a prize fighter, and someone's going to try and hurt him. Then you'd rather hurt him first. I'm willing to pay you to stay away from him. Suppose I'm going to see him a lot. Will you pay a lot? I'll give you $300. All right, Mr. Novak? You know, you're not smart, Angel. If you're pressing that hard, the other team's going to bid, too. The answer's no. I'm afraid that's up to you. But I'm warning you, don't do it. Please don't do it. Yeah, that's what Mother used to say. I'm still all right. Maybe Mother liked you better, Mr. Novak. See you later. Well, I watched her for a minute as she brushed her hair back and started the car. It was nice hair, and the dress helped, too. It was dark blue and had a V-neck, but the designer believed in big letters. She pulled away and gave me a look you could take on a safari. It was enough to tell me that she was as safe as a tap dancer on a floor full of dynamite caps. I walked up and turned in at Pier 19. When I reached the door of the office, I could see the old man sitting by the desk. He looked tired and a year older than the Bible. His hands were shaking and his skin was coarse and the color of an old razor strap. When I walked in, he glanced up at me and looked about as happy as a cocker spaniel with a stomach ache. I could talk to you, please, Mr. Novak. You'll try it once. Go ahead. I'm an old man. You want to argue or go on? I'm too old, so I must come to someone for help. Uh, my name is Hans Neumeyer. I would like you to watch someone for me. Someone like Rory Malone? Yeah. But you do not What know is what... this? Save Rory Malone week? What's he to you? I'm his uh, manager. Oh, you don't ever hear of me because I'm old and uh, not a very good manager, I guess. After this fight, Rory find a new manager, maybe. Yeah? What's, when's this fight? Uh, tonight. Oh, you, you don't know Rory. He's a good boy. He's a very good boy, Rory. Is. Yeah, well, good boys don't need watching. Has he got some bad coming out? Well, it's something funny about this fight. He meets with bad people. And Rory is a good boy. Yeah, I just met one. How deep do they run? Uh, the worst is a fellow named Joe Slagle. He's a bad man. A gambler. 
Please, Mr. Novak, you just watch Corey tonight and see he's all right. Are you that rich? Oh, please, I don't have much money. Just uh, $300, maybe, what I got from the fight. Maybe 300 I don't know. I just got a little money. It's a tie, Pop. You win the toss. <laughs> Please, you you don't help me. You win. You win, Pop. When do I look at him? Uh, tonight, you come before the fight. In the dressing room, I show you to Rory, and you see he's all right. Yeah, about nine. Yeah. Please, Mr. Novak. I, I thank you all my life. You watch Rory. I, I thank you all my life. Yeah, well, I'm getting short shift on that, but I suppose it's not your fault, Pop. See you at nine. <laughs> Well, I felt sorry for him when he turned and walked out of there. I could afford it. With 300 bucks, you can buy a lot of crying towels. At the door, he turned and smiled once before he shuffled out. He moved down the pier with a nervous, uncertain motion like a flower petal in a warm wind. When he disappeared, I took a cab and rode up to the press club. Oh, I found out a lot about Rory Malone, and most of it was good. He was a lightweight, and Hans Newmeyer had picked him up and brought him through the prelims up to main event stuff. He was fighting tonight against a Cleveland boy named George Zarek, and the betting was even. I ran into a Chronicle man whose wife divorced him and named a fight club as correspondent, and he said not to worry about Joe Slagle, that Rory Malone fought for purses, and that's all. He knew about the girl, Con Regan, but he didn't want to say much, just that she was a fast, five-gated horse trying for seven. Well, I had some dinner, and I went over to the arena about 8.30. When I walked into Roy Malone's dressing room, Hans Newmeyer wasn't anywhere around. I stood over in a corner and watched him get ready for the fight. There was enough liniment being thrown around to keep an old lady's home spry for years. The other handlers were in, watching him tape up Malone and put on the gloves. Most of the people cleared out then. Malone shadowboxed a minute before a second threw a robe around his shoulders and shoved him toward the door. As he passed, I fell in beside him and we started walking under the arena. A few feet down, I bumped up against him. Ah. Sorry? About what, Hans Newmeyer? Who are you? Where's Newmeyer? What do you care? My name's Novak. I'm supposed to meet him here. Do you know where he is? No, he didn't show up. He's probably out drunk. Does he drink? No. Well, that's a funny answer. I don't know where he is. All I know is I need him tonight. I got to get up to the ring. I'll go with you. Suit yourself. You gonna win tonight? You never know. Sometimes you do. Mister, you're either too smart or too dumb. What's the difference? You can't fight twice in one night. I want to talk to you, Rory. Not now, Kitty. After the fight. Please, Rory, talk to me now. Kitty, you're crazy. This guy's standing around. A lot of other people. What do you want to do? Put him on the radio? Where's Hans? He hasn't been around. Where is he, Rory? I don't know, Kitty. If I knew, I'd get him. There's something wrong, Rory. I've been watching. I know there's something wrong about this fight. Yeah, yeah, there's only going to be one guy fighting if you don't let me Please, out. Please, Rory, don't brush me off like a dumb fly. I, I know there's something wrong. I don't want you to get into trouble. All right, Kitty. Oh, don't say all right when you know how I feel. Well, let's talk about you and Joe Slagle. Oh, please, Rory. You don't know what it's like to see somebody you love go crazy. Your dough is safe, Kitty. <laughs> that doesn't count. You know that doesn't count, Rory. Little money I saved doesn't count next to you. Oh, please, Rory, don't do anything wrong. I'd, I'd die. I'd, I'd die of terrible heartbreak. It hurt me all my life. Stop it, will you, Kitty? Now stop crying. Don't worry, I'll win. Just, just don't let anything happen, Roy. I won't. I'll see you after the fight. Coming, Novak? Yeah. You're real good with your women, Malone. After this fight, I want a match with you, Novak. I've met two of them, and they both have you and their dream books right on the fly leaf. I'll remember. Talk some more. I'll talk enough to tell you that you're being followed about 12 inches behind. That's right, Malone. Keep walking. Turn in the next door. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You better walk, Malone, unless you can outrun a bullet. You too, mister. I agreed an hour ago. All right. Open the door for him, Eddie. Okay. You stand over here. I'm alone. Take off your glove. I'm gonna need it. You're gonna be eating teeth. Take off your glove. Help him, Eddie. Yeah. That's it. Hold him on the other side, Steve. Put his hand on the table, Eddie. Now give me the block. 
Yeah. You can cry, Malone. It's gonna hurt. Hold him up. Keep his hand out there, Eddie. Put the glove back on, Malone. It's too smashed up. It'll hold the pieces. Put it on. You better put it on, Malone. You're overmatched. That's it. Now, go on up there and look good. Yeah, why don't you load him the gun and he'll win in two rounds? Look, mister, I don't know who you are, but I'm sick of your mouth. It's a big floor, so stretch out. two hours, they either moved me or the arena because I woke up in an alley down near the Golden Gate Theater. It was in back of a restaurant, and I was lying there trying to look good in a mixed green salad. My head was about the size of a diving bell, and my clothes were so rumpled and dirty, I looked like a leg man for the hobo news. I tried to get to my feet once, but it wasn't easy. It was like trying to push a basketball through a stovepipe. I think it was close to 11 when I got out to the street. I didn't even buy a paper to find out about the fight. I grabbed a cab and went up to my apartment to iron out my spine. It was a good idea, but the girl at the desk had a message from Hans Neumeyer. He was out at the California General Hospital and he wanted to see me right away. When I got there, he was at the end of a ward on the third floor, but the duty nurse wouldn't let me by. Oh, she was a real pretty nurse, if you like pure mammal. Somebody buzzed, and when she oozed down the hall, I ducked into the ward and started looking for Hans Neumeyer. It was dark, and he was away down at the end behind a white screen. He looked tired, and his eyes were moist and soft, like a ripe fruit that's just been squeezed too hard. Uh, Please, Mr. Novak, you come to see me. Yeah, just as soon as I got your message. You make mistake with hunts. I don't send message. Somebody wants to be your secretary. What happened to you? In my room. I just go to my room. Somebody is there. I don't know. All is all right. I limped a little, mister. Your boy got his hand smashed. Uh, all is a good boy. He's got a good girl. Who's Kitty? Oh, she's go with Rory a long time. Save money to marry this. Wait a minute. Keep still. Something the matter? Yeah. Somebody coming. Down this way. Coming up behind that curtain. Maybe Rory comes to visit me. Whoever came to visit him didn't stay long. The old man leaned back in the bed and quit without any fanfare, like a long summer coming to an end. Well, I went out to get the nurse, and I found her down at the end of the hall giving an intern some greedy talk. She hadn't heard the shots, and they hadn't seen anybody come out of the ward. I told her as much as I could, and then she wheeled the old man into another room and called homicide. Now, that call to homicide didn't help, because from now on, things weren't going to improve. I was fighting a forest fire with a can of kerosene. About 20 minutes later, Inspector Hellman showed up. He was full of finesse and fury, and he came charging over about as graceful as a lame lobster. Hello, Novak. You're up late. I had company most of the time. Yeah, and did he bore you? Somebody got tired of him. It happened behind a screen down there in the ward. Who is he? Guy by the name of Hans Neumeyer. He manages a fighter named Rory Malone. Yeah? The killing's mixed up with a fight fix. Not the Zarek fight. Yeah, that's right. They got to Rory Malone ten minutes before ring time. You got a thin story, Novak. Look, I got a fat one. And I got all the gambling going town on my side. The old man got it because Rory Malone was dumped in that fight. I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it, Hellman. They smashed him up. His right hand was as limp as an old piece of lettuce when he climbed into that ring. They should have smashed both hands. Huh? Because Rory Malone won by a knockout in the fifth round. Try another page, Novak. When Hellman told me Rory Malone won that fight, I might as well have handed him a feather. I stood there feeling like a guy peddling dope at his sister's wedding. How could Rory Malone have won that fight with a, without a hand grenade? When I saw the hand, it wasn't strong enough to flatten a piece of silk on an ivory table, and yet he won by a knockout in the fifth round. I pointed to one thing. Zarek had taken a dive. 
But why the double fix? Why had they smashed Rory's hand? Oh, it was a goofy pitch, like sending for a plumber to fix a hole in Boulder Dam. I didn't have time to wrestle around with it because Hellman had talk on his mind. You can't get a bookie in town to take bets on this one, Novak. No, not with you setting the odds. They were that way when I got here, so don't write up a clean bill of health. The guy's dead and nobody else is volunteering. Oh, you'd muff a confession anyway. Before you tumble, they'd have to cut it in stone across the front of City Hall. What were you doing with the old man? Helping him over the rough spots. Or taking him over the hurdle. He hired me to watch Roy Malone. They were stepping up the pace on his boy. For instance? For instance, Joe Slagle. Everybody says he had a stake in the fight. You don't throw a fight by winning in the fifth round. That's what the book says, but sometimes the book's wrong. You better look up Joe Slagle, and on the same trip, you can stop by and see a gal named Con Regan. Yeah? Why? She's Malone's new sparring partner, a tall redhead with lots of dry cells. Oh. She sounds nice. I'll talk to her. And Slagle, too. But I'm going to find out about you and Rory Malone first. I'm going to run down the stuff on this fight, and I'll find out where you fit in. Don't worry, Novak. I'll dig you out. You could take the jelly out of an omelet, Hellman. Look up the girl and Joe Slagle. They'll talk. Not about each other. There's some connection there. I'll give even money their friends. They ought to be. What? They were married a month ago in Las Vegas. Or don't you know about love? <laughs> Hellman stood there a moment and smiled like a guy who's just killed a landlord. And then he turned around and walked out. Well, I stayed until they wrapped up the old man. And after that, I went to the Chronicle office and pulled the clips on Joe Slagle. He'd been to three jails and gotten his masters at Alcatraz, and there were some pictures of him at the racetrack. He had a face any museum would buy, and a Ford that was so low he must have had to look down to see his hairline. There was one other thing about him I noticed. He was the same guy who'd smashed Rory Malone's hand. I began to wonder about that friendship, but it was getting late and I had to work fast, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Well, he's a smart guy, and until he decided a head on your beer is worth more than a head on your shoulders. I finally found him in a little joint down on Geary Street, talking some woman into giving up all men under 50. Ah, Patsy. I've missed you in a rather trivial way. Yeah, all right, Jocko. I'm giving this woman a lecture on diminishing returns. Jocko, will you stop drinking long enough to listen? Patsy, you fail to understand my drinking. Actually, I hate whiskey, but I go on drinking as a sort of shock to providence. Yeah. Because everyone knows the guardian angels take care of small children and tipplers. And since I've passed the age where I look well in rompers, this is a very clever dodge to get a little outside help. Jocko, are you ever going to change? Patsy, don't, don't you know what a burden change is to a man as old as I am? Oh, yeah. Lord, see, it's not the change we mind. It's the way it happens uh, by degrees, never giving you a chance to remember anything else so. It's heartbreaking, Patrick. All right, all right. It's like visiting a half-forgotten neighborhood. It hasn't changed completely, just parts of it. A few old houses and some human remnants is still around, enough to remind you of the change, but never enough to make you happy. It's that way with growing old. Will you listen? They don't allow you to grow old suddenly and leave. They insist on this policy of having you dribble off into eternity. It's undignified, Patsy, feeling like a bowl of old dishwater with the stopper pulled out. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Why didn't you say so? What's the matter? An old guy by the name of Hans Neumeyer is dead. Oh, bless him. Homicide's full of fever. They think I killed the old man. What did he do before he uh, stopped doing it? A fight manager. He hired me to watch his fighter, Rory Malone. He should have hired a team because somebody got to him in the hospital tonight. How do you fit in? Well, I was just passing through when the noise started. That was General Custer's problem. It's tied up with tonight's fight. Newmeyer was afraid of a gambler named Joe Slagle. He was around tonight and smashed Malone's hand before ring time. That's a hard way to lose. Yeah, well, it's a harder way to win. Malone won by a knockout in the fifth. Was he fighting his father? I'm not getting any place, Jocko, and I'm doing it in a hurry. It's a bad fit all the way around. They took two tries to get the old man, and if Slagle bought the fight, why'd he smash Malone's hand? Let's have a drink. Jocko, you got to help me. Oh, it's the first that's confusing. I want you to get up to Roy Malone's place. You can find it in the book. Go through his stuff and try to pick up a lead, will you? Why don't you do it? I'm going to look up a girlfriend named Con Regan. She's married to Slagle, but she's trying to work Malone into the act. Oh, well, in that case, uh... I'd be in the way. Look, I'm in a spot, Jocko. Now get up to that apartment, will you? What if Malone walks in and finds me going through his stuff? Stop worrying. He almost killed a man with one broken hand. Suppose someone smashed the other one. Well, I had
had to do something quick because the kettle was on the boil. By the time Hellman got to him, Slagle would have an alibi, and my story about the smashed hand wouldn't prove a thing. Oh, I had to grope around and pretend like a guy on the second verse of the national anthem. I decided to tag by Slagle's place, and on the way, I bought a paper to read about the fight. Malone looked real bad for four rounds and then came out of the woods fast with a left hand in the fifth. It was about midnight when I got to Slagle's apartment and began to look more and more like it when Con Regan opened the door. Oh, I could see Rory's point. She was the sort of a woman you'd never give a second look because the first did paralyze you. Her red hair looked brighter now and, well, legs like that are the reason silkworms are born. She smiled, and you knew if you never made Naples, you could die happy with her. But I guess she picked her friends. It's too late for the 300 now, Mr. Novak. I'm working free. Invite me in. Huh? Sorry, darling. <laughs> you look lonely. Where's Slater? I agreed to marry him, not follow him. How about Malone? Somebody killed his manager. I'd like to help you, Mr. Novak, but I don't like you well enough. Well, you can make love later. Give me answers now. Where are you going? You're not welcome. I want to know what those bags are packed for. I don't trust the drawers. Now get out of here, Mr. Novak. Calm down and put the gun away. Get out of here. You came uninvited, I'll kill you the same way. Hello, Novak. You gonna lose an argument? Well, it looks that way. If she's yours, call her off, Malone. You're too tough, Con. Let him walk up. He steamed in here full of questions. That's a bad way to answer. Relax. That's what your man Newmeyer's doing. Somebody killed him tonight. I know that, Novak. Your eyes aren't very red. I can't help it, Novak. All I can do is square his beef. Well, you can start with your girlfriend. She's leaving town, or did you buy the tickets? That's your hurry, Con. If I want to leave, I can leave, Rory. I'll argue with you. You'll get the short end, Rory, because I'm leaving. Stay away from me. You're too close. Rory, <laughs> stop it. Someday they'll match you even, Rory. Maybe it's a referee. I'll get it. Yeah. You got a deep voice, Miss Regan. What's on your mind, Hellman? Joe Slagle right now. He cleaned up in tonight's fight. Not with a betting even. Wasn't after the first round. Word got out that Malone broke his hand. The betting changed. And Slagle covered every bet in the house. That's right. Well, the old man tumbled before it happened. That's what he was afraid of. And the shock killed him? Slagle did. You got a motive now, Hellman. You better look him up. We did. He's dead. He couldn't be dead. If he's not, the bullet holes are good fakes. See you soon, Novak. <laughs> I didn't talk to the girl and Rory because I knew they'd dummy up on me and I had nothing to go on. Oh, it was like trying to build a wall out of jelly consomme. Nothing added up now. Whose side was Rory on and where did that other girl, Kitty, fit in? My luck was on the black market tonight and I knew it. So I went by my place to check with Jocko. He was in the kitchen and he looked worried. Ah, Patsy, uh, you know, I was going to break open the thermometer until I found this bottle in the closet. All right, Jack, what'd you find out? That it pays to know Joe Slagle. There's a $20,000 check in Malone's desk. Slagle signed it. He could afford it. Somebody killed him an hour ago. Where was Malone? I don't know, but that's not gratitude. Maybe he'll wire regrets. Hmm? You'd better get up there. All his stuff's packed for a long trip. Well, well. A couple of trunks and all his bags. Does that sound like a weekend party? I don't know, Jocko. He's kind of fancy. Maybe he likes a lot of laundry. Up to now, it was like trying to melt a pound of diamonds. But when the turn comes, everything happens in a hurry. And things began to fall faster than snow off a warm roof. If Jocko was right, it meant Rory and the girl fought, but they did a lot of clinching between rounds. Well, I got a hold of Hellman and brought him up to date, and then I started for Rory Malone's apartment. When I got there, Hellman was outside the door listening, as quiet as a washing machine full of pebbles. They must be in the back room. I can't hear a thing. You couldn't hear a rifle shot in a boxcar, Hellman. Let's get a better view, huh? Hello, Novak. You're gonna miss your train, Malone. I don't believe you. It's a chance to bet, Mr. Novak. This is Inspector Hellman from Homicide. Well, you guessed wrong, Inspector. I'm covered for Joe Slagle. Novak here's alibi for Miss Regan. We can check. You're scraping bottom, mister. We can start with that $20,000 check from Joe Slagle. That's where you'll stop, too. That 20000 covered a sale of my contract. The fight commission can beef, but that's all. You ready, come? I hope you are, too, because you're going downtown. Look, fella, you can make us miss a train, but we'll catch the next one. You're wishing now, Roy. Who's this? A fast friend with a slow burn. Hello, Kitty. Your boyfriend's gonna leave. Say goodbye. Please, Rory, you're crazy to go with her. She makes me that way, Kitty. I'm sorry. Rory, I've done too much for you. 
I've kept loving you all this time. You can't leave. You can't leave now. I don't want to be alone. Buy a dog. Oh, no, Rory. No, I won't let you go. You're too good with guns. Drop it. <laughs> you better take her, Helmut. She's anxious. Oh, please, Rory. I loved you too much for this. I loved you enough to kill somebody. You can't leave, Rory. You can't leave me to myself. When the guy comes, tell him where the baggage is. What'll become of you, Rory Malone? What'll become of you, Rory Malone, when you have to think about me? When you hear the sound of me in your head? Oh, you're brave, Rory. You're brave to leave me alone. Come on, Con. In a place like this, we're wasting you. <laughs> Come back! Come back, Rory Malone! Come back long enough to watch them laugh at me! <laughs> watch them laugh at me for the fool I am! Oh, it's the great fool of the world I am! <laughs> It doesn't prove much, except the right kind of a heel can grind you into the dirt fast. Well, Hellman pieced most of the story together. Slagle and Malone planned the fight, and it went off without a hitch. Slagle bought off the other fighter so that Malone could win as soon as the bets had been covered. Hans Newmeyer had an idea, but he liked Rory too much to believe it. They found out he was coming to me, and Con Regan tried to scare me off. She looked too good to Rory, and the scheme started to grow. He lied to Slagle after the fight about Newmeyer, so Slagle went into the hospital and killed the old man. That left Slagle around to cloud things up, so Rory Malone told a phony story to his girlfriend, Kitty. She loved him enough to kill Slagle. There was no way to stick Rory Malone. He could never fight again with that hand. But he had a check for 20000 bucks to start on him. That's enough to keep love in the living room. Well... Hellman asked only one question. Why would a smart gambler like Slagle take a chance on giving Malone a check for 20,000 bucks? I guess Malone found out when he tried to cash that check because Joe Slagle was big hearted but broke. <laughs> American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the sixth of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Oron. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Yvonne Patey, Stefan Schnabel, Frank Lovejoy, William Bayef, and Ted DeCorsia. This program is being released to our service men and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. <laughs> listening reminder. Don't miss Gene Arthur and Robert Morley when they star in the compelling drama Yesterday's Magic on Theater Guild on the air tonight. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Pat Novak, for hire. I'm Pat Novak, for hire. Uh, 
that's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's an easy way to put it, because if you're going to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to do everything but run for office. I rent boats and kick around a few scruples if the price is right. It's a living, and if anything goes wrong, you can always get your mother a visitor's pass. If you do get in trouble, you go first class all the way. I found that out when I first met Doreen Wilde. It was almost dark, and I was sitting in the office with the door open when she first showed up. Showed up's the right word. The wind was blowing outside and pushed her dress tightly against her legs as she walked in. She was young. From what I could see, she made Cleopatra look like Apple Mary. She had a voice like a bowl of warm stew. Hello. Are you Mr. Novak? That's my story. I'm Doreen Wilde. Mind if I sit down? On your desk here? You'll block the view. You'll get used to the new one. There. Now lean back and let me look at you. Hmm. I want to hire you, Mr. Novak. After the look or before? You've got a power complex, darling. You know a man named Joe Condono? Oh, he's a gambler out on Geary Street. Friend of yours? I don't dislike him that much. We have business connections. That's why I want to hire you. To give him some money tonight. A needy case or a bad debt? A bad debt. Condono has an IOU from my brother for $10,000. You can go from there. Not if I'm supposed to say it was a fixed game. Condono's been around a long time. Yes. That's right. There are only two kinds of gamblers in this town, honest ones and dead ones. So if your brother owes 10 grand, he better pay. That's why I'm hiring you. Just pay off Condono and make sure you get the pictures. Pictures of the Grand Canyon, huh? We'll talk about my past some other time. Well, for the moment, we'll just say you're photogenic. That's right. Your brother can't get the 10 grand, so Condano's shaking you down. Yes. Yeah. I'll bet you make a nice rattle. How did Condano get the pictures? My brother gave them to him. You got a charming brother. You see only his better side. Will you do the job for a hundred dollars? How long is it going to take? Two hours, maybe. You'll have to meet with my brother. To meet with your brother a hundred bucks is coolie wages. He'll give you the information, then you can see Condano. Where do I meet your brother? Room 729, the Dixie Hotel. He'll be there about 8.30. That packing crate down on Powell Street? Your brother's a cutie. I know why knows it wouldn't go in there. We'll meet you there at 8.30. Oh? You gonna be there? Yeah. Do you mind? I can stand it. Correct. Do you carry a spare battery for that gleam in your eye? Your hundred bucks covers that, too. See you at 8.30. She smiled at me, and I felt like a guy that just found an oil well in the basement. Well, there were a lot of things about the deal I didn't like, but she kind of made you forget. I kept remembering her as she walked out of there with a slow, easy gait. She had knee action that'd make a Nash jealous. Well, I hit the Dixie Hotel about 8.25. It was the kind of a hotel that has a 4 a.m. checkout rule. There were two or three guys sitting around reading tip sheets, and over in the corner, a couple of well-upholstered gals were talking about recipes, I guess. The desk clerk was the worst of the lot. He looked like a guy that might have been expelled from Alcatraz. Nobody looked up as I walked through. When I got to 729, I knocked. There was no answer, so I opened the door and walked in. There was a bed lamp on and a lot of smoke in the room. Through the smoke, I could pick out the committee. They were crazy about me. Come on in. Looking for someone? Yeah, yeah, but she's got a better figure than you. Close the door. No, she's not here. I'll just run along. Close the door, mister. You need the ventilation. I said close the door. Now sit down. Sit down on the bed there. You're a tough host. So I'm broken hearted. Just be a good boy now and give it to me, huh? You got the wrong guy. You give it to me fast, mister. I don't know what you're talking about. I came up here to meet somebody. Already met him. I've run across better people in sewers. Now look, meathead, I'm only going to say this once more, so make a copy. You got the wrong guy. You think I got something? I haven't got it. No. No, so you and your playmates swing out of here in your tails. I never saw you until three minutes ago, and I'm tired of the friendship already. All right. Eddie. Yeah? Go through this guy's coat. Yeah, sure. Now wash your hands, Junior, and then put them in your own pockets. Oh. 
Uh, you, uh, you got a favorite profile, fella? Hmm? Because I'm going to put this gun on one side. Take your choice. <coughs> Grab him, hold him up. <coughs> All right, Eddie. Now you don't have to wash your hands. <laughs> I woke up with a head the size of Rhode Island. I rolled over and tried to get up, but I was about as strong as a moth in a wind tunnel. The room was dark, and I couldn't see very well. It was a stale, musty odor. Could have been a marathon dancer's dressing room, with a little fixing up, the sort of place you wouldn't be found dead in. There was a guy lying next to me who didn't feel that way about it. One look at the guy and I could see he was dead from the crew cut down. Somebody wrapped a towel around his throat and forgot to say when. I should have got out of there right then, but I used my brain like a bottle of medicine, a small dose every three hours. I stood there, looking down at him, felt like a guy that's just rolled a seven the second time out. A small chunk of light squeezed through the door and I could see particles of dust settling on his face. He was lying there, straight and white-faced with a little bit of scowl as if he didn't like the idea. I went through his wallet and found a few bucks and some identification. Enough to prove he was Frank Wilde, Doreen's brother. Oh, it looked nice and clear. They'd done everything but pin the IOU on his shirt. Well, I couldn't wait around because when Homicide got there, I was going to be as popular as a can of salmon on Friday. Homicide meant Inspector Hellman, a guy that couldn't even make the vice squad. We were as close as a piccolo and a bass trombone. I got to thinking about him and decided to get out of there. It was a good idea five minutes ago. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. Small wake, huh? Just a few close friends. You always drop by room 729 this time of night? I got a bad memory for faces. Who's your friend? His name's Frank Wilde. That's one answer. I was supposed to meet him here at 830. That's another. You got a third? Hmm? Who killed him? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe three or four people. Maybe a pack of lugs from Joe Condano's. Yeah? I think you're modest, Novak. I think maybe you killed him. Oh, yeah, sure. I wrapped the towel around his neck, beat myself to death with a pistol, and jumped into the same grave. Maybe. Oh, stop it, Hellman. That isn't smart. That still leaves you in the running. I came up here to make a hundred bucks. That's all I know about it. Check down at the desk. They'll tell you. I checked on the way up. The desk clerk says room 729 is in your name. Get your dough back, Hellman. You've been hijacked. Yeah? Look up a gal named Doreen Wilde. Who's she? The stiff sister. He got in a jam with Joe Condano and bailed himself out with some pictures. Oh. What kind of pictures? You just look her up and find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. I got a bird in the hand. And call on Joe Condano. His gunsel's held a convention here tonight. That's too much legwork. You're handy, Novak. I can't afford a bum rap, Hellman. Get yourself another boy. You get me one. It's your hotel room. There's a dead guy in it, and you got a bad record. I can make that add up for the DA. You can't add a pair of zeros without crib notes, Hellman. I can try hard, and I'll be all through in 24 hours. That's how long you got, Novak. You got one day, and you're not going to be lonesome. Because I'm going to put a tail on you the whole time. Well, that'll be fun. I'm going to know where you are every minute. Stop posing, will you? You couldn't follow an elephant across a basketball court. Just stay handy, Novak. I'll be ready. I'm going to fingerprint this room and run that towel through a test. And then I'll be ready. Yeah, you better watch out for that towel. Huh? Remember, when it comes to towels, Hellman, you have to start from scratch. <laughs> Well, when I left, Hellman was smiling like an Academy Award winner. I didn't blame him, because from my side of the road, things looked rough. From here in, he could play a pat hand and come out all right. There were only two other people, Joe Condano and that girl. I was real worried, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Well, he was all right for a guy who tries to drink all the whiskey in the world every night, only some night he's going to make it. I finally found him at the Bellevue Hotel, holed up in the hunt room. He was getting the most he could out of a bottle, old whiskey and young ideas. It was 10 o'clock, and he was carrying a bigger load than the Berlin airlift. <laughs> oh, ho! <laughs> a drink for Mr. Novak, and one for me. I'll have to catch up. Skip me. You busy, Jocko? 
I'm deep in the labor of love. What happened to your face? I got a better offer. I'm in a jam, Jocko. You gotta help me. Well, you're always in a jam. You're the eternal patsy. Also, you're my solitary reason for going on. Forget it, Jocko. Well, you're the last project Providence has allowed me. An hors d'oeuvre that fate has thrown me to nibble on. I'm your conscience, you know. Yeah, all right, all right. You have no conscience of your own. Oh, you have fleeting moments of fright which you confuse as moral sense, but no conscience. All right, let's get off the platform, shall we? I need help quick. Uh, what kind of jam? A big one? Yeah. I woke up about an hour ago holding hands with a dead man. Where? Room 729 at the Dixie Hotel. I hope you changed rooms. Hellman walked in and found me praying for the dead. He's got an idea I did it. A shrewd policeman. That was the second feature. We opened with a pistol whipping by Joe Condano's gunsels. Oh, you gotta help me. Would uh, a drink help? Hellman's got a guy tailing me. I gotta go slow, Jocko. I want you to hit Condano's place and pick up every scrap of dope, will you? Oh, I'd look out of place in the gambling joint. There's a bar. Tour the joint and find out when the boys got back, huh? Where do you plan to be? Uh, hiding under a rose bush? I'm going up to see a girl. She's the dead guy's sister. Are you going up to extend sympathy? Uh, she's mixed up, too. Condano's holding some blackmail pictures. Hmm. Let's reverse the assignment. Now, look, you see Condano, I'll tag by Doreen Wilde's place. Huh? She must be Harry Wilde's daughter. Who's he? The money crowd, to use a low term. What's he like? A retired octopus. After he got sick of chasing cigarette girls, he settled down to be a social worker. Yeah? Now he's like all social workers. A guy who's embarrassed because he wasn't born poor. And for years, he's been annoying the poor by trying to help them. At Condano's place. Now, if you hit anything good, phone me at her apartment. And keep out of trouble. Well, I'd say the same to you if it weren't futile. Good night, lover. <laughs> When I walked out, Geary Street was cold and deserted. The fog had moved in and staked out a claim all the way down to Market Street. There were two Marines across the street arguing, so I didn't hear it at first. When I got out of range, I began to hear the footsteps behind me. I stopped once and the footsteps broke off. I walked on a few yards and the footsteps were right behind me. They had a familiar ring and I was sure it was either Hellman or a water buffalo. When I stopped and waited, Hellman walked up. You're out late, Novak. What happened to that tail? He asked for more dough. I put our best man on it. Where are you going? Well, now I'll bet you get some real good answers on that question. Where are you going, smart boy? Doreen Wilde's apartment. Yeah, why? To find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight? It won't do you any good. Why? Coroner's report. The guy got knocked off about 7 o'clock tonight. Well, he took a long time dying. That towel was a joke. If he wasn't strangled, he would have been red-faced. He wasn't. Oh, well, now let me guess, Hellman. He died of lingering malaria. Yeah, he was poisoned. That means he was dead when you brought him in. Well, that changes things, doesn't it? A little. Don't let me keep you, Novak. I'm busy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Check in your alibi for seven o'clock. I had no alibi for seven o'clock. That was right after the girl left my office. Oh, I might be able to dig up a witness, but I wasn't sure. It's like asking a horse if he's going to win the derby. Well... The questions were piling up, so I dropped by Doreen Wilde's apartment. I began to wonder. It was right next door to Condano's place. When she opened the door, I found out what the right kind of breakfast food will do. She was wearing a slack suit without much slack. And she was swinging slightly in a warm, slow way. Well, if there was any rhythm there, it's the kind you hear a thousand miles down the Amazon... And when she said hello, you knew it was all chemistry. Hello, Mr. Novak. I missed you at room 729. This will do just as well. Come in. Yeah. Mm. You're wearing your face a different style. Yeah, Condano's boys didn't like it the old way. I like it. I like it very much. Yeah, what happened to you tonight? Frank was supposed to pick me up. He didn't come by. I see. Your brother finally showed up at the hotel. Oh, yes? Yeah. He paid off that IOU. Is that a quaint way of telling me he's dead? I suppose. 
Oh, don't sob so loud. You'll wake the neighbors. You know, by this time, the Timmy Frank was a poor excuse at best. Nothing more. Besides, I knew he was dead. Father's down there now, identifying the body. Just for the record, who has those pictures now? Gondano, I suppose. His boys piled me tonight looking for something. I got the idea it wasn't my social security number. Oh, you've had a busy evening. Yeah, they're going to book me for Frank's murder. Just call me Patsy. You need a drink then, Daddy. It can wait. Now, look, you're going to save some time if you tell me right now. No, I didn't kill Frank. Well, I'd be willing to contribute to a shrine for the man who did. How about Condano? I don't know. In fact, I don't know Mr. Condano. Thirsty yet? Yeah, go ahead. Patsy, I'll give you $5,000 to find out who killed Frank. Hmm? Oh, I'll admit it was a good idea killing him, but I want to see the family name cleared up. Why don't you change names? That's easier. Oh, don't be crude. Will you do it? I may hang, and you can save your five grand. Here's your drink. The money might help. Should we call it a bargain? Suit yourself. Good. You don't want to stand there balancing that drink. No. That's it. Look it on. You know, you're an interesting guy, Patsy. I like you. Yeah? Yes, yeah, don't snowball the statement. Why'd you make it, then? Seems safe enough. You sure? You're a little close, Patsy. Are you sure? At this point, I don't care. Come here, baby. Patsy. What's on your mind? Where I can buy a desert island, cheap. Looks like you got an offer. Mm, father, he's forgotten his key. Excuse me. Come on over, Father. I want you to meet Mr. Novak. Mr. Novak? Yeah, they think I killed your son. Hi. He's the one I told you about. Oh, yes. Yes, now I remember. Uh, it's probably for me. Hello? Oh. Oh, yeah. I think so. I'll, I'll be right there. I've got to run, darlings. Only be gone a while. Father, keep Mr. Novak sober, hmm? I'll pick up from there. Good night, Father. See you soon, Patsy. Hmm. A remarkable girl. She's active, too. Does she always sail out for a night camp? A remarkable girl. More so than Frank? Yes, I, I'm afraid so. You seem to like him better dead. Well, at least he's more harmless that way. But perhaps that sounds unbecoming of a father. Well, if he looks better that way, suit yourself. Well, I've never made any attempt to camouflage my feelings. I'm fond of my daughter. And my son, I've loathed. In a casual way. He's a mishap of nature which for years I've been content to blame on his mother. This matter of the gambling debts, uh, case in point. You know about that? Oh, yes. Plus Doreen's liberal contribution to the problem. By the way, Mr. Novak, who did kill him? I thought maybe you did. No. I'm not a doer. I just cheer from the grandstand. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Um, it's for you, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Patchy. I'm down at Condano. I know that. What'd you find out? Never play two and eight on a roulette wheel. All right, drop the clowning. Well, I found out about your friend. Yeah? They came in about ten o'clock, so that puts them right in line. No, not anymore. The guy got knocked off at seven o'clock. Oh, impatient, wasn't he? In that case, you better start looking for a tie-up between the girl and Condano. Not a chance. No? She doesn't even know Condano. She makes friends very quickly then because she just walked into his office. Well, things were beginning to fall into place. If the girl and Condano were that chummy, they were using those pictures. To squeeze the old man, probably. There was only one thing about it that didn't make sense. Why did Condano's boys beat my brains out if he had the pictures all along? Well, I talked to the old man a while, and then I headed for Condano's joint. They were closed when I got there, so I went home to bed. Oh, well, I'd have given a good price if Tamara never rolled around. But the sun was eating through the haze the next morning when I walked into Condano's place. A sad old biddy with a mop told me Condano was in his office, so I knocked on the door. 
Yeah? Hello, Condano. I'm the guy your boys pistol whipped. Novak, come on in. I wouldn't worry. Maybe you'll heal handsome. Thanks. I'm sorry about that, Novak. I'll bet you are. Well, that's the way you'll get it. It won't come engraved. If I say I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you're full of tears. You gonna shed one when they send me up on a bum murder rap? No, I'll buy you a handkerchief, though. If you got the time, you might tell me what Doreen Wilde was doing in here last night. What do you care? Maybe we're in love. And maybe you're putting the screws on old man Wilde. Hello? Yeah. Did you tell anybody you were coming here? No, just a birdie. It's for you. Yeah. Hello, Jocko. When? Well, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't make sense. Oh, of course not. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. Well, how you feeling, Kendano? Get to the point, Novak. They found a dead guy out in the marina this morning. He was shot and banged up badly, but they identified him. What's that to me? Nothing, except they identified him as Joe Condano. Confused? No. Oh. It was a guy named Eddie Darrow. Friend of yours? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he was. What does that prove? It proves lots, Novak. It proves unless you find her in a cemetery, never trust a woman. Well, with a good assist from Deep Short, we could make it now. I knew that. Condano was mad about something and the lid was going to blow. I called Hellman. His lid was gone ten minutes ago. He had the murder gun and it belonged to old man Wilde. A messenger walked in and put it on the sergeant's desk a few hours ago with no explanation. Well, that was the clincher. From here on in, it was cakes and ale. I told Hellman what I knew. He picked me up at Geary and Taylor and we headed for the Wilde apartment. The girl and the old man were in the living room when we walked in. Everybody had breakfast? Patsy, I didn't know you came out till after dark. Well, we just wanted to call on your old man. Wild, this is Inspector Hellman. Oh, is there anything I can do? You're ambitious, Wild. Hellman's here to arrest you for murder. I'm amused, but not frightened. They might have gone easy on you for killing your son, but not Eddie Darrow. And who is Eddie Darrow? The guy you thought was Condano when you killed him last night. Your daughter was helping him put on that squeeze. She even sent in your gun this morning. Please, Doreen, tell these men. Well, we're starting backfield. Hello, Condano. Step aside, Novak. You don't need that gun, Joe. Not for long. All right. Push the girl out there. Push the girl out there. For a gambler, these are bad odds, Joe. Just keep talking. Just keep talking loud. And when you stop, all of a sudden, you'll know I'm through it. You made the first switch, Joe. I didn't trust you, so I sent Eddie Darrow up. He was a good guy, and I liked him. I didn't kill him, Joe. You made it easy, though. Say him fast, baby. Here it comes. Look out, Tony. Watch the old man. (laughs) Uh, Give me that gun. Yeah. They keep shooting the wrong people around here. Um... Sorry, Hellman. I bungled, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you bungled, Joe. How's the old guy, Novak? You should live so long, Hellman. He's dead. You're gonna need me soon, Hellman. Yeah, right now. Come on, Joe. Tag by headquarters, Novak. Sure. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah. I'm sorry he jumped in front of me. He didn't have to do it. No, but you expected it. I suppose. I'm made to expect things, Patsy. Uh Uh-huh. And you're not going to mind this. (laughs) I expected that, too. You can slap me, but don't leave me, Patsy. I don't want to be alone. You got a cigarette? They're on the table. A match, Patsy? You go build your own fire. I'm leaving. Please, Patsy, I don't want to be alone. You won't. I'll send you a whistle. Goodbye. Sweet double cross right from the start. Frank pitched the first curve. He stole the pictures from Condano's office the day of the payoff. He was going to wait for the dough from his sister and skip. In the meantime, the old man found out about it 
killed the son and left him in the hotel after Condano's boys had cleared out. Oh, it would have worked out all right, but Doreen found the pictures in the old man's room and guessed what happened. She gave him back to Condano and then made a deal with him to put a squeeze on the old man. And then she double-crossed Condano by tipping off the old man that Condano was on his way up. I guess he figured the girl for a fast play and sent a pal instead. The old man didn't know the difference. He really thought he killed Condano. And then the girl wrapped it up by sending his gun to headquarters. Well, things had gone right. She'd have been right in the middle of that gravy boat. Her brother and Condano would be dead. Her father would be up on a murder rap. Once it started to unravel, it moved real fast. The first tip-off I got was when she offered the dough for her brother's killer. She'd have all that dough, and on the book she looked like a field of Vermont snow. She was feeling around between somebody's shoulder blades, and from then on, all the cards fell just right. Condona was probably right. If they're not in the cemetery, watch out. Well, Hellman had only one question. Why would a guy want to kill off a dame like that? After I saw the pictures, I wondered myself. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. Pat Novak for Hire. it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. And if you work real hard and study a little on the side, you gotta trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. Works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to read out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck, you're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. 
And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bay till he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Yeah, well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah. I only got one worry. Huh? Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. <laughs> Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now. And you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the Derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind his shed and waited. The boat pulled away, and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, oh, sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are by a beer and talk to the bartender, I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Well, you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. There's supposed to be a gun in your pocket? Well, you get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hurt your stomach, back down. <laughs> no worries yours, Mr. Timmett. It's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. <laughs> go easy, fellas. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy, then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. Uh, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, lady. I gotta make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. <laughs> Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street and we walked in. One look at that lobby and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch and the legs on it were so warped pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. When we went up to the second floor, we walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. 
She was kind of pretty, except you could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. Good for the cross, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in the corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yeah? I uh, came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. You didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like a price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side, and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line, and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes? Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them is named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. What are you going to do? Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. So am I, Father. If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Well, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. You let me have it. You're going to break your fingernail. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. No. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up? I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony lead. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaven? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. 
You'll save money at least, because you got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Uh, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have your tail. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy Joe Feldman killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. <laughs> Two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a cop. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing. And I'd have a real tough time explaining. I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there... What was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so... I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man. He used to be a smart one, too. Still, he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy! A drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken-down banjo. Not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well, I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy, Feldman, didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while and they cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, Who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Mm, That's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman steamed up, so you gotta help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get on there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. <laughs> As soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. 
The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen. He used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out, he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. You mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send him you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Then you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now the money's gone, so's Norma. No. Do you know where it is? No. Well, you growl and you bite and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. Now you really want that money. I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here, make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Patsy, you ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. By the Red Cross, mister. <laughs> you got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. <laughs> sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in the cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If Homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer, so I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah? I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened man. He looked big to that copper. Please. Please find him. <laughs> yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arquello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket, you uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. 
If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Ah. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off, too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, Ann. No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey, oh, yeah, hey, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. Ma'am. And you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fucking for both murders. My Greeley and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you rock. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you when you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep and that won't help him? But hey, you will. That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. Giffen told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They told you. You ask them what you've got. Ask him what's tearing you to pieces. Ask them. They'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask them. They'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. <laughs> Goodbye, girls. Hello, Mr. Novak. Oh, did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. <laughs> If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy he couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls. Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. 
Giffen followed Joe and killed him out on Arguello, but the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because what Jocko spent at the drinks aren't worth money. <laughs> Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. Pat Novak for Hire. Sure. I'm Pat Novak for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's easy to rent yourself out and you make a few bucks, but sooner or later you get burned. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a man or a mouse. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, they build the traps both ways. Oh, everything looks easy, but sometimes they fool you, like putting shatterproof glass in a fire alarm box. And you gotta watch out every minute. Because down here, if you reach out to help a panhandler, the guy will take your arm and hand you back the dime. I rent boats and deal any place. A good trade in on a secondhand soul. Works out all right. Sometimes you're on top of the heap, if you like the kind of heaps they got down here. But you got to get your laughs in a hurry, because you find out right away you're not going to make any more headway than a hummingbird in a wind tunnel. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. It must have been about 3 o'clock. The sun was out down at the far end of the bay. It put a head on the clouds down there and put the rest of the sky in a good mood. Over across the bay, it was a warm, easy yellow that made you think of a pound cake full of eggs. It was too nice a day to work inside, so I closed shop and started down to a pool hall on Market Street. I never got there, because on the way, I stopped by the laundry to pick up a couple of shirts. It started right there, when the clerk walked over to me. He was full of fizz, and the sort of guy who gets a bottle of hand lotion for his birthday. Well, well, Mr. Novak, is it? I don't know, is it? Uh, yes. My, we have a nice day, haven't we? Yeah, I want some laundry. Uh, not any better than yesterday, though. Not a bit better than yesterday. What do you do? Give them all a rating? How about the laundry, huh? Uh, yes. Let's have the ticket. All right. Mm -hmm. 428. That should be right down here. Just a couple of shirts. What do you... Yes, yes, here it is. Yeah, that'll be a dollar eighty-four, please. Well, sounds like a fair price, but I'll take my own. Own? Own? This isn't mine. It's too big. Are you sure? Look, I had a couple of white shirts. Now, you better look again. Well, the, the tickets match, you see, 428. You must be wrong, Mr. Novak. Now, look, fella, shirts don't swell. They shrink. The package is too big. It's too big? Oh, well, we better open it. Yes. Well, see, I, I can wrap them again easily. Don't worry. Yeah. It, uh... It's not my shade of pink. Oh. I guess it's not yours. Thanks. Here's some men's clothing, too. How about these shirts? If I were a jockey, I'd take them. I want my own. Well, yes, yes, of course you do. Oh, goodness, I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah, you've got a problem. How about these shirts, though? Oh, we've mixed up the tickets, and someone has your package. Who? I don't know. Oh, maybe we can check on the collar markings. Let me see. Yeah. Yes, now. Let me check in the book. Here we are. Uh, this laundry belongs to Earl Hayes. Yeah, where's he live? Uh, are you going up there? I want my shirts back. Uh, yes. He lives at uh, 321 Dorset Place. Yeah, give me that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Novak, and please apologize to Mr. Hayes. I'm so angry at myself, I don't know what to do. Yeah, be careful you don't stop a hole on the floor. See you later. <laughs> I left.
left, he was wringing his hands and shifting from one foot to another like a small kid in a department store. On the way up to Dorset Place, I looked at the bundle. There were a couple of women's blouses and four loud-colored shirts. Two of them looked like a Navajo blanket somebody would sewed buttons on. I tried to wrap up the bundle, and about ten minutes later, I got to 321 Dorset Place. It was up on Telegraph Hill, and it was an old place somebody would remodeled. It was supposed to be modernistic, but it reminded you of a chromium-plated tool shed. Apartment 2A was on the second landing. I went up there and knocked. Earl Hayes didn't answer the door, but you couldn't quarrel with what you got. She was in her thirties and pushing forty hard enough to bruise it. But she looked good standing there in the doorway, long and lean enough to make a greyhound turn in his card. She was wearing green lounging pajamas, and you've seen bananas in looser skins. You could see the bay behind her through the window, and she stood there brushing back enough red hair to sell to a mattress factory. And as she pushed the door back, she started to smile. Her lips were a pale red color and moist enough to put a desert on its feet. And you could tell she thought she used him to talk when you got tired of everything else. Standing there in front of her, you got the same feeling you would if somebody pressed the treble and bass key of an organ at the same time. Hello. What are you selling? Shirts. Is your husband home? Should I have one? I don't know. It depends on the climate. Come on in anyway. All right. Who are you? My name's Novak. I'm looking for a guy named Earl Hayes. You better sit down. It won't take me that long. He's got my shirts. Mr. Novak, you don't look like the kind who'd lose his shirt. I don't want jokes, lady. There was a mix-up down at the laundry. I got Hayes' stuff, and he walked off with mine. That is stuff in the bundle? Yes, it is. All right, put it on the table here. We'll see. I don't think you're smart, Mr. Novak. Huh? Where's the other shirt? You got them all right there. There's one missing. All right, see the laundry. All I want's a trade. There must have been another shirt in this bundle. Maybe it was too dirty. The boy couldn't clean it that fast. Now, look, friend, if you want to argue, go ride a streetcar. I came up for two white shirts. Now, where are they? I suppose Earl Hayes has them. Where's he? I'll send it to him, but I'm afraid you won't like him. Then I'll be lonely. Just tell me where he is. Two floors up. That'll give you time to work over that story. Yeah. Because he'll know you're lying. He'll want to know about that shirt. What makes it that important? The fact that it's missing. Now, find him upstairs. I hope it works into a friendship. Yeah. But I don't think it will. He'll know you're lying and you'll get tossed around like a green salad. Is he tougher than you? No, he's just not as versatile. Good luck, darling. When she said good luck, you knew she was just being polite and didn't mean it any more than the hangman when he tells you to watch your step. When I left, she was over by the window, leaning back against the table, as shy as a runaway boxcar. And you got the idea she'd be fun to know if you had a lot of money and an oxygen tent. Well, I rolled up the bundle and I started for the fourth floor. I knocked on the door and when it opened, I knew I had high bid for trouble. I could see into the room and there were three or four Ghanaf sitting inside. They had a dull, anxious look as if they were trying to find another worm to pull apart. They were the sort of guys who might have been born, but you wouldn't want to bet on it. The one in the door was a big guy with bushy eyebrows that met near his nose, and the way they ran across his face, you got the idea he got tired of the old ones and grafted on a vine instead. His face wasn't much better. It looked more like a relief map than a face. It was pockmarked in the color of moldy bread, and you knew if a woman kissed him, she'd get blood poisoning. Hello, Novak. You Earl Hayes? Enough to suit you. Come in. Uh, you're good at guessing names. So a little bird told me. Yeah, I saw her. She's got nice feathers. Where's the shirt? Here's the bundle. Take your pick. I don't like any of these, Novak. That's all I got. Where's the shirt, Novak? Just wear a collar, mister. You don't need a shirt. <laughs> Yeah, I won't need a memory for you, fella. Suit yourself. Tell me about those shirts. Hello, Earl. Come on in. We got your boy. Who is he? You made a deal. You know his name. I never saw him before, Max. He looks different now. He came up with some of your shirts. That's true. I went by the laundry. Said a guy named Novak picked up the shirts. Except one of them's missing. It couldn't be missing. They're all in one bundle. Ask him then, but do it nice. He's touchy. He doesn't have to ask. Now, look, mister, if you're Earl Hayes, I want my shirts. Give us the other one we'll make a trade. You got the best deal you're going to make, Hayes. Now, I want those shirts. Get yourself a loom, then. All right, Joe, get his arm. Wait a minute, Max. Sit down, Hayes, and we'll take your ticket away. That's it. Now, get his other arm over there. Why do you keep your eye on Hayes? All right, Novak. It's you or Hayes. Make up your mind. I got it made up about you. <laughs> You're going to tie her first, Novak. Where's that shirt? I don't know. Try Hayes. He looks healthy. <laughs> Hold him up. He's slipping. Do you need handles? Hold him up. You're running out of chances, Novak. 
Where's that shirt? I don't know. Hold him up. Why? If you can't find the reason, don't. All right, Hayes. How's your temper? I slid down to the floor so fast I almost went under the varnish, and I spent the next couple of hours checking on the termites. It was getting dark when I woke up, and right away the room was full of company. The host was Earl Hayes, and he was lying on the floor as dead as a cracked bell. He was over by the desk, lying on his back and grabbing at the rug like a Hoover vacuum. The hair was wet against his head, and the perspiration on his forehead started to break up and run down like tears, so you got the idea he cried out of his hairline instead of his eyes. He didn't seem pained or put out. He was smiling a little, as if he realized he had a better deal. Over by the door, Hellman was talking to a couple of coppers. He sent them downstairs and walked over to me. You woke the neighbors, Novak. I don't snore that loud, Hellman. You made the noise with Hayes? Yeah. How'd I get my face this way? You look better to me, Novak. How long have you been here? A couple hours. That fits in. The coroner's already been here. He says Hayes was beat to death an hour ago with that poker out of the fireplace. You better check on the prince. I already sent it down. You slept too long. Hello, Inspector. We came by for the spare. Oh, he's right there. Tell the morgue to keep him out till I get down. Yeah. Come on, Joe. That's it. Grab him. Sure is a little guy. Well, very easy. Tell him I'll check in at eight. So well, Inspector. All right, Novak, tell me all about it. I came up here for a shirt. That's not hard to get. What about Hayes? How'd the beef go? It went both ways with a guy named Max. You better talk to him. I like you better. Oh, you're not bright, Hellman. I've been out of the game for two hours. Look, big shot, don't push me around. You got a story? Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. You could have taken Hayes and run into trouble yourself. That's the hard way, Hellman. I don't like your whip. Get another boy. You'll do, Novak, and you'll do it all downtown. Yeah, Hellman talking. What do you mean you can't send him up yet? Who's in charge down there? Give me the guy in charge. Huh? Well, two guys just came up here. You must have sent him. They were here. You must have sent him. Yeah. Well, you can send him for me. Don't tell me, Hellman. Well, it couldn't happen. No, it couldn't happen to anybody but you, Hellman. It's going to look real good, too, when they find out you let two strangers walk in and steal a body. I don't understand it. It's simple, Hellman. You better go in and rob that bed right now. Uh. Because when they're through kicking you around down at headquarters, you're going to need a sling. And with a figure like yours, it'll take a good-sized bed sheet. <laughs> When Hellman hung up the phone, he turned the color of early summer squash. He stood over by the window, running his hands through his ear. He left the window and stood in the center of the room for a minute. His coat was open and his stomach was piled up on his belt in nice, even layers. It reminded you of a rolled-up garden hose. And the way his pants fit him when he walked, you got the idea somebody sewed an anvil in the lining. After a while, he came over and started to talk to me. He kept pulling his ear, and in the dim light there, it looked like the cross-section of an eggplant. I'm still going to hold you, Novak. You'd look better with a hot potato, Hellman. I'm going to hold you for 12 hours. In the meantime, that body will show up. He didn't look that active to me. Wake up, Hellman. You've been backed into a corner. You better get a body first. Look, Novak, I know the guy was dead. I'm not going to sit on my hands. The most fun you'll ever have. I'm going to check those prints, and I'm going to find out why you were up here. I came to see Hayes. The laundry pulled a switch, and I came up for shirts. Check with the guy at the laundry. Yeah. And on the way downstairs, stop at 2A. Why? There's a souped-up redhead down there. You can ask her a question. You can do that with any woman. You can ask her who Max is. I went there to find Earl Hayes. She answered and sent me here. There's only one thing wrong with that story. Huh? There's no redhead in 2A. I checked all the apartments. 2A's been empty for three months. The people are out of town. Uh, I think you've dreamed her. I don't dream that good in the afternoon. Look, Hellman, I'm walking out of this place, and all you can do is hear the echo. I want to see you go, Novak. Maybe you'll do something wrong, and I'll track you down. You couldn't track down a live bear in a telephone booth. I'll make a try on you, mister, and when I'm through, there'll be enough to put you right in that gas chamber. They can save money and do the same thing. Huh? They can lock me up in the same closet with you. <laughs> I left, Hellman was wandering around like smoke in a drafty room. I picked up Earl Hayes' shirts and ducked by the laundry, but the clerk was gone and the place was closed tighter than the lid on a city scandal. Well, I tried to think back, but nothing made sense. In the first place, what made that shirt so important? And why did the laundry clerk have the wrong address for Earl Hayes? And the main hooker was that body disappearing. Why? If Max killed him, they were in the clear. Why take a gamble like that just for laughs? 
I knew I had to get some answers pretty soon because Hellman wasn't an easy guy. He was a tough, hard cop with a heart big enough to hide behind a piece of bird seed. Well, I had a couple of places to go, so I looked up Jocko Madigan. He's a good guy, and he used to be a smart one, except he didn't like the San Francisco fog and worked out one of his own. I finally found him in the hunt room at the Bellevue Hotel. The crowd was at one end, and he was down at the other. I found out why. Thank you, one for my baby, and one more for the road. Now, wait a minute, Jocko. Ah, Pepsi, I'm singing a little sentimental ballad. All right, Jocko, now you've had enough. Pepsi, I'm as sober as the next man. I've been drinking since 8 o'clock this afternoon, and I'm as sober as the next man. Oh, stop it, will you? Pepsi, you know I hate whiskey. But do you realize that 85% of the human body is liquid? Yeah. Now, is there any sane reason why all that should be water? Of course not. It isn't fair. That's why we have communists. Jocko, I'm in trouble. Of course you are. Knowing you, Patsy, is like walking hand in hand with a moral pygmy. All right. It's true, Patsy. You have no moral sense. All you have is a small bundle of regret, something which you drag out periodically as proof of your decency. Will you listen? But you're not even decent enough to regret the things you've done. From some of your conversations about the only things you regret are the things you haven't done. The only reason you haven't caused more trouble is that you're not fleet-footed enough. All right, all right. You're hopeless, Patsy. You're like some overripe planet, disemboweled and thrown from the skies. You don't know where you're going and you can't remember where you've been. Your only joy is motion and your only sensation are heat and cold. You all through, Jocko? Yes. Uh, what kind of trouble? Hellman wants me for a dead guy. Where is he? He was up on Telegraph Hill, but he's gone now. He didn't die long, did he? Somebody took the body away. That's a funny thing to collect. Oh, none of the story lays right. The guy's name was Earl Hayes. There was a laundry mix-up, and I went up there to trade. Yes? Now, look, I want you to hop down and find out everything you can about Earl Hayes. Find out who his friends are. Find out where he's from. And see if there's a guy named Max anywhere, will you? Uh, where are you going? i got to find a girl. I felt that way myself earlier tonight. Will you hurry, Jocko? We don't have time to run your love life. Yes. Well, time is a minor drawback anyway. Good night, lover. <laughs> It was nearly 11 when I walked out of the bar, and the way things were going, I couldn't beat a vagrancy rap with a pocket full of annuities. I had to find that girl someplace, but it wasn't going to be easy. You might as well try to french fry a kettle of bones. I went back up to that apartment to see if the, she left a pointer anywhere. Hellman had a copper out in front, but he was sitting in somebody's new Nash reading a comic book. I went all through the apartment, and on the way out, I spotted the matches in the wastebasket. The folder had been used up, and on the outside it said Bonton Club, Duval Street, Key West, Florida. Well, that was the first break I got. Most people use their matches fast, so if she was using Key West matches, it must have meant something. I got onto a phone booth and started calling up the hotels. Finally, a hotel up on Taylor said they had a Miss Rhoda Warren on the register from Key West, Florida. For five bucks, a bellhop will tell you anything, so he said she was a redhead. I still didn't know, and when I went up there, she wasn't in. Well, I had to get back to my place for Jocko's call, and when I walked in, I got sorry about that five bucks. Hello, Mr. Novak. You keep bad hours. So do you, and your name's Rhoda Warren. You like the name? Yeah. Go ahead and use it. It's a phony. How about Max? I don't even know him. When you called him today, it was a wrong number. Oh, please, Mr. Novak. You're not big enough for menace. No? No, you're like everybody else in the waterfront. You got the muscles, a few stage whispers, and 30 cents in your pocket. So don't try to make a sale. Except you'd like to buy that shirt. Well, if you want to sell it. What makes it worth a thousand bucks? Your imagination. Five hundred will buy it. You're bad on guesses. Five hundred and Max will do it. Look, I don't have to deal with you, darling. You're a pauper on paper and in your pocket. So I can just sit tight while you sell or go broke. Where's Max? Sell him out. If I were in a hole, I'm not. You are. All right. Let go of my arm. I need some help, lady. I don't know whether you're making love or trouble. Either way, let go of my arm. Have you figured out yet? Please, you're, you're hurting my arm. Where's Max? Come on, I'll twist you until the skin comes loose. Where is he? Please, please don't. All right. I'll make your friends anyway. Yeah, Novak talking. Yeah, I've been out all evening. Whereabouts? Yeah, well, he can't use it anymore. Where are you, the Compton? Yeah, thanks. The laundry clerk? Yeah, he found that shirt. Tell him not to lose his own. I'm wishing good luck. Will he need it? Well, maybe not. But he ought to take it while it's cheap. 
I knew it wouldn't do any good to press her for Max now. If she was going to tip her mitts, she'd do it on her own. I left my place and grabbed a cab for the piers. I got out near market and walked over to the laundry. The back window opened up like a hunk of sky after a bad rain. I found the shirt lying out on the table. It looked like the rest of her old Hayes shirts, except for one thing. The collar was full of writing, a few letters and a lot of numbers. I took them down, left the shirt, and headed for my place. I got one of those shirts from that bundle and copied in some of the same numbers. Then I picked up a cab for Rhoda Warren's hotel. For another fin, the bellhop went blind, and I got into her room about 12.30. Her room was empty, but her bags were packed on the bed. I took a 60-40 chance and planted the shirt in the bottom of one of the bags. I told the bellhop to tip me off when she came in, and I started back to my place to wait for Jocko's call. I did about as well as a bottle of scotch in a Louisville bar. A squad car picked me up at the corner and said Hellman had a call out for me. About 20 minutes later, we pulled up to Pier 19. Hellman was waiting there, moving around like a pea in a boiling stew. Hello, Novak. Walk me down the pier. Find a crutch. What's on your mind, Hellman? Walk me down the pier. All right, but I won't take your arm. We found a body. How? Radar? Almost. The Coast Guard boat spotted him floating in the bag. They radioed in. We're hauling him up now. Yeah. We're all busy. I found a shirt, too. Well, we may not need it. Those fingerprints worked out just right. Well, if they're mine, it's too pat, Hellman. You're too smart a cop to buy that kind of plant. I'm a smart enough cop to hold you, now that we got Earl Hayes. Here we are. Yeah. You got him down there? Yeah, we're passing him up. Grab a hold of that. Here, I'll get him. All right. Hold. There. Well, that water sure changed him, Hellman. There's a mistake. Hey, read his identification. They said it was Earl Hayes. Another plant, Hellman. He's the laundry clerk. What was he doing out in the bay? Maybe that's the way they do the laundry now. Well, I'm going home, Hellman. You better stand on his chest. Huh? That way they can't steal him without taking you, too. <laughs> That 6040 was beginning to pay off. Somebody was gathering up the loose ends, and it was going to be easier now because things were getting tight. But you can say that for a lot of wedding rings. So I bummed a ride, and I got to my place about a half hour later. I had some trouble there because the cop on duty wanted to take me down to Pier 19 again. He looked wistful, so I told him about a place down the street where he might catch a peeping Tom, and I finally got rid of him long enough to get up to the room. As I walked in the door, the phone was ringing. Yep. Hello, Patsy. This is Chaco. What'd you find out? Earl Hayes was popular. Anybody could have killed him. For instance? There's a lot on him in the Chronicle Morgue. He's wanted for smuggling. Yeah? What else? He had a girlfriend. Her picture's here. What's she look like? Oh, I haven't had enough experience. Uh, it's the same one, I guess. What else? And Earl Hayes once served a prison term with a man named Max Stoffer. That's our boy. What do you got on him? He lives here now, and he runs a business out on Van Ness Avenue. What kind of business? Oh, it's going to sound funny. He runs a few well, what does that prove? It doesn't prove a thing. Just because you're a perfume salesman, you don't have to smell pretty. When Jocko hung up, everything began to slip into place. I could see now why everybody wanted that shirt, and the reason why Earl Hayes disappeared was ten feet tall. I called Hellman. He said he knew all about Max Stoffer, and he had a squad car on the way out. I met him at the corner of Geary and Taylor, and we rode out to Van Ness. Max Stoffer's funeral parlor was over near Pine. When we pulled up, the lights were out, except for a lamp in the front room. Hellman walked in the front door without knocking, and we turned in where the light was. It was a big night for stiffs, and there were three or four caskets along the wall. In the center, over near the fireplace, there was a casket on wheels. The plate on the outside said a man named Peter Dawson had the lease. Hellman was about to start upstairs when a door in the bank opened. Hello, Novak. What are you doing here? Is the man with you dead? Not too dead to talk to you, Stuffer. He's Inspector Hellman from Homicide. The bag looks heavy. Are you talking to you or me, Max? Where's she going? I'm putting her on that train, Novak. Do you care? It's up to Hellman. He wants you for killing Earl Hayes. I thought he disappeared. I'll add on the laundry clerk, too. After I visit the train. You put her on that train, she'll get off at the next station, Stoffer. Huh? She gave you a bad story. That shirt you got's a phony. Wait a minute. Save yourself some time, mister. Check her bag. Oh, he's crazy, Max. Make the odds, fella. Let me see that bag. Take a look. He's trying to stampede you, Max. Give it here. No, underneath there. The other side. 
There's no shirt in here. What are you trying? I don't know how it got there, Max. He must have put it there on us. I don't know how it got there. Something crazy's happened. You don't sound sure. Please, Max. Please, Max, stay away. I gave you the right shirt. Yes. <laughs> Max. Max, leave me alone. Yes. Take it, Copper. Take it for the laundry guy. I'll read about you, lady. Jack, you're crazy. You're crazy to tell him. I'll tell him all about it. I'll tell you every word. All right, don't forget yourself, big shot. Don't forget to tell him what you did with Earl Hayes. There's nobody. Oh, you silly fool. You silly fool. Don't you know why they're here? Shut up. To look for them all. You better tell him now. He's in there, Hellman. He's in there with Tater Dawson. You had a chance, baby. <laughs> Leave me alone, Max. Leave me alone or I'll break you up. <laughs> Can't win them all, Max. Put away that gun. <laughs> Get away from her. <laughs> You don't need the gun anymore. No. Pick it up, Copper. Well, you had a big night, lady. Yeah. What happened, Novak? You put that shirt in there and you lied to him. Yeah. You lied to him and he thought I did. He thought I lied to him. What's the difference? As long as you kill him, you still get a prize. <laughs> Next morning was easy for Hellman. He shipped the girl for the story on those shirts. The markings on the collar were bill of lading numbers on stuff going to the islands. Everybody was being watched, so they had to handle it that way. Earl Hayes used to leave the shirts in that laundry, and each time somebody along the line marked one of the shirts. Hayes took the shirts to Max, and he got the information to the right people in the islands. Out there, they had a line on what to hijack. Most of the stuff was gold, and it was a good game for everybody, until that laundry clerk made a goofy mistake. He got the bundles mixed, and he left one shirt out. When Hayes picked up the wrong bundle, the girl and Max thought a double cross was underway. After Max worked me over and killed Hayes, he went down to the laundry shop, and he couldn't find the shirt. He could only think of one thing. Hayes had the shirt on. So he got him out of that apartment. Once he had him out, he figured the easy thing to do was to make him disappear for good. So he put him in a casket with another guy on his way to the boneyard. In the meantime, the clerk found the shirt and called me. The girl overheard the conversation and figured the laundry clerk had the shirt with him. She got in the beef and killed him. She went down to that laundry after me and picked up the shirt. Well, from there on, the cards fell the wrong way. Well, Norman asked only one question. That laundry clerk was an innocent guy. Wasn't it too bad he got knocked off? Oh, I don't know. When you think of how many buttons you lose in a year, it doesn't seem so bad. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings transcribed to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. San Francisco, you always bite off more than you can chew. It's tough on your windpipe, but you don't go hungry. And down here, a lot of people figure it's better to be a fat guy in a graveyard than a thin guy in a stew. That way, you can be sure of a tight fit. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else that makes a sound like money. It works out all right. If your mother doesn't mind you coming home for Easter in a box. I found that out Wednesday night about 9 o'clock. I closed the shop early and I came home to read. It wasn't a bad book if you ever wanted to start a forest fire. It was one of those historical things. 
And the girl in it wandered around like a meat grinder in ribbons. I was moving along all right. She was just getting her second wind before going after the world's record when the door to my apartment opened and the place began to get kind of crowded. From where I sat, the crowd looked good. She sauntered in, moving slowly from side to side like 118 pounds of warm smoke. Her voice was all right, too. It reminded you of a furnace full of marshmallows. Good evening. Yeah, thanks for knocking. I don't think you mind my coming in without warning. No, I get the cabbage smell from next door the same way. Does it pay to be that polite, Mr. Novak? Saves you the trouble saying please. What's on your mind? That bottle in front of you. Will you pour me a drink? No, I won't. You'll save dough if you look up a bartender. All right. I came to use you instead of your whiskey anyway. Let's hear it. My name is Lee Inderwood. I'll give you $300 to do something for me. It'll only take an hour. That's too much dough unless it's murder, and if it is murder, it's not enough dough. Are you afraid? I just don't like paid murder. I told you, when you get caught, the pain gets expensive. If it were murder, I'd do it myself. Mr. Novak, I want you to frighten someone for me. Why don't you hire a friend? Are they too pretty? It's a man named Dixie Gillian. You'll find him in an office down on Fulton Street at this address. I promise nothing will happen to you. That's what they told Benedict Arnold. He'll be in this office until 11 tonight. I want you to go in and see him. Tell him you're from Adrian, and he's to get out of town by tomorrow noon. Suppose he wants to put it off. He won't. Don't let him know who hired you. Just tell him Adrian said to leave. Look, lady, you better go on home. For 300 bucks, I won't buy a tissue paper plot. Now tell me more or say goodbye. There's not much more I can tell you, except there won't be any trouble. He's a rotten little beast, and I want him frightened badly. Why? He's been bothering my sister. Why doesn't he bother you? Because I bother back too fast. You want the 300, Mr. Novak? Yeah, it's going to be a long summer. Put it on the table. Good. And you'll need this, too. No, you keep that. I don't want it then. It's empty. Don't worry. See? No shells. It's perfectly safe. Now, look, sis, I got a nasty disposition. You can rent that for 300 bucks, but if you want more, find a gunsel. I don't want you to be a gunsel. That's why I want you to use this gun. I know it's empty. Use it on Dixon. You'll scare fast. It's just a way to save some breath. All right. It's your 300. You'd better go now. Yeah. Wait till I get a code with you. If your doorbell rings, don't play mouse. Oh? Because I may look you up. Am I too young to ask why? Because if anything goes wrong, I'll be around looking for you. And from there on, it won't be nice. I'll dirty you up like a locker room towel. Relax, Patsy. You'll never learn to fall in love that way. She handed me the gun and walked out of my apartment. Seeing her leave made you feel like Frank Buck losing an argument. She walked with a nice, easy swing of a satisfied leopard. And for a small leopard, she had pretty good spots, too. Well, I put the gun in my overcoat pocket and I went down to Folsom Street. The address was down near the bridge entrance and the street was deserted except for a couple of winos near the corner trying to buy back 1926 at a dollar a jug. I stopped in front of the place. It was a machinery company. And I could see a light burning in the back. I began to walk through the place. It was so quiet you could hear a worm with whooping cough and there were enough shadows around to keep a ghost happy for years. When I got to the office back in the corner, through the glass, I could see a man sitting at the desk. When I opened the door and walked in, he didn't seem surprised. Come on in, mister. You're bad on noise. Yeah? That's right. You make too much for a thief and not enough for a customer. What do you want? About ten words, if you're Dixie Gillian. Go ahead. You better look up a timetable. What makes you that tough? This. Oh. Well, you look tougher with a gun. Does it make you talk faster? Now, look, I'm going to say it slow, mister. Pack up your robbers and get out. Is that you talking or somebody else? I'm just the guy with a gun. Adrian does the talking. And he says get out. That's right. You got the whole message now. All right, you told me, so wander out and spend your dough. I will. Oh, you'll need part of it, though. Because I'm going to give you an answer for Adrian. I'm going to take that gun away from you, mister. You can pick the pieces out of your head on the way home. You better stand back or I'll share it with you. You've got your offer, mister. Let's see you make good. Oh, save your muscle, fella. That gun! Save your muscle, fella. The gun's empty. <laughs> Somebody fooled us, mister. Sometimes you can get a home run with a half swing. That's the way it was this time. He couldn't have made it with a prayer book in both hands. 
He slid down to the floor and trembled for a minute and then flattened out like a leaf in a pool of water. Just before he died, he grabbed his side as if he didn't like the way it hurt. And then he didn't care. I rolled him on his back and let him look at the ceiling. His eyes were open and he looked surprised like a guy who didn't figure on a change in the weather. There was a scar that ran across his forehead and dug deep into his hairline. And he was lying there with a bunch of pink gum showing as if he was trying to pick up a few bucks with a toothpaste ad. Well, I didn't have time to tell him how sorry I was because if homicide caught me here, I'd have about as much chance as a canary in a basement full of cats. I started for the door, but right then I knew I could start ordering bird seed. It was Hellman, and he walked over to look at the body. Hello, Novak. The guy looks embarrassed. Yeah, I guess he is, Hellman. What's he doing dead? Putting in a beef somewhere, I guess. He rates it. He'll like you for that, Novak. How'd it happen? A team play. We worked it out together. But you've got the gun. That's right. I got the gun. Yeah. You feel like a bet? No, just keep stealing the old way. You know how I feel, Novak? You feel flabby to anybody else, but to yourself, I suppose you feel good. Look, I walked in here with a gun. There was some quick fight talk, and I killed him, but it's still not a good rap. I can get a long price on it for you, Novak. I'll bet you can, Hellman. You can give me a bad deal, but part of the time it'll be from the other side of the deck. Worse than that, Novak, it'll be all the time. I want to watch you because I think you're going to be a crybaby. I'm going to scream if that's what you mean, Hellman. I'm going to scream about a gal that sent me in here with an empty gun. That's a big hole for a cat pistol, Novak. I got a last-minute curve. It was empty once. Yeah, that's the only way they make a gun. I don't want you for an hour ago. I want you for this dead guy on the floor. All right, all right. I told you I didn't come in here to kill the guy. I don't know him. He may even be a good guy. I'm sorry he's dead. All right, Novak. Just wait a few weeks. You can tell him personally. <laughs> Hellman had me up against the rail and he knew it. When we left there, he was wearing a big, toothy smile. It was big enough to sew on his ears. He called the coroner and told him to pick up the stiff, and then we rode downtown. He dropped the gun into ballistics and hauled me into his office. The reporters were there. He gave them the whole story and told them how to spell Hellman. After that, we wound up at the desk, and he booked me on suspicion of murder. The next hour and a half was the kind of stuff they don't write about in the paper. They call it interrogation. And when you're finished, you've been through a lot of tight spots, like an atom up at Caltech. About 11 o'clock, Hellman brought me into his office. And from there on, it happened kind of fast. I just talked to the DA. He's going to streamline things for you. Well, he's going to look funny going to trial on a guy you can't identify. You'll find out all about the dead guy. You can't count his fingers without making a mistake. If you want to know who he is, talk to that girl. Her name's Lee Underwood. We've been through all that, Novak. Now, suppose you tell me who Dixie Gillian is. I don't know, Hellman. The girl said his name was Dixie Gillian. I won't press you. I don't have to, Novak. I've got the only parlay I need. You, the dead guy, and a big, fat murder gun. Oh, sure. Yeah, Hellman talking. Yeah, I know it was a thirty-eight. They're crazy down in ballistics. I saw them standing over the dead guy. They must have made a mistake, that's all. No, no, I don't want him in here. I don't want him in here. Hey, Tony. Tony, I... Ah. You're getting pale. You need some more rouge, Hellman. I got some bad news, Inspector. Well, keep it or you'll take more home to your wife. I'll talk to you later. No, talk to him now, Hellman. If that bullet doesn't match the gun, talk to him now. That's right, Inspector. A thirty-eight bullet, but it won't match the gun you brought in. It's got to match. I came in and found him standing there. He's already admitted it. The a neat trick, then. If he fired the bullet out of that gun, he retooled it in midair. I'm not that fast, Hellman. Come on, get out of that chair so you'll have room to squirm. You keep still, Novak. I won't bother you. I'm going home. Uh, I'm walking out of your jail, Hellman. you got a broken down 38 that won't fit anything but your thumbs. You can't hold me on that. I found you over the body. I can hold you on suspicion of murder. Yeah, but it'll hurt tomorrow morning, Hellman. The papers will be down for a follow-up, and you'll have to tell them what it looks like out in the left field. I'll handle them. You can't afford to let them start laughing at you. People get the idea it's your face. You can save car fare if you stay right here, because I'll have you back by noon tomorrow. You're not that good, Hellman. You couldn't hold a moth with a searchlight. The town ought to thank you. What? Oh, it's a nice jail, Hellman. With you around, it'll last for years. When I walked out of headquarters, I had a nice mess to juggle. It was like trying to walk the baby on a floor full of marbles. If things didn't add up for Hellman, they weren't going to do any better for me. I knew that gun I had went off. If it did, what happened to the bullet and where did the other one come from? And why weren't there two shots? Well... I couldn't put my finger on a thing, and nothing added up. It was like trying to follow a grain of rice in a Shanghai suburb. 
So I looked up Lee Inderwood's address and I went by her apartment. The girl downstairs told me that she worked at a nightclub out on the Bay Shore Highway. Well, I had to hit a couple of places, so I looked up the only honest guy I know. An ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. A good man until he began to figure the last drink in the bottle is just as easy to get at as the first. I found him in a little leather-trimmed sink on Powell Street. It was a grimy little hole where they washed the glasses once a week in stale beer. But Jocko was more at home than a vulture in Calcutta. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time to celebrate my return to health. Something mild for Mr. Novak, a double stinger, perhaps. No, forget it, Jocko. i got to talk to you. Patsy, I've just passed through a crisis. A few minutes ago, they set before me a glass with a woman's lipstick all around the ring. All right, Jocko. I took one gulp and looked at the glass, and in this dim light, I thought I was bleeding to death. It took them ten minutes and three mirrors to calm me down. Jocko, I'm in trouble. You've got to help me. But they washed the glass for me in ammonia. They must have left a little ammonia in the glass because the next drink had a very odd tang about it. I've had three more just like it, a sort of ammonia collin. All right, all right. So far, they've been using domestic ammonia. When the imported stuff comes in, I may give up whiskey altogether. Calm down, will you, Jocko? i got a bum shake tonight. Yes? I either killed a guy or thought I did. That uses up the alternatives. Uh, what are you doing now, taking a boat? I got hired to scare a guy down on Folsom Street. Ten minutes later, the guy was dead. Patsy, you take your work too seriously. Couldn't you have just scared him into a lingering illness instead of killing him? One of the props was an empty gun. Only when the fight came, it grew bullets. Hellman walked in right after on a telephone tip. What are you doing out of the gas chamber? The whole thing backfired down at headquarters. The bullet and the phony gun wouldn't match. Oh, it doesn't add up, Jocko. That call to Hellman's a tip-off. I was framed, but why wasn't I framed all the way? Who is the dead man? Oh, just a guy with a falling blood cot. His name was supposed to be Dixie Gillian, but there's no identification and no record on him. You shouldn't have hired out as a gunsel. I told you I didn't hire out as a gunsel. It was somebody else's idea. You have no conscience, Patsy. It's just a sort of soap opera rule of thumb you put into practice now and then, but no real conscience. You'd let a dying woman lie in the middle of the highway unless her head was resting on a pile of savings bonds. All right, Jocko, I'll cry with you later. I need help now. What sort of help? I want you to break into a girl's apartment. Yes? Don't worry, she won't be home. Ah, is that supposed to be an incentive? It's at this address here, up on O'Farrell. Her name is Lee Inderwood. She's the one who hired me. If the girl's not there, what am I supposed to find? Anything that'll connect her with a dead man. He's a big guy with a scar. That doesn't help much. You can't miss. Go through the desk and drawers. Pick up everything you can, will you? And leave a message at my place. As soon as I finish this drink. Oh, hurry up, will you, Jocko? Leave the glass alone and get going. Don't rush me. Hurry up, will you? The glass is empty anyway. Yes, that's what you thought about that gun, but the fellow got an awful jolt out of it. Good night, lover. <laughs> I went by a horse parlor on O'Farrell Street and borrowed a car from a guy. It was after midnight when I started down the Bayshore Highway, and about a half hour later, I pulled up in front of the Cat's Paw. It was a long, rambling place on the left side of the road. There was no plan. It just followed the erosion line until they ran out of material. There was enough neon in front to light a main intersection in heaven. In the lobby, I saw a picture of Lee Underwood, one of those shadowy things that was supposed to make you think she'd die in a cold climate. She was sitting at a piano with a little microphone in front of her, and you got the idea right away. She didn't have much of a voice, but plenty of songs that made your wife lean over and ask you to explain. I asked a 50-year-old busboy, and he said she was back in her dressing room getting ready for the one o'clock show. When I walked in, she was sitting in front of a mirror working on an upswept hairdo. If she swept it up anymore, it was going to leave her head. I stood behind her, looking at the pink, fresh part of her neck that didn't show when the hair was down. You seem fascinated, Patsy. No, I just want to know where to break it. Oh. Sit down on the footstool next time. Yeah. I like to look down on people. Hmm. Let me brush that stranded hair back. Or do you like it in your eyes? Now, brush it back so I can see your answers. Who's Dixie Gillian? What difference does it make? None to him and some to me. He's dead. No, well, he couldn't be dead. Yeah, well, he'd like to believe that, too. I couldn't sell him that story about an empty gun. He couldn't have been killed with that gun. No? No. I put in a blank, Patsy. Somebody used a hard-working bullet because Dixie's dead. There's no reason to kill him. I don't understand. Yeah, well, that makes you even with homicide. But they got a bigger team. Now, look, I made a diagram, Angel. 
Up at my place, I ran over murder with you. I don't like it. If you kill people, you don't get invited out enough. So if it's you or me on this one, I'm going to push you all away. Don't understand it, Patsy. Who's Dixie Gillian? He was after some microfilm. I thought I could scare him away. You better be ready to identify him because homicide stopped. Even that scar didn't help. What scar, Patsy? The scar across his face. There's no record on him. No, no, Patsy. Everything goes wrong. Everything you touch goes wrong. That's the wrong man, Patsy. Yeah. Well, it's too late for a recount. You've got to get to that body, Patsy. I don't know how, but somewhere you've got to get to him. You look good, Lee. You make a nice picture. Wait a minute, Dixie. You don't need your coat. Come on. I don't know how it happened, Dixie. I didn't mean it that way. If you like it that way, all right. Bring the boyfriend, too. No, don't let him pass me. The gun's too big. I'm going with him. short trip. He led us out of the dressing room and down a thin hall to the back door. On the way past the kitchen, you could smell onions and used grease, and that's about all you noticed except the sound of a jukebox somewhere out in front and somebody laughing in a loud, mirthless way. When we got to the door, it was raining outside. We walked about 40 feet over near some trees where the dark was working overtime, and the gunsel made us stop. Take your spot, Lee. You can't be that crazy, Dixie. It's going to get wet, mister. You'll have a little trouble yourself. <laughs> when I woke up, it was still raining. I was lying on top of the mud like a stubborn seed. My wallet was gone, and the gunsel had ripped open my pockets. I stood up and walked over for a last look at Lee. The rain had washed the makeup off her face, and she looked small and tired as she lay there, like a broken doll that had been tossed out in the rain. I guess she was. Well, I got to my car, and I drove back to town. I checked my place, but there was no word from Jocko, so I went up to Lee's apartment. When I opened the door, the room was dark, but I knew somebody was on the rug. Either that or they'd varnished the floor with bourbon. I flipped on the light and bent over Jocko. Hey, hey, hey. Wake up, Jocko. All right, Jocko. Come on. Wake up. Come on. A little ammonia. A little ammonia, I think, would bring me around. What happened? I was sapped, I guess. Uh, everybody's got the same act tonight. Uh, help me up. Come on. Where have you been? I went down to meet the girl. Where'd you meet her? In a swimming pool? I've been in the rain all night. She's going to stay longer. What'd you find out? The fellow with the sky is her husband. Yeah? There's a picture in the desk. Are there any more pictures? A few. Take a look. Okay. Where, in here? Yes. Well, well. Who's he? It must be Dixie Gillian. He was down to pay off a debt tonight. She called him Dixie once. There's a note with that name and an address in the other drawer. He's our boy. We better get up there. Not if he's already killed two other people. We can't wait for Hellman. If he gets away, I'm all through. I won't have a leg to stand on. That's my point. When the other fellow gets through with us, we won't have much standing to do. I felt better now. Jillian was the only guy left in the picture, so I dragged Jocko up to his place. It was an apartment up on Post Street. The elevator operator took us up to the eighth floor and said that Gillian had come in a few minutes before. There was no answer, so we tried the door and it was open. Jocko didn't like the idea. See, this is folly. Risking my life is one of the bravest things you do. Keep still, Jocko. What are we supposed to do? The door was open, wasn't it? Saw a lot of graves, but I've never been tempted. Hey, look at the furniture. There's been a fight in here. I'll look in here. You check in the bedroom, huh? Well, if I'm not right back, don't expect me at all. All right. Patsy. Yeah. Patsy, come here. All right. There's somebody on the fire escape. Come here. Stand back here. Oh, he's not moving. He was leaning that way when I first saw him. All right. I'll get on this side. You raise the window. Now, go easy, Jocko. Can you see him from there? <laughs> raise it a little more. All right. <laughs> he's still leaning there. I can reach out. Right, watch yourself. If he's kidding, you'll lose an arm. 
I got it good. Place the window ball. Take Fancy, he's falling. Give me a hand. Oh, here, let me through there. Oh, it's too late. I can't hold it. Hang on, Chuckle. He's falling. Oh. Ah. oh, I'm sorry. Well, he was probably dead anyway. If he wasn't, that was a step in the right direction. <laughs> to die. Three of them had checked out already and there was still time to look for more. Jocko and I went downstairs to see the guy. He was lying face down in the alley and as you looked at him, you got the funny feeling he belonged there. He didn't disturb the scene. He just fitted in like a dirty, wet newspaper under a grandstand. There was a gun in his pocket, probably the same one that killed the girl, but there was no way of knowing. Jocko and I watched him for a minute, but your eyes begin to hurt when you see your only warm lead in a deep freeze. It was past two when I got down to headquarters and looked up Hellman. I briefed him on the girl and the guy in the alley, and then I asked him if any microfilm had turned up on the first guy in the morgue. That was a waste of time. Hellman couldn't find a brass ring in a dead man's nose, but we went over to the morgue for another look. So far, it was working out like a crossword puzzle torn in half. It's your turn, Novak. I got more after tomorrow. You haven't. The microfilm must be on the guy. Three people have been killed for it, and I got roughed up just for laughs. We searched the guy once. Now, here it is. All right. Help me roll it out. Yeah. Well, well. He sure got thin under that sheet, didn't he? Wait a minute. Oh, you run a good morgue, Hellman. What'll the paper say when they hear the skiff got up and walked out? They got him in the wrong place or something. He didn't walk out. Well, he's gone, Hellman. You got an answer? He's been moved, I tell you. The guy was dead and I saw him put in here. Couldn't be walking around with a hole in the middle of his back. I don't know, Hellman. You do it with one in your head. Don't sell the guy short. When Hellman found out the body was gone, he stood there and stared at the empty slab. And then he started looking around in a nervous way like a man trying to find a sugar bowl at a restaurant counter. A few minutes later, he turned and walked out of the morgue, and we were halfway downtown when it happened. It must have hit us at the same time, sharp and quick, like a piece of candy and a bad tooth. The guy back in the alley had come off that slab in the morgue. We got out to Dixie's place, and we began to check. There was a phone operator downstairs, and she said that Dixie had put through a call about two hours ago. Hellman checked the number, and it was the ticket office of a railroad. We got downtown and ran through the timetable. There was a train leaving the Oakland Mole... In about 40 minutes. Now, well, it was an outside chance, but tonight that was the only kind for sale. We got down in time to slide on the last ferry over to the moon. It was still dark out when the ferry pulled away from the slip and started across the bay. But over toward the Berkeley Hills, it was beginning to get light. The sky was the color of a bruise spot on a man's arm. We'll get up to the pilot house and tell him not to dock until we've gone through all the passengers. He doesn't have to be on this one. We'll check the train when we get there. Wait a minute. You don't have to check. There's your boy. Where? Up there on the rail, see? Now, you better go easy, Hellman. He's not a scale model. Yeah. Just walk quietly until we're behind him. All right. Turn around, Uh, mister. To get a better view. Hello, Novak. How was the wind and the rain in your hair? Meet Inspector Hellman. You better turn in your ticket. Hope you brought your muscle. Grab him, Hellman. That's what I'm trying to do. All right, copper. Watch it. I mean, bitch over on the rail. Don't worry, Hellman. Watch it, Novak. I'm going over here. That's one down, mister. Now for you. I landed on the deck and watched him disappear into the dark. Halfway down, the guy turned in. I got up and followed him down the ladder and along the main deck. He ducked into one of the engine spaces, and I started in to look for him. It didn't take long, because he turned out to be real helpful. You got the idea yet, Novak? I'll come closer. Tell me then. Do it yourself. But I'll knock you down hard when you show. Watch that platform. You're backing into trouble. Stay back there, Novak. Watch out for that platform, will you? You're backing into the engine. Ah! I kind of wound up last, huh? Yeah. That's the way it looks. Huh? Did you get the microfilm? Yeah. Uh, I got a big heart. 
Does it show? A little. Yeah. It's been a long night. I'll back. Huh? Yeah. But your worries are over. It's almost dawn. I don't know if I can use it. But I'll give it to you. Slick a few minutes later. It was the first time his hair ever looked good. Dixie Gillian lasted long enough to piece the story together for homicide. Lee Underwood knew her husband was carrying microfilm, and she was worried, so she hired me to scare off Gillian. Oh, it might have worked, too, but the first slip came when Lee's husband went by to make a deal with Dixie without telling her. When I jumped him, Dixie was outside and Figured it was a double cross, so he killed him with a silencer when that phony gun that Lee gave me went off. Dixie knew that the microfilm was still on the dead man. The only way he could be sure was to get the body out of the morgue. He took it up to his apartment, and when he got the film, he planted the gun and put the body on the fire escape. It was a little safer that way. There was a 50-50 chance the police would miss it the first time around, and he'd have a fair lead. Almost worked out for him, except for that phone call. The microfilm was in a capsule next to the roof of the guy's mouth. So old, it was new again. Well, Hellman asked only one question. In that fight, did I have anything to do with pushing him against the rail? I told him, sometimes those ferry boats go as much as 45 degrees. American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the tenth of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William B. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week, when over most of these same ABC stations will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Pat Novak, for hire. Novak for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my place says. Pat Novak for hire. It's the easy way because down here on the waterfront in San Francisco, you can't afford to wait your turn. If you're going to make a living down here, you got to do everything you can. And you got to be out of the hen house by sunup. Even then, it doesn't work out always. Because you get trouble tax-free. It's like leukemia. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no way to duck it. You might as well try to start a conga line in the cathedral. I found that out Monday night when I met an old friend. It was the night before elections, and I was sitting in the office, scratching married women out of an old date book, when Sam Tolliver showed up. I hadn't seen him for years, but it was a nice, easy meeting. What other way is there when you're good friends? Hey, you look just the same, Patsy. Yeah, it's good to see you, Sam. Sit down. Sure. Doing well, I guess, huh? Oh, you get different stories. Where have you been? Oh, all the hard luck stops. 
Syracuse for a while and Joliet. That's where I come from now. Yeah? That's where they got a big prison. Uh-huh. When you came too far, Sam, you should have stopped in Oakland. Huh? That's right. If you're out here to play small robber, you better think it over. It's a tough town. All right, me, Patsy. I'm not, Sam. But once you start losing them, it's hard to win again. I just thought you might want to know about San Francisco. Thanks. Thanks, but you don't have to worry, Patsy. I got a smart streak. Uh, I'm here mostly to ask a favor. Yeah? Can you spare me one for old time's sake? Medium-sized. Go ahead. I want to borrow one of your boats. Did you come all the way from Joliet to borrow a boat, Sam? If it's going to hurt that much, forget it. I just asked. All right. When do you need it? Tonight? It's to pick up a package in the bay about nine o'clock. Sure, I'll run you out. No, it's, uh, it's a little different, Patsy. I can't make the trip. You'd have to do it for me. The favor's getting bigger, Sam. You'd have to pick up the package and bring it back here. I'll, I'll be waiting at ten o'clock. I guess you won't buy, huh, Patsy? I'm not impressed. It'd mean a lot to me, Patsy. It really would. And you couldn't get hurt, honest. Nobody gets hurt, honest. It's the other way I'm worried about. Well, I wish I could tell you, Patsy, but I can't. You know how it is. Sometimes you can't, but... Well, it's that way now, but... You'd be doing me a real favor and you wouldn't get hurt. That's what Henry used to tell his wives. All right, Sam. But you put out a bad story. Well... Patsy, you have to go by the China Star. She's out in the stream. Just tell them you came for that package. They won't ask. Just tell them you want the package. Yeah. Talk to the captain. I'll be waiting here at your place about 10 o'clock. And Patsy, it's important. Don't let anybody else have it. All right. I'll see you here at 10. Thanks, Patsy. It's a big favor. We're old friends. Yeah. We're old friends. Nothing wrong with them, huh? No, there's nothing wrong with old friends, Sam, except sometimes they wear out on you. When Sam Tolliver walked out of there, I began to worry. I don't know why, because he was always a good guy. But if you leave good silk out in the rain, it'll shrink. Thought it was too late to change my mind now. I was going to get that package and say goodbye to Sam Tolliver. Only things didn't work out that way. You start with trouble and it never stops. It's like offering to buy aspirin for a two-headed boy. About 8.30, I took a boat and I started out into the bay. Halfway out into the stream, I had to give way to a tanker. After she throbbed by, I picked up the China Star, tied up at buoy 327. It was a broken-down old barge, so old I expected to find Noah hiding out in the bilges. Well, I went aboard, and they took me into the captain's cabin. It was going to be tougher than Sam thought. The old man had some questions, and he was about as smooth as a bag of fingernails. Right away, I got the idea. What do you want? I came out for a package. Who are you? What good will a name do you? Who are you? What do you care, mister? This isn't our dance. Just give me the package, and I'll leave. Keep shouting, tough boy, and when you're all through, tell me your name. Now, look, I'm not out here to haunt your boat. you got the right face for it. I'm just passing through. <laughs> You're running a small boat, you got papers. Let's see them. Yeah. You're too handy in your own cabin. Novak, huh? You a Polak, Novak? Yeah, and it feels fine. How's it being a pig these days? Don't get jumpy. I just asked. Who sent you here, Novak? I'll forget you asked. Just keep the package. I'm going home. You walk home on the bottom, then. Now, look, Novak. Somebody steered you wrong. Maybe it was no questions once, but it's not that way anymore. Just want to keep the book straight. Who sent you? Sam Tolliver. You need a pencil? No, that's enough questions. You see, Novak, all you had to do was answer. You can have the package now or talk some more. I'll take it now. Where is it? On the desk behind you there. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome, Novak. Captain didn't like company. When he hit me, I dropped down to the floor like a piece of hard-working lint. The last thing I remember was Sam Tolliver sending me out to this boat. I knew then I had no more business here than second trumpet in a string quartet. I could hear voices and people moving around, but it didn't help much. 
You can get that kind of service in a tomb. Somewhere along the line, they moved me. Because when I woke up, I was lying in a cloud of platine on a couch in a different cabin. A class of people had improved. She was bending over me with a cold towel and a warm look. And from where I was, she had a figure like a shot of brandy on a winter night. When she said hello, you knew that all you had to do was send up a flare and relax. Good evening. Welcome back. Yeah. How do you feel? A little used up. I need recharging. Here, put your head on my lap. Mm. There. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Forget the towel. I'll struggle along this way. By the way, whose lap is it? I'm Ellen Morrow. Where's your friend? The captain. I guess so, the brave guy, Axel Arm. He's down getting your boat ready. What's he doing, punching holes in the bottom? He'll be back in a minute. The package will be ready and you can leave. No, you keep the package. The last time I got a headache. I'm sorry about that. It was a mistake. That's what they told Marie Antoinette. By that time, her head was 40 feet down the street. What's in that package? It wouldn't help if you knew. You let me work that out, huh? Work out the answer, then. How about Sam Tolliver? Slow down, Betsy. I'm not going that fast. You're going the wrong way. I hope you lick your wounds, darling, but I'm not going to get talky. What do you got to lose? What have I got to gain except your gratitude? I can get that any night with a couple of drinks. How is he, Ellen? How does he look? Too comfortable. On your feet, Novak. <laughs> yeah. You ought to rent that out, sweetheart. I'd sign a lease myself. I'll finish this sweet talk, Novak. You get on your way. Here's the package. No, I changed my mind about the package. You keep it. Your boat's ready. Unless you want to get tossed in like a mackerel, take the package and beat it. What's in it and where does Sam Tolliver fit? You asked once already with your head in her lap. You want me to sit down? Well, you got brains after all. Yeah. Sorry, I thought they were all in your fists. <laughs> yeah, you're still smart. Take this package. Show him the boat, Ellen. I'm going to remember you, mister. Ellen's going to lead you by the hand through the dark. Stop beefing and settle for the simple pleasures. I will. I'll remember you. Concentrate on Ellen. You'll get a better memory. I went out on deck with the girl. And as I got to the starboard side, I noticed her hair for the first time. The way you're liable to suddenly notice a flower after a hard rain. Her hair was red, and as the orange lights of the bridge reflected against it, it seemed like a prairie fire, away down in the valley, flaring up quick and then burning low again. The rest of her would have made a good prairie fire, too. It was the only good thing I could think of on the way across the bay. The water was as quiet as a drowsy caterpillar, and I had a chance to think. Why had they changed their mind about giving me that package, and how wet were Sam Tolliver's feet? Well, it must have been about 11.30 when I pulled into the pier and started on the run for my office. The lights were on, and I burst right in because I had a lot to ask Sam. But it wasn't Sam. What's your hurry, mister? I came here to meet a friend. That's the guy laying in the corner. You don't have to hurry. No, this isn't my friend. He doesn't look like one. I'm Sergeant Grimes from Homicide. If you're Novak, you're in trouble. Why? A guy lying under your desk, dripping like a broken ink. Well, and you trot out a question like that? Well, it's a bum caper somewhere. I was supposed to wait for a guy named Sam Tolliver. It might as well have been a streetcar. I'm not going to press you, Novak. I don't care. I'm just going to take you downtown. Well, this boy quit too late. I've been in the bay the last two hours. You can check. I went out there to pick up a package. The one you got in your arm? Yeah. It's for a guy named Sam Tolliver. Let's see. Okay. It doesn't say that. It says Mr. John Reedy, 720 Post Street. Hmm? Well, I wonder what that means. Let's find out. We'll take it by Reedy's place. I got it for Sam Tolliver. You can buy him another. We're going by Reedy's before we get downtown. What's the matter with you? Do you want it on an 18-foot screen? I didn't kill the guy. I don't even know him. I don't even know this John Reedy. Wait a minute, Novak. I believe you. I believe every word you're saying. Except this is one time you'd be better off lying. <laughs> When we left my office, I felt as if somebody had walked through my stomach on stilts. Oh, there were loose ends bobbing up everywhere, and you couldn't get to any of them. It was like chasing a spider with a bowling ball. With all this new stuff, I forgot about the ship. Who's going to worry about blood poisoning if he's busy having hemorrhages? 
I began to wonder more about Sam. Where was he? And how was I going to palm off that dead stand-in? Grimes didn't seem worried. We got into his Nash and headed for 720 Post Street. It was an apartment hotel, and Reedy lived up on the third floor. On the way in, Grimes picked up a key at the desk, and we rode up in the elevator with one of those shifty-eyed little guys who'd sell his mother if he didn't have to fatten her up. When we got to Reedy's door, Grimes took over. Open up! Maybe he can't hear you, Grimes. Nobody home. Let's go in. Why? We don't know him well enough to sneak in. I read a hunch, Novak. Okay. The light's on your side. Leave it out. Let's look around. Okay. The stray bodies belong to you, Grimes. You go look in that set of bedrooms. I'll check over here in the library. Give me a yell if you see any. All right. Novak! Novak! Two of them. I got one by the desk. The other started down the fire escape. I'm going down in front. Take this gun and stand by the fire escape. He may get trapped and start up, so keep your eyes open. I walked into the library. The window was open and the curtains were blowing over the dead man's face. It was a good thing, because you can't split the difference with a service 45. I took him by the heels and dragged him away from the window. His eyes were rolled back as if he expected somebody to tap him on the shoulder and tell him it was all a mistake. His face was contorted and frightened, maybe a little embarrassed, like a deer caught in a traffic jam. Well, I stayed at the window about ten minutes and watched the fire escape. There was no action there, and Grimes wasn't back, so I started for the door. I had company right away. I don't know, Vac. You move? Oh, Hellman. That's a big gun you got. Well, ask Junior here on the floor. He thinks it's even bigger. I'll check myself. Sure, and it's going to be easy because it's right in the family. Yeah? Yeah. Belongs to one of your boys down in Homicide. Go ahead. A sergeant by the name of Grimes steamed in here and knocked down Junior, and then he beat it down to get the other guy. Uh, I don't believe it. Well, talk to him. That's why I don't believe it. There's nobody on the force named Grimes. On this one, you're all alone, Novak. There's got to be a Grimes. The guy had on a uniform. I don't care if he had on a play suit, Novak. The guy's a phony. He's not from homicide. He's a killer. <laughs> That's what I meant, Hellman. <laughs> I knew Hellman was right. If Grimes was on the level, he'd have booked me instead of coming up here. He came up to Reedy's with murder in mind. Even if they believed the story about Grimes, I was still in a spot. That made me accessory to murder. And I was going to look worse when Hellman found the guy down in my office. On that one, I had star billing. Oh, everywhere I turned, things were worse. I knew it was going to take a low-budget miracle to bail me out. It was like trying to give nose drops to a herd of elephants. Hellman seemed to like the idea. Hellman rolled the guy, and there was no identification. But he never works for nothing. Yeah, a few bucks in the guy, I'll put it in the safe. The only safe you got has suspenders on it. I don't like that, Novak. Oh, you'd do anything for a buck, Hellman. If you got the right bid, you'd sell the tomb of the unknown soldier. <laughs> Thanks, Hellman. I'm getting a big list tonight. I can do all of that I want, Novak. Because you're in the corner pocket now. I get a tip off from the Chronicle to come up here and I find you holding last rites. You got a bigger headache, Hellman. There's another stiff down at my place. Huh? That's right, Grimes again. He was sitting there when I walked in. Where were you? Out in the bay, picking up a package. It's right there on the desk. What's in it? I don't know. It was for a friend of mine named Sam Tolliver. He's disappeared and Grimes brought the package up here. Uh, I'll take it downtown. You better tag by the China Star. That's where I picked up the package. It's out in the bay, so you'll need a boat. Even a guy with your complex needs a boat. I'll touch all the bases, Novak. You just stay ten cents away from headquarters. You can pay your own way into the can. Yeah, well, that's what'll happen if I wait for you. I'll be standing out in the downpour. That's right, Novak. If there's a chance I want to see you get first prize. Yeah, well, I'm going to be stuck unless I shop around myself because you got locked jaw of the brain, Hellman. Yeah? That wouldn't hurt you so much, but if it spreads, you're going to be in trouble. That's what I'm waiting for. Well, if something didn't happen soon, I was going to be about as embarrassed as a hostess with leaky plumbing. I was counting on Hellman to shake down the skipper of the China Star. If that didn't work, I could close shop. I didn't have any leads. There wasn't anything I could do but sit on my hands. It was like taking your niece to a nightclub. I had to stumble around until something showed. So I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Oh, he was all right until he found out sometimes you can feel as bad the next morning without a hangover. I toured the town and finally found him at Lupo's trying to put the vineyards out of business. 
Ah, Patsy, you're just in time to start the day off right. Mama Lupo, some wine for Mr. Novak. You can only have a quart. We're running low. Look, it's almost midnight, Jocko. I got to talk to you. We're not going to turn into pumpkins. You need some wine. No, I don't. Patsy, when you die, the artwork is going to be simple. On your grave, they'll chisel a picture of a pair of slacks, a hamburger, and a double malt. All right, Jocko. The final symbols of a decayed civilization, because that's as close as you ever got to civilization. A remote connection at best. Like a bookie, they love horses, but they die on a stock farm. It's the same with you and civilization. You all through, Jocko? I won't fight against your sober babble. What's the matter? There's a dead guy down in my office. A uh, friend of ours? No. Oh, that's too bad. We'll miss the wake. I'm going to get half hung by homicide. The other half is dead up in a Post Street apartment. Hellman thinks I'm the boy. Patsy, I wish you wouldn't hang around me when you've just killed somebody. You tarnish my declining years. I went out to the bay to pick up a package. When I got back to my place, instead of a friend named Sam Tolliver, there was a dead guy there and a phony cop called Grimes. How do you make the distinction? He grabbed the package and we took it up to Post Street. After a quick hassle in the dark, I'm standing over a dead guy in John Reedy's apartment. John Reedy? Yeah. Do you know him? Most people do. He's running for office tomorrow. Is he the dead man? No, I don't think so. What about Reedy? He's running for a board job. Yeah? Would anybody have a reason to work a plan on him? Maybe. What's he like? Oh, a sort of liberal by marriage. Hmm? A reactionary with a rich wife. Supposed to be a good man. Well, how about the opposition? Well, a lot of them are running. One is Simpson. He couldn't beat an asthmatic turtle across a tennis court. Well, we're getting somewhere, at least. If Reedy's good, the gambling dough would frame him to lose. Yes, if politicians can ever lose. A murder in his apartment would look too phony, though. Yeah, but maybe that package wouldn't. Jocko, you got to help me. I want you to check on the registration of the China Star and then nose around to find out what you can about tomorrow's election, will you? If we lived in a monarchy, this wouldn't happen. That fast double play has got something to do with this election. Now, hurry up, Jocko, and when you're through, tag by my place. I'll call you there. Have you a bottle in the house? There's a tap in the kitchen. That'll have to do. No, thanks. Outside of a child in pain, the most pathetic sound in the world is running water. Good night, lover. <laughs> I left Jocko and ducked into a phone booth. When I called Hellman, he poured out news like a rotary press. They broke open that package down at headquarters. It was full of dope. Plain garden variety. The kind of man uses to forget either his wife or secretary. I was sure then the package was a plant on Reedy. Hellman didn't see it that way. He said the two dead men were Gunsel's. Last address before San Francisco State Prison at Joliet. I needled him about that phony cop Grimes. Hellman said they just got a tip-off by telephone. Grimes was an ex-sergeant in homicide whose real name was Vic Rothery. I asked him who phoned in the tip-off, and Hellman said he didn't know the guy. His name was Sam Tolliver. I got out of the Chronicle morgue and looked up everything I could on John Reedy. All politicians' children sit on the floor. There was a picture of Reedy there with his family grouped around him on the floor. I pulled the clips on Vic Rothery. It was Grimes, all right. Well, that gave me something to work on, so I went on the prowl for Ellen Morrow. I found her running a dice game in a little after hours joint on Eddy Street. You want chips, Novak? You don't want to play against yourself? Yeah, give me some. All right. Let's see how good you are. Okay. Eight's your point. Yeah. You seen Sam Tolliver? Make your point, Patsy. That's it. Where's Sam Tolliver? Five. You're not even warm. You're not warm on Sam, either. He left me hanging with a murder rat. Your friend double-crossed you. He double-crossed you, too. Another five. You're in a rut, Patsy. He turned in Grimes. That's right, baby. They know he's Vic Rothery. Now, you still like Sam Tolliver? No. Keep rolling, darling. Is Grimes your boyfriend? He used to be. I'm sentimental. Where's Sam Tolliver? The Herrick Hotel. When you see him, tell him I sent you. I will if we talk that long. There it is. Hey, come on. Eight. That's right. I guess I lose, Patsy. I guess you do. Be seeing you, baby. She changed when I left. The first time out, she was alive and breezy like the main coast in July. But now she was broken up and lonely looking. And as I walked out, I thought of an old Dixie cup somebody had used up and thrown in the alley. Well, I got down to the Herrick Hotel, but Sam Tolliver wasn't there. 
Maybe it was better that way. I left a note for him, a short note that even a Mongolian idiot couldn't trip up on. If Sam was going to show his hand, he had to do it soon. When I got back to my apartment, Jocko was already there. He was giving a concert for the mice. Oh, she pushed a baby carriage, she pushed a baby carriage in the merry, merry month of May. All right, Jocko. She pushed a baby carriage, she pushed a baby carriage, she pushed it for a Williams man who's far, far away. Oh, stop it, will you? Patsy, I wish you'd get rid of that radio and buy a good harpsichord. What'd you find out, Jocko? Nothing from the China Star. She weighed anchor and went to sea at a quarter to twelve. How about Reedy? Well, there's heavy gambling money against him. And there's talk about a last-minute scandal. All the newspapers had tip-offs. Where was he tonight? At a rally in the Mission District with his whole family. Well, I'd leave time for a plant. They broke open that package. It was full of dope. Oh, that makes sense. He was once under treatment for malaria. The drugs found in his apartment would make it look bad. Yeah, I'll get it. Hello, Novak talking. I hope so, because you got a lot to do. What's on your mind, Hellman? A girl named Ellen Morrow. Who killed her? Did they? About 20 minutes ago. Vic Rothery's picture was all over the place. Yeah, they were chums. You better pick up Sam Tolliver. He's at the Harry Hotel. I'd rather have Vic Rothery. Haven't you picked him up yet? No, we're on our way out. Well, you better hurry, Hellman. There won't be any voters left. I thought Sam Tolliver was a friend of yours. Well, that's the trouble with close friends. You give them the shirt off your back so they can see where to put in the knife. <laughs> After Hellman's call, I knew we were coming up for the last hand. I met him, and we rode down to Vic Rothery's hotel. It was early morning, just about the time dawn is too sleepy to get out of bed. In the pale light, Geary Street looked like a shabby old lady with a snootful, and Rothery's hotel was worse. Hellman flashed a badge on the night clerk, who reached over and handed us a key. It was a funny thing to notice then. But the guy's hands were short, and his fingers were peeled and stained yellow as if they'd been dipped in weak acid. Well, we rode up to Rothery's room. As we got out of the elevator and turned the corner, somebody ducked into Rothery's room. That was enough for Hellman. He started down the hall. Open up in there! You got another customer, Hellman. Open up! Come on in. You're going to wake everybody up. Hello, Sam. Come on in. Don't oh, mind the gun. It's loaded. You're a handy cop, Hellman. That's it. I'll close the door. All right, over near the window. Yeah. Go on. Sure. You got an answer for Rothery here? You too, copper. Over near the window. I ask you. You got an answer for Rothery here? You're looking at it, mister. You know, Patsy, I'm sorry you came. I could bounce a few off of this guy with no pain at all, but it's going to hurt on you. Don't kid me, Sam. I don't know why you came, Patsy. You could have left me alone. I didn't mean to put you in for this. Things went wrong and you were in, that's all, but I didn't mean to do it, Patsy. Give the man your gun. You were a good guy to me, Novak. I'm sorry you drew the deuce. I'm really sorry because, well, you were a good guy to me. Well, I'm not anymore, Sam. You got five feet to make up your mind. I got it made up, Patsy. Now stay back. Let me try it out on him first. You've had practice. Stay back, Patsy. I'm in a hole and I'll burn my way out. You know that. Patsy, I'm in a hole. I gotta get out. Don't kid me, Sam. I was your last friend. All you got now is the road. Stay back, Patsy, please. Patsy, stay back. I'll let that, Sam. Uh, I must have prayed wrong, Novak. Yeah. Sorry, Sam. I'm a tough loser. Yeah. You were right, Patsy. It's a bum down for a small robber. For a while, you looked big. Not for long, though. No. You're a small-time bum, Sam, and you're better off dead. I, I wouldn't argue. I, I'm sorry, though. I doubt it. I guess that's right. I... I didn't try very hard. How's your friend, Novak? Let's go. The friendship's over. Oh. 
Well, Hellman finally pieced it all together. He got that skipper back and put him under the lights. The story was damp, but it fit together. They were all in on a deal to railroad John Reedy. Vic Rothery headed up a bunch to plant the dope in his apartment. But Sam Tolliver got anxious and decided to get the stuff for sale. He talked a couple of buddies into it and sent me out to the ship to pick it up. The captain smelled a switch and knocked me out long enough to get word to Rothery on the beach. Rothery got the guy in my office and the other guy that Sam posted in Reedy's place in case anything went wrong. That left only Sam on the other team. Rothery wore the uniform because it was an easy way to plant the stuff in Reedy's apartment. But the timetable went haywire and he got tripped up by that tip-off call to the Chronicle. That's about the way it was. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How come Sam Tolliver headed for the girl's place and then Rothery's? I don't know. Except maybe that note I left Sam. How'd I know he'd believe a lie? Oh, it worked out for everybody except John Reedy. He lost the election anyway. Jocko forgot to mention the guy was a Republican. Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak, for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco... Billing doesn't mean much. Everybody's got the same act. They're all out to turn a fast buck. And when you're in business down here, everything but murder is a parlor trick. Once in a while, your eyelids get sore from winking it too much, but it's a living. You get to meet the best people in town. There's only one hooker. You're liable to wake up some morning dead. Because around the waterfront, you don't need a union card for trouble. It sneaks up and paws you like a wet ghost. I found that out when I met Bruno Zweiss. I closed up early Tuesday night and I went home to catch up on last month's sleep. I don't know how long I was in bed. Must have been about 11 when I woke up. The room was dark and as stale as last year's Christmas candy. I had the goofy feeling that somebody was in the room with me. I was breathing kind of hard, and I stopped to have a listen. Somebody was sitting on my bed, either that or the landlord had put in an echo. I listened again. Hello, Novak. You're mixed up, friend. I pay the rent here. Get your hands away from the light, Novak. Just be a good boy, and you can collect your old age pension. Now, look, I'm not crazy about waking up with strangers sitting on my bed, especially if they got baritone voices. Now, say your piece and beat it. Don't get jumpy, mister. When your eyes get used to the dark, you're going to see a gun about a foot away from your nostrils. I want the keys to your boat, Novak. Get them in the morning. At 25 bucks a smell. I want them now. Just tell me where they are. I'll do the rest. Don't get big hearted. <laughs> I don't want chatter and cocktails. I want those keys. Unless you want your face to look like a rump roast. 
You'll start talking. The keys are in the bottom drawer of the desk. That's the boy. Gonna bother you both a while. You'll get it back by noon tomorrow. There's the boat keys. Two of them are. The rest open the front door of the U.S. Mint. Sorry I can't stay around, Novak. You sound like a card. Sleep tight, Novak. This will have to do for a lullaby. <laughs> He didn't even give me time to pick a dream. I stretched out on the floor as dead as a Philadelphia nightclub. I don't know how long I stayed out of the ball game. Must have been a couple of hours, because when the phone rang, it was past midnight. I reached over to pick it up, but my hands were as steady as a maple leaf in a hurricane, and my head was big enough to sell by the pound. I finally found it in the dark and started talking. Hello? Hello, Novak. This is Joe Paz down at Pier 19. You awake? Sure. Hey, you sound groggy. No, it's a sedative. What's on your mind? One of your boats just drifted in. <laughs> Guess what? I don't have to. It's smashed up and you want to offer me 50 bucks salvage. Hey, that's right, Novak. You're psychic. I'm a patsy, you mean. Some gunsel borrowed the boat a couple of hours ago. Came in here, told me a bedtime story, and took the keys. Well, you better hop right down here. It'll keep, Joe. No, it won't. Hurry up or you'll run a dead heat with homicide. There's a dead guy in the boat. Well, it must be my playmate. I don't know. He didn't say. But you better grab a cab and get on down here. There's going to be a lot of questions. Sure. If you need any good answers, save a couple for me. From now on, there was no waste motion. I knew that. If homicide was on the case, that meant Inspector Hellman. Well, he's a real nice guy, if you like his type. I had to do something soon. If I didn't, I'd have about as much chance as a pound of liver at a cat show. So I jumped into some clothes, and I was starting out of the apartment when I missed my wallet. The keys were attached, and that gunsel had taken the whole works. I began to get mad. For 70 bucks, you can get a scotch hangover instead of the kind I had. And if you're lucky, a couple of good memories. So when I drew up at Pier 19, it didn't look like the sunny side of the street. Joe Powers was waiting for me. Hey, you got the first round, Patsy. Homicide hasn't showed yet. I'm full of luck tonight. Where's the boat? Oh, right over here. Lots of fog tonight, huh, Joe? You're walking on it. Well, that is. How's your insurance, Patsy? All right, except I'm not carrying any on that dead guy. Who is he, Joe? I don't know. He's your passenger. You roll him. All right, give me a hand. No, push him over on the other side, will you, so I can get in the pocket? Is he the same guy that took the keys? I don't know. If he is, he never looked lovelier. There's nothing in this pocket. This one's empty, except for a comb. He sure spent my 70 bucks in a hurry. Must have thrown in the wallet for a nightcap. No identification. We should have bought a scorecard. Hey. Hey, here on the floor. It's a key. Let me see that, Joe. Room 425 Royal Arms Hotel. Where is it? That's a dive down on Turk Street. Well, say hello to Homicide for me. Oh, you're not bright tonight, Novak. Well, I'm not going to stay around here. They'll pick me up faster than a gin fizz. Well, what am I going to tell them? Anything you like, Joe. Shift into freewheeling and let them follow. But I'm not going to hang around for a pinch. I'm one boat and 70 bucks short. Tell it to Homicide. I don't like manual labor that much. See you later. I started for the Royal Arms Hotel, and on the way, I picked up the only honest guy I know, a bottle baby by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, except he thinks it's a waste of the taxpayer's money to put alcohol in torpedoes. I hauled him out of the hunt room bar, and we walked down the street to the Royal Arms Hotel. It was the perfect spot for a missionary. The lobby looked like the first act of rain. There was a pinball machine in one corner a couple of last year's girls in this year's slacks, and a bleary-eyed little night clerk. He looked like a well-groomed laundry bag, and he gave us the fish eye as we started upstairs. Room 425 was down at the end of the hall. Jocko didn't care if we ever got there. 
Patsy, we have no business coming up here. We're in search of fool's gold. Or in search of my 70 bucks. Exactly. I view you as my penance, Patsy. The sackcloth for a misspent life. If you can shake off that buzz, you'll find out I'm in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you're a patsy. And you're dangerous because you move in the twilight zone between good and evil without any predisposition toward either one. Yeah, all right. Here it is. 425. Nobody home. Let's go in. It's housebreaking. Now, look, Jocko, I want my 70 bucks. I'm going in. Patsy, sometimes you terrify me. I think you'd pick the lock to the gates of heaven. I would if they had my 70 bucks. Come on. The guy's dead down in my boat. We won't hurt his feelings. We'll just snooze around a minute and get up. It was a pretty room if you like dead women on your rugs. She was stretched out in a pale yellow dressing gown, as quiet as an April morning and twice as pretty. A dull red scar ran across her temple where somebody had laid an iron shovel. She didn't belong in this hotel because she was wearing a necklace and a bracelet that left a gap in somebody's pocket. And from the ringside, she looked all right. Jocko noticed it, too. She has lots of character. Yeah, but where's my 70 bucks? She's a nightclub dancer. How do you know? Her picture's plastered all over the wall there. She's the headliner at El Palateo, Miss Rita Malloy. I wonder who the guy on the desk is there. Boyfriend, probably. Let's get out of here, Patsy. Oh, wait a minute. How about that dead guy in the boat? Where does he fit in? I'll listen to that one, Novak. Oh, Hellman. What happened to the girl? She died laughing at you? It's Rita Malloy, a piece of change from the El Palateo. Uh-huh. Got a hat, Novak? No. Nope. Then you're all ready. Come on. Oh, get your brain lined up and look at her. She's been dead a couple of hours. You're still eligible, Novak. On your way down, you can explain that guy at Pier 19. Oh, you can't be that dumb, Hellman. I'm smart enough to see you peeking over the eight ball. You look like a ten-to-one shot, Novak, and I got my money on you all the way. If you're going to make this thing add up, you can't do it alone. I'll try. Well, that's what Furpo said. So I don't look good on this one. I'll look worse if I leave it up to you. You couldn't find a hangnail if you knew what hand it was on. You got 24 hours, Novak. I'm going to piece things together, and then I'm going to make a pinch. Pick out a soft spot. Yeah? Yeah. Stay near the phone. If it rings and a man answers, that'll be homicide. Good night. Hellman was right. I looked like a sure bet for the Rotogravure section. I was beginning to run out of silver linings, and I knew it. I didn't have an answer for anything. The guy in the boat was still a stranger, and Rita Malloy was still dead. I was sitting in the middle of a high-stake game with a pair of trays. When we left the hotel room, I had the funny feeling that there was something wrong back there. I didn't know what. I just knew there was something wrong, the way you feel when you pick up the wrong hat and put it on. The position of the body, those pictures on the desk, I didn't know, but there was one detail that didn't set right. Well, I told Jocko to hang around headquarters, and I started for the El Palateo. It was like all the rest, a little melancholy bar on Mason, a fire trap with a cover charge. The decor looked like early Franco. The floor show was on as I fought my way up to the bar. Excuse me, please. I'm sorry, lady. Can I get through here, please? How about a drink? Your idea. What do you want? Scotch. Soda or water? Water. You got a nice club here. We like it. 80 cents. Too bad about Rita Malloy. Yeah. You don't seem heartbroken about it. I'm not a mother. Eighty cents. Anything wrong, Eddie? No, boss. This guy's crying in his beer about Rita Malloy. Oh. I'm Manny Ryan. You own the club? A piece of it. My name's Novak. Call me Patsy at the moment. The police think I killed Rita Malloy. When you go on trial, Mr. Novak. I don't. That's why I came down here to find out which one of your people killed her. I see. She was mixed up to her ears with some thick hoodlum. You, Mr. Novak? No, a guy right out of your set. He came rolling in with a tide this morning, playing rigor mortis all over my boat. Look, Novak, you better go see someone else to tell your troubles to. I'm a busy man. Yeah, well, so am I, getting out of a murder rap. You knew her, Ryan. 
In fact, I got an idea you knew her pretty well. Let's not talk that way about the dead. Your picture splattered all over her apartment. Were you engaged to her? That's one way of putting it. You better have a big fat alibi ready for tonight. Homicide's going to think you killed her. I'm betting on you for the finals, Novak. I don't need an alibi. She was a friend of mine. That's why you need one. People just hate their enemies, but they kill their friends. You better stay out of the public library, Patsy. You're not smart enough to understand epigrams. I'm smart enough to find out where you were from 10 o'clock until midnight. Go ahead. Circle around the club. But keep a drink in your hand. We run for profit. I didn't get much out of the doorman. He wanted a first mortgage to talk, but one of the busboys opened up. He told me that Ryan and the girl had brawled the night before. Also, that Ryan left the club for about an hour tonight. Well, that put him on the list anyway. But it began to look more and more like a one-horse race. Well, I got one other lead. A clarinet player in the band wanted to harmonize with Rita Malloy, but there wasn't much else to go on. And then I spotted the gal who had taken Rita Malloy's job in the show. She was just finishing her number, and so I followed her back to a dressing room. When she opened the door, I got a nice warm feeling like a melted cheese sandwich, and I was looking around for a rope to hang on. She was pretty. And when she said hello, you knew it was time to send in the varsity. Good evening. For some people, you mind if I come in? It's late in the season. I can't be choosy. All right. I'm Pat Novak. I'm Tony Drake. What do I do? Tremble? Talk, mostly. Did you know Rita Malloy? Around here, that was an occupational hazard. The police think I killed her. Did you? No. When I got there, they were tearing down the goalposts. Oh, that's too bad. I'd have been very grateful. Uh, something I'd like to try. Are you switching the topic, Mr. Novak, or have I been in the big city too long? I just want to know who killed her. You got any ideas? Nope. How about your boss? Ooh, maybe. She was getting a little frayed around the edges. How's his temper? No worse than a cobra's. He might have done it, but I doubt it. Anybody else? He was putting in a little overtime with a thug. Not a big, porky guy with a deep voice? I never saw him. I just heard that he was trying. Must have been quite a line. Anybody else? How about that clarinet player? Mm, no play. He was just a salmon swimming upstream. I see. Well, do me a favor, will you, Tony? All right. You only get one, so make it a good one. They're tailoring me for a trip over the hill unless I show up with a fistful of answers. Now, can you give me a list of all of Rita Malloy's friends? I can write them all down on a piece of confetti. I mean everybody close to her. The people around the club here. The people on the outside. I'll pick it up in a half hour at your apartment. My apartment? Yeah, it's your apartment. All right, don't get sore. I was just inquiring, not complaining. All right. One other thing, Angel. Yes, Patsy? Don't forget to put yourself on that list. Be seeing you. Well, it was good to get out of there. When she started walking towards you, you felt like a shovel full of scrap iron in a Pittsburgh blast furnace. Well, I called up Jocko at headquarters. He didn't seem to be worried about me. He was thirsty. The guy on the boat hadn't been identified yet. The coroner said he died of severe bruises and that Rita Malloy checked out with a fractured skull. I gave Jocko Tony Drake's number and I started for her apartment. I couldn't have done better with Aladdin's lamp. She had the list and a bottle on hand. I went over the list with her and then it turned out she had insomnia. The radio was turned down to room temperature. I was working on my fifth drink when the phone rang. Oh, let it ring, Patsy. Oh, I better get it, baby. I think you're a sissy. No, prison pallor wouldn't look good on me. Hello. Patsy? Yeah? Are you busy? Well, depends on your point of view. What's up? Tearing you away from that list of suspects. Let's have it, Jocko. Uh, they just identified the dead guy on your boat. His name is Bruno Swice. He's wanted in Miami, Florida. He's a hired gunman. Good. Now jump over and see Paul Stangl at the Chronicle Morgue, huh? I already have. There's no tie-up between Bruno Swice and Rita Malloy. There's got to be. Those two killings are tied up like ham and eggs. Hellman just got a report from the Harbor Patrol. They found a buoy knocked out of place. They figure your boat did it and Bruno got killed in the crash. What does that do to things? Oh, 
clarifies them enormously. This way you're going to hang for only one murder. Good night, lover. <laughs> I knew Jocko was right. Hellman could rig me as long as he had only one case to work on. He's a single-celled animal, and this was just about big enough to fit into his brain. Well, I left Tony's apartment and I walked over to the El Palateo. It must have been about four o'clock in the morning. It was still dark enough for me to kick in a back window without being seen. I headed straight for Manny Ryan's office, and I started going through his stuff. It was like trying to separate a ton of salt and sugar dumped in the same bin. I went through most of the drawers, and in the last one, I got a hold of something. I grabbed the phone on Ryan's desk and I called Hellman. Well, I wasn't sure, but I figured he could try this one on for size anyway. Police headquarters. Give me Hellman and Homicide. Yeah. They must have put their best men on his trail because they found him inside a half hour. Hello, Novak. I'm in Manny Ryan's office. He owns the El Palateo. I just rifled his desk. That's a minor offense for you. I got a hold of last month's phone bill. Guess what? It's too high. The office put through two calls to Key West, Florida, the last part of this month. Four o'clock. I'm barely interested. Go ahead. Bruno's Weiss hired out as a gunman. San Francisco is a long way from home plate. That means somebody sent for him. And you're trying to put the finger on Manny Ryan. That's right. That silver frame you picked up at Rita Malloy's? Take a look at the guy in it. That's her boyfriend, Manny Ryan. Uh, we'll check on it. In the meantime, keep squirming, Novak. You look pretty. Oh, you're smooth, Hellman. Smart talk's not going to keep you out of the chair, Novak. Stay handy. We've only got a short extension cord. Yeah, well... Hello, Hellman. Hello, Lupos. Frank, is Jocko Maddock in there? Good. Put him on, huh? Hello, Jocko. Now listen, I'm up at Manny Ryan's place. Yeah, that's right. I'm not sure, but I think that Ryan's the. My head must have looked like a jackpot. Everybody in town was hitting it. I rolled over and played dead for about five hours. It feels better when you've had a dress rehearsal. I woke up in my apartment. The sun was streaming through the window and hit the bed. I looked like the muslin counter after a sale. It turned out I was the host and didn't know it. Jocko was sitting at the table having breakfast. The bottle was almost half shot. Good morning. How's the other world? Oh, uh, can't so you I leave that stuff alone? Guy, no. Do you I have a headache? A boozer, of like course I have a headache. Well, so I haven't, so stop lecturing me. How'd I get up here? I dragged you here by the heels. I met all the other hucksters on the way. All right, stop being funny and help me up. Huh? I am the victim of a common error. You don't like me because I'm not entertaining when I drink. You don't object to my drinking. You object to my lack of wit. Oh, shut up. Well, you? it's discouraging to be condemned on moral principle when it's really a flaw in nature. Uh, by the way, I think they're going to arrest you for the murder of Rita Malloy. What about Ryan? I've recommended Clemens. All right, come on. What about Ryan? You bungled it. By the time Hellman got to him, he had an alibi all framed. The calls to Key West could have been made by anybody in the club, and Ryan's covered for the time of the murder. How about the others? They look good, too. Your girlfriend, Tony Drake, was gone for a while the night of the murder. Hellman won't bite. She's just sitting there ready to spring an alibi. That's right. With legs like that, she can dig up a cousin. You better get worried, Patsy. I am, I am. The El Palateo is a dead-end street. I don't know where to go from there. That guy Bruno in the boat could help. There's some connection between Bruno's wife and Rita Malloy. You're the only connection I can think of. Yeah. Hello, Novak. This is Hellman. Yeah. You were right about Bruno's wife and Rita Malloy. We just went through her safety deposit box. I'll bet you handled the money. She had a clipping on Bruno's wife from a Miami paper, 1937. Go on. Divorce action between Zweiss and Miss Olga Pryor. Well, did you look up Olga Pryor? That's where we run out of gas. Nobody knew her. We have no description. Well, how about Rita Malloy? Any dope on her before 1937? I was going to ask you. You were in the room with her when she died, don't you know? No, I don't. I'm disappointed. I figured you'd know a little about her habits. Huh? You wrote the book, mister. I figured you for an answer. Yeah, I got one. And you just gave it to me, Hellman. Ah. Meet me at the El Palateo in a half hour. Now, if you're a real good boy, I'll tell you who killed Rita Malloy. Are you going to be there? Yeah. That's all I want to know, Novak. <laughs> 
Things were falling into place like a fixed roulette wheel. Right from the first, I knew that there was something goofy about the picture in Rita Malloy's hotel room. I wasn't sure. I just knew I had something in the back of my mind. I didn't tumble until Hellman tipped the mitt. And then everything was cakes and ale. I sent Jocko up to room 425 in the Royal Arms Hotel, and I told him to get a description of every dress in the closet. I checked at the desk, and I got the name of Rita Malloy's cleaners. I ducked over there, and I got a list of every dress that she turned in for three months. I met Jocko, and we compared the list of dresses. Well, it jibed fine, except for one thing. There was a missing white dress. It had been to the cleaners before. It wasn't there now, and it wasn't in that hotel room. Well, we went over to the El Palateo to find it. Jocko didn't want to buy the scheme at all. Patsy, I protest the notion of breaking into a lady's dressing room. Stop worrying, will you? She's not going to be there. Then it's futile as well as immodest. Besides, uh, how do you know Rita didn't throw away the dress? I'll give you better than track odds on that one, Jocko. Here we are. Come on. Now, look, you take the closets and find that white dress. I'm going through the desk for grease paint. You should be going through a woman's closet. It's more in the nature of things. Just look, huh? There's enough grease paint here for the whole Iroquois tribe. Did you find anything? Yes. Watch this. Just look for the white dress, Jocko. Hey, what's that in the corner? Where? Over here. I don't see anything. Well, down here, look, see? Mm. Well, well. That feels good, doesn't it, Jocko? Like a spell of perfect weather. Same grease paint? Well, it won't take us long to check. Here, you open a couple of these jars. Don't huh? forget your apron, Patsy. Hello, Tony. What are you doing? Getting ready to build a fire under you? You're going to make nice smoke, too. I liked you better when you were dumb, Patsy. You don't look good with a Ph.D. Oh, put away the gun, baby. Remember, this is your second trip to the plate. Give me the dress, Patsy. It won't fit. I'll worry about that. Just toss it over by the door here. I'll do better. I'll bring Stay it. Stay where you are, Patsy. It's my ticket out, chum. You're a good guy, Patsy. Stay out of my way. It's your role, baby. Patsy! Patsy, please stay away from me. Come on, give me that gun. Patsy, please! Give me that gun! Sorry, Patsy. That's all I could do. Yeah, sure. You want to take a look at her, Jocko? Put it down on the floor. Yeah. What do you say, Jocko? No dice. Well, you can't win them all, Tony. Play too rough, Patsy. You still got a good batting average, Novak. Hello, Hellman. You better make a fast pinch. She do it? Yeah. She got kind of clumsy in the last round, didn't she? Not at all, copper. They had me coming and going. When you're as far back as I am, they don't pick up the option. Let's get out of here, Jocko. I'll check with you later, Hellman. Be a good boy, Patsy. I'm going to miss you. You were getting to be my favorite hobby. Yeah. I don't know how you were on the distance stuff. But you were sure something on the sprints. Yeah. Be nice to her, Copper. She could go in the mud herself. It was blackmail, of course. Tony was once married to Bruno's wife. Rita Malloy found out and started to squeeze Tony. Well, Tony wouldn't buy that, so she killed Rita Malloy in her hotel room. She made one mistake. I didn't tumble until Hellman mentioned a woman's habits. And I knew what was wrong with that picture back in Malloy's hotel room. It hit me like a discordant note in music. Rita Malloy was lying on the floor in a dressing gown, but... She was still wearing her bracelet and necklace. Well, when a woman undresses, she always takes her jewelry off first, and then she takes off her dress. Rita Malloy didn't do that, so I took a flyer and decided that somebody had taken the dress off her and put on a dressing gown. Why? Well, because there was something wrong with the dress. 
It pointed too much in one direction. Oh, it could be a lot of things, but probably grease paint. Tony called Bruno out here. He was supposed to use my boat to dump the body, and when he didn't make it, Tony got scared and lugged away the dress. My 70 bucks? Well, it would have looked better on a fixed fight. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How did I happen to know that when a woman undresses, she always takes off her jewelry first? I must have read it somewhere. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adler. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. Trying to make a living down here, you're not going to have any standing in the community except in a police lineup. I rent boats and do anything else that goes with a weak will and a strong stomach. It's not all bad. Once in a while, something happens that makes you feel good for a moment. Like remembering somebody you kissed a long time ago. But most of the time, you buy your beer the hard way. It works out all right, because most people learn to fall in love with a dollar bill and forget about trouble. And everything sounds all right, but sometimes it isn't. It's like saying Happy New Year to a lifer. I found that out Wednesday night. I was sitting in the office with a sports page reading about those big tears that Washington senators were shedding when I saw Crockett Odom for the first time. He was a big red-faced guy, and the vein stood out on his face and made a pattern as if he slept on an alligator bag instead of a pillow. He walked over to the desk and started to get quiet in a loud voice. I want to talk to you, Mr. Novak. Go ahead, pile up a lead. My name's Odom. You heard of Crockett Odom? I don't get around. Tell me about it. I'm a lawyer. I want you to watch a client for me. The name is Wendy Morris. Is she hard to watch? You can get bloodshot eyes just looking at her. She drinks a little. What's a little? How should I answer? Any way you like. A pint, a quart. What's a little, Odom? Is she a dipso? We'll leave it there. She can make a quart of gin disappear while anybody else is looking for the corkscrew. Mm hmm. What am I supposed to do? Hide the bottles? Mr. Novak, a full grown octopus couldn't do that. I'm afraid this is more serious. It involves her husband. Let her take a drink and lose him. It'll save you money. It involves her husband or somebody who's supposed to be her husband. Well, right. she's got a bad memory. She's a very wealthy girl, Mr. Novak. Five years ago, she married a man by the name of Stanley Morris. Immediately after, he went into uniform. You make it sound selfish. She's been gone ever since, until a month ago. Spent most of that time overseas. The rest in the government hospital. Yeah. Now that he's back, something very peculiar has happened. I don't think the man is her husband. Well, that's a hard part to play. Has she got any theories? I think she suspects, too. I don't know why I feel that way. He seems to have picked up where he left off. He knows everything about her. Seems normal, but I'm sure the man is an imposter. Look, Odom, find a corner and patch up that story. You can't get that nearsighted on five years' booze. You don't understand, Mr. Novak. 
He was seriously injured. That makes identification hard. You think Stanley Morris is dead? I think he died somewhere along the line. This man took his place. That's a lot of trouble just to share a board and room with a boozer. Not if he can share it with someone else on her money. That's why I want you to watch her. Particularly tonight. Why tonight? Is Stanley full of temper? It's been leading up to this. He wants her to go to a gambling club. And I know he's too friendly with the owner of the club. I want you to go along as a friend. Now, look, mister, I wouldn't go as her friend to a masquerade ball. If you're making a deal, make it out in the open. Do it your own way, Novak. It's $300. Earn it any way you can. Yeah. Where's the club? She'll take you. Just pick her up at this address. Mm -hmm. Does she know about it? She understands you. In fact, that's the only risk you run. Hmm? I told you she drinks most of the time. But when she doesn't, you're the type she gobbles up. Yeah, I'll bring some cheese instead. That won't do any good. It's not the flavor she likes, Mr. Novak. It's the crunch. Good night. When Odom walked out of there, I knew he was the kind of a guy who'd put the wolf at your door if he could get one wholesale. On the way up the pier, he stopped and looked out at the bay as if he intended to do away with it before morning. And then he turned and disappeared around the corner. Well, I sat there for a while, and I went over his story. I was sure it wouldn't hold any more water than a gross of hold, but I had no way of checking. Finally, about 7 o'clock, I closed the office, and I went by the address he gave me. It was a modernistic apartment up on Telegraph Hill, one of those places where they let a guy out of the basement long enough to paint murals on the front. This one had a guy waving a blonde wig in front of a tired old monk named Faust. Wendy Morris' apartment was up on the second floor, and when I rang the buzzer, she opened the door with a nice, easy motion, like a cat getting ready to eat its young. I could see right away what Odom was talking about. If you ever build a house, you'd want somebody like her in the blueprint. She leaned against the doorway, and she was wearing a crepe evening gown that was supposed to let you know that nature had given her a square deal. She didn't say anything at first. She just kept fingering her glass and looking at you as if you knew she was full of gin and comfort. It makes a nice rattle. Are you, Mr. Novak? Yeah, I rattle too. Invite me in. Mm, I'll bet you do. Come in. Yeah. They all paid to like me. Will a drink help, Mr. Novak? Yeah. Sit down, I'll get some soda. No, this will do. What did Crockett tell you? He said you got thirsty. Did he mention men? Crockett thinks they're related. There's no confession of the medical profession. He mentioned your husband. Where is he? I thought that was the problem. Sounds phony. There must be a way to spot old husbands. How? I wouldn't know. Do you think Stanley Morris is dead? I don't know, Mr. Novak. Do you care either way? As long as I'm safe, no. Stanley was no bargain. Why'd you marry him? I don't know. I suppose I confused the hangover with love. Well, he sounds exciting. About as lively as a dish rag in a steam bath. It doesn't make any difference now, Mr. Novak. I'm frightened. You've got to help me. You're in for three hundred dollars. That's all. Where is this gambling joint? Out on Gary Boulevard. It's called the Mother Load. The sense of humor belongs to Frankie Fannin. Is he funny enough to deal with Stanley? I don't know. Stanley's been out there every night for two weeks. Now he's forcing me to go. There must be a reason. There must be a reason for what? Don't tempt me, Stanley. This is Mister Novak, my husband. I never heard of you, Novak. You got me worried. He's a friend of mine. What does he do, drive a beer truck? My husband is being subtle, Mr. Novak. He's going with us, Dan. We don't know anybody well enough to take him with us. You don't have to feel burdened. I'll take him. Aren't you wearing out that leash? Now, look, mister, I'm here on a straight deal. Cash and carry, and your credit's through. From now on, that mouth of yours costs you dough. Go ahead and pout, Dan. You look better with your lips turned in. All right, if you like him, he goes. I'll have to make another reservation. Hand me the phone, Novak. Yeah. Here. Thanks. Let's go, Wendy. Your friend backed out. I hope they got a good price for my head because when I started down, shoulder blades were the best I could do for height. I rolled over once and then I stretched out on the floor as hard as a piece of chewing gum on the theater seat. I don't know how long I chased that woman in the bathing suit. Must have been about an hour when the phone began to ring. I tried to get up once or twice, but I couldn't get the boxcar off my chest, and the phone kept ringing like a piece of crystal in a hailstorm. I finally made a ladder out of my knees and got to the phone. Yeah? How's your head? 
It's a little right. What's on your mind? Something's gone wrong. I have to meet you. Mm. Not at these prices. I just got a message from Crockett Odom. I'm leaving now. I want you to meet me in room 314 of the Galbraith Hotel. Where is it? A third rate trap on Powell Street. It's important. Will you come? Yeah. And I'm sorry about your head. I'll have to rub the bruise for you. Wait till I get there. You can rub one of your own. She was right about that hotel. In a good season, they couldn't have drawn transient mice. I got there about a quarter to ten. I rode up to room 314. There was nobody there. So I sat down and started to wait. The floor was quiet, except down at the end of the hall, somebody was playing a phonograph record. The music was thin but loud, and they knew they were old records. Way back when this bird, Bix, was a man instead of a memory. It stopped after a while, and I looked at my watch. It was after ten, so I left the hotel and I went out to the gambling joint. I toured the room, but I couldn't find Wendy or Stan. I got a guy at the window, and he remembered somebody like Wendy, so I asked about her. He just pointed over at Frankie Fannin's office and went on making change. I crossed over and knocked at the door. The guy that opened it had a face like three pounds of warm putty. It was moist and pink, and you got the idea they put the color in with a spray gun. And if his heart was made of the same stuff, they drained the oil out first. Yeah? My name's Novak. Who's arguing? I want to talk to you. Yeah? Where's Wendy Morris? I don't know. She was in here tonight. It's a jail term. I don't follow women home. Am I supposed to buy that? Look, Junior, I don't care whether you live or die. I haven't seen her. How about her husband? He owes me dough. What else? Ask his wife. He's an IOU to me. I don't know what you're doing here, but you better make your point fast. Now, look, Fannin, if you got a party, I don't want to blow out the candles, but I want some answers. Yeah? She got boosted in here tonight. Why? I brought her in for word games. I told her if her husband didn't square his fill, I'd work him into hamburger. Yeah? She offered to bring the buns. Now, that's all the talk you get, mister. Tip the girl on your way out. I need the money. Come in. Choose up and tell me which one's Novak. I am. What's on your mind? The other guy's lucky. I'm Craig from Homicide. Where's Hellman? He's got a mouth full of canary, Novak. That's right. I just left room 314 of the Galbraith Hotel. So did I. Two of us made it then. The girl didn't. Novak, he's trying to tell you Wendy Morris is dead. How do you know she's dead? It's the only reason cops drew. You want to see her, Novak? No. She was better alive. Come on down anyway. Maybe I didn't try hard enough. <laughs> out of there, I felt like a voice teacher with adenoids. Whoever Craig was, he was smart, and he tagged all the bases because as we moved through the lobby, he motioned to me, and the desk clerk nodded. Well, I didn't worry about that desk clerk because he hadn't said no for years. But when we got to room 314, I needed China Passage. There were three or four of Craig's men grouped along the dim hall like dirty shadows, and inside, Wendy Morris was stretched out looking in the wrong direction. There was a white sheet draped over, and I wondered where the hotel had borrowed that, but Craig wanted to talk. You must have had a big beef, Novak. Sorry, we were friends. Oh, but that was fun. I was supposed to meet her here. She didn't show. The desk clerk says she did. Not while I was here. I was in that gambling joint by 10.30. The desk clerck says you asked about Wendy Morris. Then you came up here and killed her. That's the way I'm going to book you. Check on her husband. You can fit him in near the top of the list. She got one? It's a lot of blonde hair to keep indoors. Huh? Good blondes run like salmon. Wait a minute, Craig. Give me that sheet. Well, well. Yeah? Craig, you better not book me for Wendy Morris. Huh? If you do, you'll mix up all the on-duty angels because somebody killed the wrong woman. This isn't Wendy Morris. You, you must be wrong. How do you know? How does anybody know? They look different. They got different personalities. Take your pick, Craig, but somebody got the wrong woman. Take another look. I don't need another with Wendy. The first looks for names and faces. Yeah? You take a second look, mister. It's for love. <laughs> Craig liked to pick his dead because when he found out the woman on the floor was somebody else, he started to shake a little and his mouth hung open like a broken screen door. I didn't blame him much. I tried to think back and piece it together, but it wouldn't work out. It almost made sense, like the broken phrases of an old conversation, but not enough of it came back and, well, there was still something missing. What happened to Wendy Morris and how about this girl on the floor? Where did she get her drag with heaven? I looked down at her again. She was 
pretty, if you like quiet girls. She had a vacant look in her eyes as if the brains had checked out without letting her know. And the color was starting to leave her face. The light was bad, and you had to look close to see her skin. There were little splotches of pink, and the rest was white, like shrimp that hadn't been boiled long enough. Craig was worried, and that's something he couldn't hide. Who is she, Novak? I don't know, Craig. We didn't meet her soon enough to know. Uh, you should have checked. The hotel register says Wendy Morris. Who read it for you? Oh, oh you're tough, Craig. I'll bet you got the wino scared stiff. Keep on talking. I'll get you some help. Come on in. He wants to make a statement. On the bed, Novak. Where'd you get your boys, Craig? They look tired. On the bed, Novak. All right, Joe, take his arm. Yeah. The other two, hold his head back against the bed. Okay. Where's Wendy Morris, Novak? I don't know, copper. You sure you're from homicide? No, it's against the law. Don't tell anybody. Now make a statement, Novak. Yeah, here's a statement about you, Craig. We'll find out downtown. You can save some teeth. Where's the other girl? I don't know. Hold him up. Yeah. Where's Wendy Morris? Craig, you can go. Put his head against the bed. It's for exercise now, Craig. Hmm. All right, he's not a season pass. We don't have to hang on to him. dirty towel and an old garter the maid forgot to pick up last month. I felt my way down to the lobby and into the street, and most of the time, one question kept going through my mind. Craig was going to run me in before. Why had he changed his mind? Well, I found out when I started to turn the corner. Craig had a tail on me, and he was real hard to spot, like a red gnash at the top of the mark. He moved out from under a light near the pool room on the corner, and I watched him in the windows as we walked along. After a while, I quit worrying about him because I knew in a pinch he couldn't follow a conversation with a printed form. Well, I had a lot of ground to cover, so I looked up Jocko Madigan. He's a good guy, and he was a smart one, too. Until he found out if your eyes get red enough, you don't need rose-colored glasses. I finally found him at the cafe house, as tight as a tennis racket in the rain. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Jocko, I want to talk to you. And some belated Christmas carols, Patsy. The piano player quit and everybody has dropped out, so I'm doing it a cappella by myself. All right, Jocko. Christmas eluded me, Patsy. I got up through Christmas Eve and then I seem to have missed Christmas entirely. Did they hold it this year? Well, it wouldn't happen if you'd get up in the morning. I refuse to get up early, Patsy. I refuse to get up in the morning until the streets have been aired. The only things that should be around at that hour are peasants and a bunch of random dudes. Jocko, will you listen? I'm in trouble. I'm not surprised, because you're a counterfeit, Patsy. You're a piece of plate in a room full of stirring. You're like some of the rest of these people running around in a hurry. Jocko, please. Just plunging into anything. Look at the papers. Some people have spent years shooting a rocket 110 miles into the air. What's the use? Will you listen? What's the use? When you get 110 miles up, all you can do is turn around and come on back down again. We're killing time 110 miles in the air instead of learning to spend it down here. All right, all right. Oh, it's depressing, Patsy. Running around in a frenzy like a rooster in a barnyard full of ducks. I'm ready to take to drink. Are you all through, Jocko? Yes. Humanity's a tough life. What kind of trouble? I bought a murder rap for 300 bucks. Well, if it's a bargain, why complain? Who's dead? I don't know who she is. Homicide found her in a hotel on Powell Street. I tagged by before the murder. Mm, serves her right. If I were a woman, I wouldn't trust you in the middle of Stanford Stadium with 80,000 people. It was the wrong woman. It was supposed to be a gal named Wendy Morris, but she didn't show. Mm, that was shrewd of her. I was hired by a lawyer named Crockett Odom to watch her. Why? She's a dipso. Mm, she must have some faults. Odom suspects her husband. He was in uniform, and now that he's back, Odom figures he's a fraud out for the girl's money. Can't the girl tell the difference? She's not sure. 
I don't think she was observant. Now, look, this is a big story, Jocko. I can't fill in all the holes. You've got to help me. I want you to check on Crockett Odom, will you? I'll need some money. Oh, you'll booze it away. Now, hurry, Jocko. If you need money, get a job. Oh, I can't go to work, Patsy. I'm a victim of my own conscience. Yeah. I'm stuck with a dilemma. I'm willing to go to work, but I work too cheaply. And on the other hand, I'll not support slave labor. So it's morally impossible for me to go to work. Good night, lover. It was about 11.30 when I left Jocko, and the two beatings began to catch up with me. I had enough headache to pass out to a Bay Meadows crowd on a bad day. The tail behind me began to look tired, so I dropped by headquarters to give him a rest. I asked for the head of homicide, but the desk told me that Hellman was on his honeymoon, and they kind of laughed when they said it, as if they thought he got the girl there on a bench warrant. All they'd done at headquarters was identify the dead woman. Her name was Emily Van Kirk, and she had no record. I dropped by the hotel, and the first break showed down there. The desk clerk knew about Emily Van Kirk. He'd mixed the rooms up, and he'd put Wendy in the wrong one. That meant that maybe she was at the hotel after all. It also meant that Emily was in the clear. She was just a girl on her way to Seattle, and she got a longer ride than she paid for. I called Wendy's, but I couldn't get an answer, so I dropped by my place to wait for Jocko. Stanley Morris was there, chewing his fingernails. When I walked in, he was up to the wristwatch. Mr. Novak, where's my wife? You're hiding her. She's good enough to hide, but this isn't the night. Well, where is she? She must have gone to you after that hotel. How do you know she was there? Did you drop by, too? Doesn't make any difference. Well, it makes a big difference to me. <laughs> We're all out of phones. Now, tell me about that hotel. Crockett Odom told me to come there. Why? I don't know. I was supposed to be there at 10.30. It was some kind of a crazy scheme. There's a dead girl mixed up in one. Sorry, it wasn't Wendy. Odom tried to break up this marriage. I wish he had. You sound feeble, mister. You don't know her the way I do. She's a cold-blooded animal. The only cold-blooded animal that doesn't bear fur. You're building a case. I don't know what have her around. I suppose you would. There's a certain localized beauty you'd go for, but nobody else would have her. They'd find out what she is, a, a puff at her with a good figure. Yeah, wait a minute. Huh? We got company. Somebody's coming in the door. Watch it. There goes the light. Stand he couldn't have died any faster with a priority. I got to the door and threw on the light switch, but whoever it was had gone and the hall was dark. When I got back to Stan, he was lying there like a well-trained sponge. He wasn't a good enough guy to bleed in the living room, so I dragged him into the kitchen and left by the back way. I had to get word to Jocko, so I left a message at his place telling him to get in touch with me at Wendy's. I went up there to sit on her doorstep and wait if it took all night. I wasn't going to freeze, though, because she opened the door as soon as I knocked. She was still wearing that crepe gown, and she was yawning and stretching her arms. Oh, you might not want to bring her home to Mother, but she'd want to start anyway. Do you always look at women this way, Patsy? I feel like Eve. And I'll bet you get a kitchen full of apples. Do I argue or come in? You may argue, but do it in here. Yeah. When'd you get back? Why? Somebody just killed Stan. If you're sure, the drinks are on me. He didn't like you either. We'd be even if he had anything to start with. Don't ever marry, Patsy. Now, look, lady, I'm nursing a murder rap, and I need some answers. Was Stan a phony? He's the same guy I married, if that's what you mean. You weren't sure four hours ago. I wanted an answer then. What kind? You're too far ahead, Patsy. Come to a trot and have a drink. Lady, has anybody ever told you about a slow burn? I got one now. Mm, I'll bet you have, darling. Oh, this room isn't big enough for games, baby. Give me a Patsy. Go find a guy with a bag of wild oats. Stop shadow boxing, Patsy. All right, baby. Let's hmm. see. That's what makes the poor so happy. They don't have phones. Yeah. Patsy, this is Jocko. What'd you find out? Crockett Odom is in love with Wendy Morris. Does it go both ways? Oh, a different rate of exchange. I got something else, too. Yeah? A will is a big temptation. Go ahead. If she bows out, all the dough goes to her husband. Maybe the guy is a fraud. Oh, he's going to have it straightened out. What else? The funny part of the will. Uh-huh. If they're both dead, all the dough goes to Crockett Odom. You better see him in a hurry. Well, that doesn't make sense. 
If he killed her and got all that dough, it'd cost him that much to get another like her. Maybe not. Oh, you haven't seen her, Jocko. He wouldn't pass that up. She's nice and speedy. Oh, I can explain that. When you're over 50, you don't mind the speed. It's the freewheeling you hate to think about. <laughs> Jocko hung up. I knew he had a good pair of seats. That story of Stan's finally made sense. There was only one reason why he could have been called there at 10.30, and for the first time, I tumbled why Craig had let me go back in that hotel room. Everything was right in place like a mixed master in a bride's kitchen. I dropped by headquarters and left a note, and then the girl and I ran into Craig down at the desk. I briefed him on what had happened, and we rode up to Crockett Odom's apartment. When we got to the living room, things turned stormy. Hello, Novak. It's too late to start a party. Oh, you're going to like this one, Odom. That's right, darling. You'll love it. This is Craig from Homicide. He wants you for murder. It doesn't sound right, Craig. Novak's calling it. See him. I talked to Stan before he died. He tipped your mitt, Crockett. He couldn't tip a water glass. He was smart enough to know you sent for him. That's why he didn't show at 1030. You better have it in writing. No, I don't need it that way. I got Craig. He won't let you out that easy. What's he talking about, Craig? Homicide will shake him down too fast. You're with a walking dead now, Craig. I left a note. They know you killed a girl. Are you crazy, Craig, to come up here? I can't argue now. He's too lucky, Odom. I got all sevens tonight, Craig. Crockett Odom sold you bad goods. He did everything wrong. Thanks, Odom. I'm going to leave you, but don't let the bag get too heavy. Now, wait a minute, Craig. You're not going to let me hang for this. You won't. They burn in this state. Stay away from that door, Craig. Sorry, Odom. You dealt me in, but I got bad cards. I want to see you play him alone. Can you get by this gun? I'll make a try. Hang on to your skin. Give me a hand, Novak. Yeah, anything to help you die. Here. How's Odom? He'll keep. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Novak. What did I do wrong? Everything. But mostly when you let me go up in that hotel room. Yeah. I should have pinched you then. I'm a tender-hearted guy. You're a bum, Craig. I can move you down a step lower even. You're a liar. I checked. You're not working for the city. They never heard of you downtown. I'm not going to make it, Novak. Lay my head down. Yeah. I'll put it down easy. Goodbye, Craig. I hope you have a long night. up Odom and got most of the story out of him. Jocko was right. Odom got tired of chasing the girl and went after the money instead. He drummed up that phony story to plant a reason for a quarrel and then he tried to pay it off in that hotel room. He offered a cut to Craig for the heavy duty work. Wendy was supposed to show up at 10.15. Craig had kill her and wait. When Stan showed up at 10.30, Craig was supposed to stage a fight and kill him. That way he'd be in the clear and so would Odom. They'd say it was a husband and wife quarrel, and Craig had a phony shield to back him up. Craig dreamed up that story about being a cop. But the whole scheme went haywire when the desk clerk mixed up the rooms. Craig killed the wrong woman, and Stan got there late. That's why he got scared when it turned out to be somebody else, so he let me go. Odom was afraid that Stan had showed up and knew the story, so he had a ticket right away. The guy who told me was handy for that. When did I first tumble to something wrong? When I was sure that Crockett Odom had told a lie. He said the girl was a dipso, but when I got there, she was drinking soda with her whiskey. And a good dipso won't waste that much time. Well, it worked out all right. Hellman was on his honeymoon, so he didn't have any questions. But I'll bet his wife did.
Contract for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. Oh, there are a lot of ways to put it, but it's easier if you let your slip show right from the beginning. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to do a lot of things to make a living. Otherwise, it's like being a CPA in a charity ward. I rent boats and do anything else that'll keep a bum lawyer in beer and broadcloth. Works out all right. You make a few bucks if you don't forget there are only two questions you can ask anybody down here. When and how much. Even then you gotta watch out, unless you like your trouble without a chaser. I found that out Monday night. I closed shop and I walked down the street to Noonan's Bar. No, it really isn't a bar. Just a couple of stools with a bottle opener and a jukebox full of Irish tenors, but it's good enough to give you a shove down the road. Must have been about 11. I was sitting at one end of the place by myself. Sorting out mistakes and spending a half dollar on the bar, so I don't know when she came in, but she came in. I remember that. Does it always come up here? If you're lucky, who are you? If you're that lucky, you'd have dollar bills to do it with. Look, I'm low on chatter. Why don't you go down the counter and talk to the racy set, huh? I'd rather buy you a drink. Noonan's a social clamor. He's going to throw you out. You buy me one, then. And I'm broke to strangers. Now, that winds up the conversation. See you later. We'll talk Thursday, then. I went to your office, but they said you were over here. I want to hire you, Mr. Novak. You got a name to go with a figure? It won't fit in your file. I want you for three hours' work tomorrow afternoon. Can you do it? If I said yes, it might be too tough. There's a flower stand at the corner of Post and Kearney. I want you to go to that stand tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Pick up a geranium plant to this address. I'm too big for a Western Union boy. Are you too big for $50? No. Must be a pretty geranium at those prices. Some people love nature, Mr. Novak. Do you care? No, I know a guy who likes parrots. You go to the stand and tell them you want the plant. Take it straight to the address I gave you. It's important. Don't let it out of your hands. For 50 bucks, I'll act like we're married. Mm, I better give you the money now. Oh, you're eager. Suppose I don't deliver. I found you tonight. I can do it again. Mm-hmm. Well, where do I get in touch with you? You don't. Mr. Novak, this is the last time over the course. So take a good look now. Yeah, I'm away past midnight already. Suppose something goes wrong tomorrow. Then it's very simple, Mr. Novak. You won't have to send for flowers. Good night. <laughs> I watched her as she turned and walked out the door. She was wearing a flowered print dress, and as she walked, the roses kept getting mixed up with the daisies. She walked with a nice, friendly movement, like the trap door on a gallows. As she reached the door, she turned and smiled once, as if she knew the 50 bucks was just for laughs. I scooped up the dough before anybody could see it, because at noons, everybody gets broke in one motion. I left a few minutes later, and I went home to bed. I dream real good on 50 bucks, so... I felt good the next afternoon when I got to the corner of Post and Kearney. The flower stand was there, all right, and I leaned against the storefront to watch the guy for a while. Maybe I should have known then, because right away I got the idea he didn't know what he was doing. But you can say that for a lot of senators. So I let it ride. When the jewelry store clock across the street said 2 o'clock, I walked up to him. Can I do something for you? Yeah, give me a geranium plant. What kind do you want? Big one, a small one, I don't care. It's two o'clock. I'll take that kind. You want the geranium? Look, it's going to get dark. You got that long to argue? Here's the one you want, then. You say so. You want to wrap it? No, it's all right. You carry it that way. Well, I'm going to look real funny walking around with a handful of geranium. Why do you want one, then? Uh-huh. I see. You don't feel like talking about it. 
No, just take it and be happy. Yeah. How much? Nothing doesn't cost a thing. Suit yourself. You won't make much dough that way. I'll make even less talking to you. Just take the plant and be careful. Oh? No. How do you know what I'm going to do with the geranium? I don't, mister. Some people eat them. Just be careful and goodbye. Well, the way things were going, Post Street began to look like the main drag in Casablanca. I watched the guy fumble around with a customer for a minute, and then I crossed the street and started up toward Union Square. The cop gave me a kind of a funny look when he saw the geranium. He smiled as if he thought I had a pair of dancing sandals in my coat pocket. About halfway up the block, I stopped to look in an art store. Right then, I noticed the guy with a cane for the first time. He was standing near me, looking in the other window. He was a little guy and kind of wrinkled and bumpy. His skin looked like a cucumber full of powder. I started up the street and pulled in at a bookstore. He stopped, too, and I knew he was following me. When I got to Stockton, I turned left and walked toward Geary Street. Halfway down, there's a little street called Maiden Lane. Oh, it sounds gentle, but so does Vesuvius when you say it fast. I just started to cross when a black Nash pulled away from the curb. Some dead relative must have put in a good word for me. Hey, over here! Hey, pull up over there! Hey, hey, over here! You all right, mister? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll do, I guess. You're lucky you're not dead. Yeah, we're all that way. Give me a hand, will you? Oh, thanks. That car came out of there and hit you on purpose. You're lucky you're not dead. All right. I owe the house a free roll. This lady here took down the license number you wanted? Yeah, thanks. You sure you're all right? Yeah, I'm a slow bleeder. I dropped a plant somewhere around here. Uh, this it? This red thing? Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Didn't even hurt the plant. That's something. You know, when I saw that car come out of there and hit you... You know what I thought about you? That fellow's lucky he's not dead. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I looked around, but the little guy with a cane had disappeared. As I crossed Union Square, I kept looking around, but he was gone. Well, I tried to forget about it, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. It kept coming back and showing up again like a bad reputation. Why had the guy started to follow me and then stopped so suddenly? And how about that guy in the car and that $50 geranium? Well, I got a cab over at the St. Francis stand, and I wrote out to the address that the girl gave me. On the way, I looked at the flower. From what I could see, it was just a geranium planted in a little wooden box. Like all the rest of them, it bloomed unevenly with buds that looked too nervous to come out like a debutante with thick ankles. When the cab pulled up at the address, it was a rooming house out on Clay Street. The note I had said third floor rear, so I went up there and knocked. There was no answer, so I went in expecting to find anything. Anything but what I did find. Hello? Go away. Go away and leave me alone. <laughs> She closed her eyes and stopped talking. She was so sick it showed like a searchlight in a cave. Her complexion was pasty in the color of a November sky. She had no expression on her face, just thin lips drawn so tightly the rims were white. Though she wasn't ready to quit yet, but you could tell she'd been papering the house for years. And you wouldn't want to bet on her. She was going to last about as long as a warm snowflake, it was easy to tell. <coughs> you got a bad cough, you need some sun. I need more than that. <laughs> yeah, I guess you do. Who are you? Relax, I'm not the welcome angel. I just brought you some flowers. Is it a joke, somebody? I don't know, lady. With me, it's a $50 hustle. They're your flowers, so you work out the right answer. Go away. Go away, please. You want the flowers? You brought them for me, didn't you? Leave them and go away. <coughs> Well, it's just a geranium. I'm going to leave it on the table. Why'd they send you? My reason was 50 bucks. Did you come to hurt me? I don't know. Do you rate it? Oh, I'm too tired. You couldn't really hurt me, could you? <coughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for your kindness. Sure, that's what it is. You're welcome.
That's all she said, and that's all that happened in that little room up on Clay Street. It wasn't much, and it wasn't enough to worry you, but for some reason I felt like a man in quicksand complaining about his height. When I left there, I took a car down to Market Street, and I had dinner. Well, it didn't go right, because I kept thinking about this afternoon and last night. Who did she mean by they, and where did all these people fit together? The guy with the cane, the gal that gave me the 50 bucks in the little chair about a maiden lane. Well, I tried to forget about it, but it wasn't easy. It was like trying to change a typewriter ribbon with mittens on. After dinner, I went home. It was about 8 o'clock, and when I got in the apartment, it was dark. Before I had a chance to put on the light, I knew somebody was in the bedroom. I walked over to the door. In the dim light, it looked like a walrus in pants, but it turned out to be Inspector Hellman from Homicide. Hello, Novak. I just dropped in for a chat. You always chat with your hand in the bureau drawer? It's restful. I've been looking over your stuff. Is this a social call or a yacht stealing? Where you been, Novak? What do you care, Hellman? All right, I'll tell you where I've been. In a third-floor room out in Clay Street. I left one this afternoon. It's the same one. Your fingerprints are all over the joint. I'll bet you checked everywhere. What were you doing out there? Delivering flowers. Is that your best try, Novak? It's the best I'm going to do for you. If you don't like it, check with a woman out there. I brought her flowers and left. What woman? The one on the couch. A black-haired girl with a half-dead look. You're wrong twice. Huh? There's no girl out there. Unless she's tattooed on the guy's chest. Uh. And that guy doesn't have a half-dead look. It's better than that. All the way. That's right. He's dead enough to pray for. Will that do? <laughs> Hellman's sleeve so full of fat, I didn't expect anything else up there. He flipped on the light, and I could see he was real pleased with himself. He was smiling like a guy who's just found his partner bidding no trump with 13 spades. He sat down on the bed and unbuttoned his coat. Part of his stomach oozed out and hung over his belt like a 1910 lampshade. He lit a cigarette, and then he began to run his tongue over a set of teeth that looked more like old mandolin picks than teeth. He blew smoke and looked about as appetizing as a piece of squid pie. Must have been a short argument, Novak. The coroner says the guy checked out in a hurry. What else does the coroner say? It was good poison. You buy only the best, Novak. Don't stub your toe, Hellman. I went up there to deliver a geranium plant. So far, you got a good case. The guy was poisoned with a spring needle, hidden in that geranium box. Who was he? He didn't say, and there wasn't any identification. Do you want to help? I don't know, Hellman. When I was there, we were doing Camille. Some ghost woman was dying on the couch by inches. It was her room. You better check. We did. The room was rented ten days ago by a man named George Langley. The landlady says there's never been a woman in the room. That's what all landladies say. Wake up, Hellman. I stood there and watched her shake like a dust mop for ten minutes. You can follow up on her and then check that flora stand at Kearney and Post. What do I check for, bull weevils? He's the guy that gave me that geranium plant. We'll check. I want you down at headquarters by midnight tonight, Novak. You can talk to yourself till then. After that, you talk to us. I'll make it up from here on, Hellman. You don't like it the other way. Suit yourself, Novak. You know when you do. In the meantime, we'll find out what we can. I can't wait that long, Hellman. You couldn't find a tractor on the back porch. I'd hang if I waited for your boys. That's what you're going to do. And at midnight, you can dangle as high as you want. I don't mind as long as my feet are on the same level as your head. <laughs> Hellman left, I sat down to try to piece things together. I knew everything was there. If I could just shove it into place. It was like trying to swap an egg beater for a mix master. I was pretty sure there was something about the geranium plant I should remember. One little thing that threw everything else out of focus. Well, I finally gave up. I was 50 bucks ahead and one murder wrapped behind. It depends on how you like your fun. 50 bucks is all right, but the pleasure's limited. Like giving somebody a hot foot in an ammunition dump. If I was going to drag the town, I needed help. So I looked up the only honest guy I know. An ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's all right for a guy who thinks people with steady hands are lazy. I finally found him in a little tinsel joint on Mason Street. It was high class for the neighborhood. The smoke was only a week old and they had a cigarette girl. A long, leggy biscuit that wandered around trying to sell a sour smile at sweet prices. Jocko was down at the end of the bar rolling some olives back and forth. The rhythm was fine. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time to help me off the wagon. A stout glass for Mr. Novak. No, I want to talk to you, Jocko. Oh, Patsy, confidentially, I hate martinis. I just drink them for the vitamins. Everybody should have a few vegetables, and I have chosen olives. Look, I'm in trouble, Jocko. Will you sober up and talk? I could do that easily. I've done it two or three times, and it's no trick at all. But I refuse, because it's a vulgar display of willpower. Will you stop, Jocko? You know, Patsy, there are only two things that could cause my downfall. 
Whiskey or women? I'm not particular. You find a nice old widow and I'll quit this. Thing. All right, all right. Some uh, plump old party with a memory as vivid as my own. Uh, preferably somebody rich enough to convince me the lines in her face weren't put there by worry. Stop it, will you? Patsy, I'll allow you to motivate my dissent, but I will not permit you to bring it to a halt. Uh, I, I apologize for interrupting. Go ahead. What do you know about flowers? Oh, I think they're pretty on a woman's shoulder, but uh, I suppose that's mixed devotion. Why? Well, I'm going to need your help, Jocko. There's a dead guy out on Clay Street and Hellman's campaigning for me. How do the flowers fit in? A geranium plant. The guy was pouring with a needle in the box. I took the plant up there to a woman. Oh, a clumsy approach. Why a geranium plant? It's a mixed-up story. I got hired in Noonan's Bar to pick it up this afternoon at Post and Kearney. I got gumshoot all the way up Post Street and hit by a car at Maiden Lane. You look bent when you walked in. I took it out to this address and I gave it to a dying woman. Now she's disappeared and Hellman's after me for the dead guy on her floor. Oh, I need some help, Jocko. I gotta find a way out of this. Well, you passed up a golden opportunity when that car hit you. That's one of the places you come in. Now, here's the license. I want you to hop down and check the registration, will you? What is? Find out who runs that flower stand at the corner of Post and Kearney. Now, if you get back in time, I can check tonight. Tag by my place. I'll either be there or I'll leave a message. Where are you going? To find a woman. It seems like a peculiar way to handle a crisis. Well, I gotta find the gal that started me out on this. Patsy, I wish you'd forget about women. And I wish you'd forget about whiskey. Ah, yes, we both have our problems. Except I enjoy one safeguard that you don't. At least I can look at the label and tell how old it is. Good night, lover. <laughs> Well, I got out of there and I went by Newland's place. I asked him if he knew the girl in there last night. He said after 45, a man forgets about a woman's face, so I checked that lead off and started on the other girl. I hit all the cab stands out near Clay Street and I finally found a hack that picked her up. It was about four o'clock, he said. She had luggage and rode over to Janet Street on Telegraph Hill, but he couldn't remember the address at the best rates in town, so I checked off that one, too. From here on, it was going to be a rough ride. I didn't know where to dig. I might as well have been out looking for a stick with one end. I'd like to try one more thing. I went by to search the Clay Street joint. It was a dirty room and the geranium hadn't helped. There was a sweet odor and a... Thick, dusty cloud all over the place. It was like going to sleep in a bag of an old vacuum cleaner. There wasn't anything there that could help, and on my way out, I heard footsteps. I snapped off the light and waited. The door opened slowly. I couldn't see her face, but I knew it was the girl from Noodles. Turn on the light and you'll see your friends. Well, Mr. Novak. Sit down. Let's talk. In here? Why don't we drop our gymnasium and get some fresh air? We can start with your name. It's easy. Say your piece, Mr. Novak. I've run out of $50 bills. Yeah, that's the way it is with my patients. Who killed the guy? I don't know, Patsy. I can narrow it down to one county for you, but after that you'll have to do your own sorting. The police think I did it. Maybe you did. You look big enough to carry the load. I don't care, Patsy. I'm not going to weep. I've got about three tiers left, and he isn't high enough on the list to rate one. Who was he? But how'd you find out he was dead? There's generally a dirty rim in the wash bowl. His name was Charles Dowd. Don't worry about him. It was a small-time guy who the fast music. Well, I'm going to worry about him because Homicide's worried about him. Then worry in a calm way, Patsy. You do it that way, I'll help. Sit down. <laughs> now, look, lady, you better help out or I'll lose your teeth for you. Mm, Patsy, you're tough. And everything, I guess. Who runs that flower stand? It wouldn't help. When he gave you that geranium, there was nothing wrong. For 50 bucks, there had to be something wrong. It wasn't full of poison. I know it was in there and it wasn't poison. Somebody made a switch up here. What happened to the girl? I don't know. Relax. You're going to use up all that nice energy. Look, sis, you can haul in those long legs and give me some answers. I'm going to haul them in long enough to ask a few questions. My turn now, Patsy. Back over toward the door. You can talk on your way. Yeah, you look good with a gun. You made a deal with George. I want to hear about it, no fact. I don't even know George. If he's got a part, you just dealt him in. I'm too old for fairy tales, Patsy. George got to you and found out about that geranium box. It couldn't have happened any other way. Sorry, lady. Remember, you're nothing to me, Novak. You're 50 bucks worth of muscle. You're 50 bucks and I'll spend you fast. Go easy. You're going to break open a seam. I don't know your boy, George, and I can forget you, too. You can do it while you're talking. I came a long way, Patsy. Too far to toss it over for a mail order bum. You're just a passing pair of pants to me, and I'll throw you away faster than a wad of gum. Now's your chance, baby. Come on. Oh, let go. You're hurting my shoulder. Relax. You're not going to have one in a minute. Come on, drop it. 
<laughs> now I'll reach down for that gun and I'll jam you in the basement faster than a ton of coal. All right. Now, let's hear you talk. <laughs> I would, Patsy, but you're not listening. That's what happens when you don't watch the door. Somebody falls in love with the back of your head. I didn't even have a chance to see who hit me. I don't know what good it would have done unless you're the kind of a guy who keeps a scrapbook on those things. When I woke up, I had company. He was taking a nap, too, only his was going to last longer. It was the little guy with the cane. He tailed me right to the end. He was lying there with his mouth open and a bunch of pink gum showing as if he was trying to pick up a few bucks with a toothpaste ad. I was still groggy, and I couldn't see around the room, but I could hear a slow, steady squeaking sound. I turned my head, and Hellman was sitting in a rocking chair. He looked as happy as a choir boy on Christmas Eve. You have a good sleep, Milbank? Oh, why don't they move the morgue down here? Yeah. I guess you ran out of poison. Why don't you go away, Hellman? Home, maybe, huh? I don't owe your wife anything, so I'll wish that. Who's the guy? I don't know. He looked chummy when I got here. I don't know, Hellman. He followed me all over Post Street this afternoon. Check him yourself. I did. There's nothing on him. I'll bet his gold fillings are gone now. Your trial run was a guy named Charles Dowd. I know. He was arrested in 1942 on suspicion of espionage. He's in business again. A whole bunch of them are, and the kicker has something to do with that geranium plant. What bunch? These dead guys and a lot of others on the same schedule. It's that geranium plant. It all started at Post and Kearney. You better check that florist stand. Don't you ever get tired, Novak? Huh? We checked the flora stand at Post and Kearney. The answer is no. Did you talk to the guy? No, because there is no flora stand at Post and Kearney. You're crazy, Hellman. I got a geranium plant there this afternoon. There's no flora stand at Post and Kearney. If you got a geranium, it was grown out of a crack in the sidewalk. <laughs> I left Hellman standing there over the dead man. The little guy was looking up at Hellman with a dull, bored look like an usher in a burlesque house. I was sure now there was something about that geranium I'd missed. If I could find the string and pull it, the whole thing would unravel. The questions were piling up and there was only one answer. Who got to that box and made a switch? Well, it was close to 11 when I got back to my apartment. Jocko was in the kitchen working on an experiment. Ah, Patsy, I'm drinking to your memory. I'm making up for cheap booze with extra sentiment. What'd you find out? You were mixed up. There is no flower standard Kearney and Post. Now, look, I've been through all that once. It was Post and Kearney. I couldn't have made a mistake. Well, anybody can confuse a street. It can be done easily. I once confused two whole suburbs. Yeah, all right. I boycotted a bar in Alameda for months before I found out they gave me the Mickey in San Carlos. Now, look, I know what I did, Jocko. Maybe the flower stand moved. Maybe it was never there before. But today it was at Post and Kearney. How about that license number? The car is registered in the name of George Langley. Who's he? He rented the murder room, and he's mixed up in a switch on that geranium plant. What kind of switch? I don't know. But whatever it was, George did it. When it left that stand, there was something else in it besides a poison needle. Everybody knew it. The girl and the little guy with a cane, probably the guy that drove that car. They switched plans? No, they changed. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it could have done that too, huh? Was the man with the cane behind you when you got hit by the car? Yeah, I think you're right, Jocko. Uh, he wasn't trying to kill you. In the confusion, the man with the cane switched plants on you. Oh, Jocko, you're an angel. I'm going to do something for you someday. You already have. I charged this bottle of whiskey to you. Yeah, Novak talking. I got news for you. Mine's good, too. That poison needle plant was engineered by the little guy with the cane. We identified him. His fingerprints match an espionage agent called George Langley. Well, he was due any minute. There's nothing else on him except he lived in a place up on Janet Street. So it happened that way. Huh? That's where the other geranium is, Hellman. You better get up there before they ring down the curtain. That other plant's going to draw all the boys and girls. What does that prove? Nothing, except you haven't got any business bothering a flower unless you're a bee. Well, you never know how the cards are going to fall, but when it's a wild game like Red Dog, whichever way they fall, it's going to hurt. And the last card's the one that breaks your back. So when Hellman hung up, I grabbed the cab and rushed out to Janet Street. It's a little short street draped down the side of Telegraph Hill like a torn ribbon. When Hellman pulled up at the top of the hill, I met him and we started down to George Langley's address. Hellman opened the front door and as we started into the bedroom, we ran into a traffic jam. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, Evie. 
This is Hellman from Homicide. I don't have time now, Patsy. That's all you got, baby. Grab her bag there, Hellman. Patsy, you're crazy. Open her bag, Hellman. That's what they're all after. There's the geranium over by the window. Let's have the bag, lady. You're all too grabby. I'll take it. Come on, Evie. Who's this guy? A pixie, Hellman. He's the guy that sold me the flower down at Post and Kearney. I'm sorry you got mixed up, Novak, but I'm short on regrets tonight. Give me the bag, Evie. Go easy. We're going to get in too deep. You're in up to your nostrils now, baby. The bag. I want that piece of paper. You don't need a gun, Gerard. That's up to you, Evie. You double-crossed me, and I'm too old for a new set of tricks. That's the way it had to be, Gerard. You can see that. When George cut in, there was nothing else to do. He was high man in, low man out. You're out there, and I want the bag. Stay away from me, Jerry. Give me time. I'll get far away. I'm going to hang on to it. Stay away, Jerry. I hear you, but that's all, baby. <laughs> Give me a hand, Patsy. You're going to need more than that, Angel. Help me to the couch. Sure. Come on. There you are. Thanks, Patsy. You didn't know me that. I can't take it back now. How's Gerard? He bleeds big. I wasn't so tired. Just laugh and laugh. No, I wouldn't do that, Angel. You're going to be there in time to hear the echo. What's in the bag? A formula. What other thing, Pat? Yeah. One other thing. <laughs> What'd she say? I don't know, Helman. She took it with her. Where does that leave us? Short one girl. She's in the apartment or on her way up. Don't look too hard, don't you know that? <clears throat> How many more are there? She's the big act. How do your friends look, sweetheart? They look the way they should. <clears throat> oh. They watched me get sick. They didn't do anything about it. They sat around waiting for the last ounce of blood to dry up. You better go with Hellman. Please take me while you have a chance. Take me. No. Yeah, you're more than ready. Oh, I think they look wonderful. They let me work for years. They let me get this way. And then they sat around to listen to my heartbreak. <laughs> but Hellman was confused. He finally got the story off the girl in a hospital bed. All five of them had worked together once, gathering government information, but when the big order came, Double Cross set in like an epidemic. They were out after a formula. The dying girl had one half, and the other half was in that geranium plant. It came off the boat and went to that phony flower stand. Evie and Gerard were afraid to deliver it themselves, so they hired me to do it. The sick girl was in on another frame. She tipped off Langley and... He worked that hit and run with Dowd, only he forgot to tell Dowd about the poison needle. When Dowd was dead, the girl checked out for Langley's place. Between them, they had the formula, but they got in the beef, so she killed him. She came back to plant a phony lead for Evie, and that's how I got sapped. Evie tumbled and headed for Langley's place. When she left, the girl planted Langley next to me in that room and then went back to watch Evie and Gerard in that overtime match. I guess she was too sick to care one way or the other. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How come five such bad people ever got together in one shuffle? I don't know. Except most people are full of a lot of good and a lot of bad. The day we met them, all the bad was showing. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. The voice of information and education. Pat Novak, higher.
Sure. I'm Pat Novak. For hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you don't get prizes for being subtle. If you want to make a living down here, you got to get your hand in the till any way you can. You rob Peter to pay Paul, and then you put it on the cup. So I rent boats and tell a few white lies if the price is right. It's a happy life, if you don't mind looking up at a headstone, because sooner or later you draw trouble a size too big. I found that out Tuesday night. It was raining, and the street was as deserted as a warm bottle of beer. Must have been about 11 o'clock when I came out of the office and started down the waterfront. As I got near the corner, I stopped. An old man stepped out of the darkness and started across the street. It was a short trip because a car started up down the street and the old man couldn't have made it with a pocket full of aces. I started over to him. The car slowed down for a minute and turned the corner and disappeared. As it passed under the street light, I caught a glimpse of the license plate in a dull, surprised way, the way you'd grab a feather out of an angel's wing. I bent over the old man and rolled him on his back. He didn't seem to be in pain. He was an old man with the frightened look of a small boy in a storm. He was breathing hard as I cushioned his head. Please help me. Can you please help me? Not the big order, mister. Oh. Uh, I must talk to you. Well, if you've got any good quotes, you better get them off your chest fast. In my pocket. Inside my pocket. You please put your hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. Two envelopes. What about them? One is money for you. You have the other one? So far. The other one. Please keep sealed. And you will give it to John St. John? John St. John? Yeah. Well, where does he live? Oh, you don't understand. It's not... I, I want to tell you. Hmm. You don't understand. He was right on that one. I didn't understand a thing, except he slipped out of my arms and stopped paying taxes. I dragged him over the side and I went through his stuff. There was nothing there. No identification. Just a card with an address out on Haight Street. I opened the envelope and $300 tumbled into my breast pocket. The other one was sealed. There was no name on it, but up in the corner there was some kind of marking. It looked like two crosses spliced together. There wasn't anything I could do for him except pray, and I owe some back dues. So I went back to my office and called police headquarters. I told them where the old man was, and then I checked in the phone book. There was no John St. John listed. Well, it wasn't going to be easy to find him, and I only had two leads, that license number and the address on Haight Street. So I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. A good guy, but to him a hangover is the price of being sober. I finally found him singing in a Mason Street bar. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time for the counterpoint. I'm singing a song, a little sentimental thing from my childhood. Yeah, a little keep. I got a problem. You'll always have a problem, Patsy, because you can't keep out of trouble. You know that, don't you? You have no self-control. All right, Jocko. You have no more self-control than a bucket of mercury dumped on a marble staircase. All right, now, shall we check the bright talk? I just saw a guy get killed. Oh, you, you're like some violent disorder in nature, some large but unprofitable storm. You keep whirling in circles, Patsy. If you ever go more than ten feet in one direction, it's because some woman is nine feet away. Then it begins all over again. Are you all through? Yes, get to the point. That's another of your troubles. You never get to the point. I just saw a guy killed ten minutes ago. How would that interest me? Are you uh, selling an eyewitness account? Some old guy got killed down on the Embarcadero. He checked out fifteen feet away from me. Who killed him? I don't know. Why do you care? Uh, professional jealousy? Some car came out of nowhere and clipped him. You sure it wasn't an accident? Yeah, just like the Berlin blockade. Will you stop needing me, Jocko? I told you a guy got killed. He was murdered right in front of me. I gotta find a guy called John St. John. How St. John? John St. John. I don't feel like vaudeville tonight, Jocko. The old man gave me $300 to deliver a letter, and I made him a promise. Well, you can break it now with only the slightest risk. 
I got the license number of the car. Now, I want you to hop down and look it up. And then check at headquarters to see if the guy's got a record, will you? I don't like policemen. They depress me. Check it. I gotta go out to Hate Street. Uh, what kind of neighborhood is it out there? Well, it's not exactly a neighborhood. It's, it's more like an architectural afterthought. A lingering defense against the early California bear. All right, all right. No speeches. Just check on that license plate, huh? Now, if I'm not at my place, try this address. Yes, that's always very interesting at this time of night. Good night, lover. <laughs> Jocko was right about the neighborhood. When I left him, I doubled by my place and left the envelope. I put it inside another envelope and stashed it behind some books, and then I headed out to look up John St. John. Oh, it must have been about midnight when I got there, and it was the kind of a neighborhood where a for rent sign reads like a ransom note. I found the place, though. It was an old rooming house, a third-floor apartment. I knocked at the door, and when she opened it, I knew it was time to wire home for money. A tall, blonde blister with lots of Fahrenheit. He stood there leaning against the door, smiling, looking at you as if you had gold-plated muscles. It gave you a weak feeling where your dinner ought to be. And her voice came right out of the oven. Well, you're out kind of late. Yeah, I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. Oh? Won't you come into my cobweb? Sure. For a spider, you're nice and chubby. Wow. Well, a spider, man. My name's Lee Norton. You want to write it down? I'm Pat Novak. I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. You seem to be running a temperature on the subject. Sit down? Yeah, the couch will do. I'll bet you carry rainy nights in your pocket. All right, now let's get out of the woods, Angel. I'm looking for a guy. I know you're wearing out the pants. I don't know a John St. John. A dead man was carrying around your address. He was? That seems rather futile. Yeah, an old guy about 60. He got killed crossing the street. He should have had a boy scarf in. I don't know anything about him, Mr. Novak. Despite occasional temptations, I don't collect 60-year-old men. Well, he was looking around your address. Why? I don't know. Maybe he admired me from afar like a sunset or something. No, he stopped admiring sunsets about 20 years ago. I see. What are you, the avenging angel? He gave me a sealed envelope. And you were supposed to give it to a man named John St. John. That's right. He gave me 300 bucks to ease the pain. I forget that. You don't look like the charitable type. He was a nice old guy, so I'm going to find his boy. Maybe I could help you. Well, you've got a clear, fast track. Let's see you go. Well, I told you I don't know John St. John, but I'll do this much. Yeah, I know. You're going to be big-hearted and offer to take that letter just in case you ever meet someone named John St. John. What? You brought along your crystal ball. Your hand's shaking, baby. Maybe it's the wind. You better hold it. You need a handrail, friend. Yeah? What are your plans? I'm open-minded about it. Well, you're a nice Spider-Man. Yeah. The wind's getting a little worse, isn't it? Yeah. Wish you'd act a little more surprised, though. I'm not. When I walked in, I could see you had both arms broken. Did you pay the rent this month? Keep the kettle on. I'll only be a moment. Hello, Lee. If we're early, just give us a magazine. No, come on in. Well, just enough for some bread. You're right. You're only gone for a moment. Who are your friends? Well, I don't soak. Did they lock the manhole before they left home? His name's Novak. Yeah? That's a pretty name. It don't rhyme with anything, but it's pretty, huh, Joe? Yeah, it's all right. Let's have the letter, Novak. You got hold of a bad rumor, fella. The one I got's good. Let's have it. I don't want to strain your mind, Junior, but try to understand. I don't have a letter. Ask him again. Go on home, mister. You're not going to get anything out of me except a small tip. Now, if you're a good boy, I'll give you a nickel for your friend, too. All right, Joe. <laughs> hold him up. <laughs> yeah. Just a minute. He's got a head of hair. Hold him up. <laughs> All right, Mike, that's enough. That's enough. All right, baby. Don't look so sorry you can't have everything. It's easy to sleep if you got the right friends. When those two donuts were through, I hit the floor and made Rip Van Winkle look like an insomnia victim. I didn't like the floor, but it was in better shape than my face. I don't know how long I was there, but it must have been a couple of hours. I rolled over once and tried to get up, but it was like trying to barbecue a cake of ice. There was a sick, sweet smell in the room. I tried to place it, but my nose was out on strike, so I went to sleep again. The next thing I knew, it sounded like New Year's Eve. Here you go, Uh, Patrick. Up on the couch. What's the matter? Nothing. If you're, you're the kitchen stove, the room 
room is full of gas. Oh. You ought to open the window if you're going to turn on the gas. Well, some of my playmates, I guess. Well, you you weren't at the apartment, so I tried here. Yeah. What time is it? Two o'clock. Who got the quaint idea of the gas chamber? A girlfriend. It was love at first sight. I see. Let's go home to bed. I'm getting used to the floors. That old man started a ball game, Jocko. When I mentioned John St. John to this girl, she turned banker and brought in the gunsels. Did she get the letter? I left it at home. Oh, you're getting smart. Yeah. Three hundred dollars worth. They looked at my dough. Uh, you couldn't have used it where you were going. Yeah. I've checked on that hit and run car. It's listed under the name of Sidney Bronson. Has he got a record? No. <laughs> Everybody's a beginner. Well, let's go home. Oh, it'll be dull, but you'll get used to it. Wait till I wash my hands. Yeah, go ahead. Hatchie! Yeah? What did your girlfriend look like? Was she the lively type? Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Because she's not anymore. Yeah. Those gunsels play rough. She's kind of pretty. What did she do besides sending out vibrations? I don't know. But she knew all about John St. John. Yeah? She picked up the bait like a hungry bass. Also... Look at that ring. How'd you get around to that? The insignia on it. Oh. The same one that's on that envelope. Spliced crosses. Let's go home, Patchy. The police will be here. Yeah. Even Hellman will know she's dead. Come on, we better go. On your way out the door, Jocko, try it sideways because I think it's blocked. Hello, Novak. You look pale. It's my color scheme. What do you care, Hellman? None. She looks peaceful. Yeah, be quiet or you'll wake her up. Yeah, I'll tip go. You always cut her throat before she goes to sleep? Who is she, Novak? I don't know. It's awful cozy here for a bunch of perfect strangers. I don't know every dead girl in town, Hellman. You'll have to check. You can still write, can't you, Novak? Hmm? That's all you'll need down at headquarters. Come on. Oh, get out of the haze, Hellman. You don't know who's dead yet, but you're going to book somebody. Yeah. What are you doing up here, appraising the joint? I came up to find a guy named John St. John. She doesn't look like a guy named John St. John. She was my lead. I came up here to smell out a rat. She had a half Nelson on me when two gunsels walked in. They came up to fix the gas meter, I think. You stay out of this. I'll make every effort. Now, if you're smart, you'll fingerprint this place, Hellman. These boys were cute. They've been in somebody's jail. I'll handle my job. You stick to murder. You'll go a long way to pin this on me, Hellman. I can go a long way, Novak. Not with what you've got to drag. We get a call in the middle of the night. Come up here and find you standing over a dead girl. That's right. And you want me to sprinkle powder all over. Back up and take a better look, Novak. Oh, the view's fine, Hellman. And if you'll take a good look, you'll know why. You haven't got anything to give the DA except a slim lead and a fat hand. You're going to need help. Not on this one. You need help to find the street. Come on back to center, Hellman. Even with both hands, you couldn't. Yeah. Forget it. So take the medicine like a good boy. I'm not going to walk out and let the two of you tour the town. I'm going to book one or both of you on a murder charge. All right. Book Jocko here, then. I love you in a generous mood. you got a string, then, Hellman. Somebody's got to find John St. John. Well, who's going to find Jocko? Oh, stop worrying. I'll bail you out. You haven't got the right size heart, Novak. You'll let him die on the vine. Hellman, sometimes you're guilty of unexpected wisdom. I know it's reflex action, but it's consoling anyway. I want you, Novak. I want you bad. I'll take this guy as a down payment, but I'm going to close out with you. Remember that. I will. All right. Come on, mister. Wait a minute. Patsy, you're not going to let him lug me off like this. What else can I do? The guy likes you. It was a bum curve to throw Jocko, but somebody had to dig us out of a hole. Jocko wasn't the boy. He can't shovel dirt with a bar rag. I had no idea where to start. There were two murders, and they were both tied up with this John St. John. He didn't look like a good guy to know. Then there was that insignia, too. The one on the letter and the one on the girl's ring. Sure, it could be a coincidence, but that's what they said about Bluebeard. The only thing I could do was open that letter, so I went back to the apartment. I didn't have to turn on the light. They were running in pairs tonight. She was sitting there on the couch, proud of a pair of long, silk legs, and smiling like a guy who knows he's got a million bucks in the bank. She was blonde, too. A little more lemon juice, maybe, but blonde, anyway. She was nice and comfortable, and I got the idea she'd just signed a lease. Good evening. How do you do? Not very well, so far. A sly remark, Mr. Novak? No, I'm just bringing you up to date. Your girlfriend's dead. Yes? Yeah. The gas jet's out in the kitchen. It is? I think that's supposed to be mysterious. You clear it up, then. Find a name for yourself and a reason why you picked out my furniture. Oh? Do you mind my being here? I just want to know your name before I throw you out in the hall. Mr. Novak, I'll bet you're awfully slow when it comes to throwing somebody out in the hall. Not if they can bounce as well as I figure you can. When you do throw me out, throw the letter out, too. All right, now, I've already had a dress rehearsal. The answer's no. Well, at least I know where you stand. 
By the way, why are you standing? Please sit down. Hmm? Who's John St. John? Don't be redundant, Mr. Neville. Who is he? If you want that letter, you know him. Don't shout. I'd like you better if you could. I don't need your vote. Who's John St. John? I don't know him. You want that letter because you collect stamps? I want it. And you'll have to take my word. I don't know John St. John. You worth breaking your heart over. Look, there's a good guy down in the clink sweating on a murder rap for me, so I want John St. John. You've got nice friends. Who's Sidney Bronson? How does that fit into the picture? This started with a waterfront corpse. The leftovers belonged to an old guy that was hit by a car. The car's registered in the name of Sidney Bronson. Mr. Novak, you seem so intense. It's a pity to waste it on random speculation. Now, look, I told you, lady, I got a friend in the jug. Loyalty's a nice trait. One of your nicest. Yeah. You're a pretty thing, Patsy. Let's don't get fooled by the rapper. I'll take a chance. Anybody ever brief you on trouble? Mm-hmm. You're hard to see that far away. Come on over into focus, Patsy. Yeah. You're pretty, Patsy. You look like you're on a bill of sale. I'm a gentle car, Novak. I'd just like to break your ribs. Go ahead, I can get a brace. Come here. Yeah, what's on your mind? What you're gonna say when you find out about this gun? Huh? That's right, sweetheart. My finger isn't hollow. Back up and take a look at the gun. <laughs> you got to that purse, huh? That's right. You've ruined my confidence. I'll give you a testimonial. In the meantime, I want the letter. You go after everything the same way. I want the letter. It's in the desk. Come on. Right here in the top of the All right. Go, Stanley. I'm already here, lady. All right, now, come on, drop the gun. Let go of my arms now. That's your version. Let go of me. Let go of me. I... Oh, that boy? What was that for? A little something in the house. Now, beat it. Well, yeah. you've ruined my confidence. You're lucky. Go on home. You won't change your mind about that letter? No. Suit yourself. I'll be going. Oh, Patsy? Yeah? I can't help you on John St. John, but I wouldn't worry about that fellow, Sidney Bronson. Hmm? Why? Because I'm Sidney Bronson. See you soon, sink in for a minute, but it got about as far as my brain and ran out of gas. She wasn't driving that murder car, otherwise she wouldn't get that talkie. It began to look like a big, fat, well-fed double cross, and John St. John was holding up his end. I had to find out what was in that letter, so I made tracks for the bookcase. All I could do was browse, because the letter was gone. Whoever took it didn't even leave a tip. I thought of the girl, but that didn't make sense. And I thought of John St. John, that made lots of sense. Things didn't look rosy for me or Jocko. I was about to buy a file and bake a cake when the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. The coroner got a report on that dead girl. She died at 12.30. That's pretty close. What's he got, a stopwatch? Fifteen minutes either way. Those fingerprints panned out, too. Yeah? A couple of L.A. strong-arm men. Well, that's new for L.A. You got a call out? We already picked him up. Your favorite's named Welcome Danglers. I could make a joke. I already got one. They're set up with a perfect alibi for 12.30. That means I killed the girl. Nobody's arguing. I, uh, got some more news. Yeah? I'm out at Seal Rock. You got the figure for it. We just found an envelope floating around the water. It's one of yours. You better come on out. You found an envelope, so what? So the envelope turns out to be in some guy's pocket. Come on out. Well, that only meant one thing. Whoever took that envelope out of my place got popular. It was getting late, so I grabbed the cab and rode out to the beach. When I got there, Hellman was standing down near the water. He had Jocko with him. The surf was rolling in, and Jocko wasn't much better. Hello, Patsy. Hiya, Jocko. How's jail? Dry. Thanks for coming, Novak. You're sweet. Where's the envelope? Here. Yeah, it's the same one. That makes you look good. There was a letter in here. Did you take that with the guy's money, Hellman? You got all there is. This guy on the beach is the third one. It's my opinion the case will solve itself. We're running out of people. Who is the guy? His name's Walter Avery. Here's his stuff. Yeah, what's left? Well, this spliced cross really gets around. Ah. It keeps bobbing up. Here it is on the guy's fountain pen. I'm going to run this guy through the morgue, and then I'm going to look you up, Novak. Yeah? Sure. We want you down with us. That's right, Patsy. I'll introduce you to all the best people. Good night, lover. <laughs> Well, it was close.
close to five, so I tagged by my place for some sleep. I tossed around like a fish on the living room rug. Hellman called about nine to throw more dust in my eyes. He said one of the airlines had a passenger to Portland named Walter Avery. Just to make it tough, the guy made the 12 o'clock plane and got off at Portland. Well, I had left field all to myself. I got dressed and looked up Sidney Bronson's number. There was no answer, so I went over. The place was locked, and I looked up the janitor. He wasn't going to let me in, but it turned out his wife had a birthday coming up. Sidney's apartment was real high-powered. I don't know where she got the dough, but I knew I wasn't going to find a tin cup and pencil. What I found was lots better. A card with that same insignia, the spliced cross. The card said, Bellcrest Sanitarium, and down in the corner there was a guy's name, Dr. Emil Schoenig, psychiatrist. Vienna without the walls. The Bellcrest Sanitarium was down near San Carlos, so I borrowed a new Nash from a guy I know and headed down that way. Everything was fine until I got in the front door. They didn't even let me register. <laughs> up on a couch in Schoenig's office. It was dark outside, and my left arm was throbbing like a love story in a woman's magazine. The radiator sitting next to me was Sidney. You're a deep sleeper. Mm -hmm. I think I got some help. What happened to my arm? Hypodermic. You only need one arm anyway. In your case, I need a spare. Who did it? Dr. Schoenig. He's a darling boy. Where is he? Out on the phone, trying to figure out what to do with you. What's that make me, a patient? Mm -hmm. That's one way of putting it. You made things easy. We were coming to you for the letter. Huh? You want to try that over again? We were on our way when you stumbled in. You're wrong, Sid. Somebody's giving you a fast pitch. That letter was gone when you were up at my place. I don't want a bum rib, Patsy. I want that letter. You're trailing a field, Angel. I told you, the letter's gone. The guy by the name of Walter Avery took it out of my place. Walter Avery? That's right, and somebody thanked him. They found him this morning making like a dead seal. Walter Avery left for Portland last night. A plant, sweetheart. You better read up on your friends. No. Thanks, Patsy. I told you to watch him, Sid. You had more shots. What's the difference? Uh, none, I suppose. Why don't you mix us a drink while I talk to Mr. Novak? I'll be right with you. Well, Mr. Novak, you're one of my best patients. That's because I like your needles. You better go easy on that drink. Yes? Why? You'll get drunk and run somebody down the way you did that guy on the waterfront. Oh? A good guess. You should be proud. That's a good, sensible, final emotion. Here's your drink, Emil. Thank you, my dear. It's to Mr. Novak. Sorry, there's no drink for you, Mr. Novak. You probably will be. Huh? Forget it. Emil, I talked to Mr. Novak before you came in. He thinks you're a heel. He does. So do I. Oh, I can stand it. He told me about Walter Avery. I'm sorry about that. Walter got that letter. You killed him and took it. I was supposed to blunder around till you got rid of me, too. That's a bum joke, Emil. You're getting hysterical. With laughter, Emil. You put one of your boys on that plane. Only Novak aired the wash too fast. Suppose I did. Somebody ought to bring you up to date, Sydney. You've been hanging on too long. The free ride's over. Might as well tell you now. You're all through. I can't. A whole bunch of longer bit. And I'm all through. Steady, Emil. What's the matter with me? <coughs> What's the matter with me, Sid? Give him a hand, Novak. He just had a bad drink. You wouldn't do that, Sid. I'm full of surprises. you got a stomach full of poison. You got a stomach full of poison in 15 seconds, Abel. <coughs> put down that gun, Abel. I want you to sit. Please, Abel, put down the gun. I will tell you. It's possible. <coughs> it's happened kind of fast for you, Nova. What's the noise, huh, Patsy? Yeah. I'll get you a pillow. I'd rather have your lap. You get mercy, not love, baby. Thanks for small favors. How do I look? Not so good. That was a three and two pitch. Yeah, I had it coming up. I'll tell you about John St. John. I know. There was no such guy. That's right. It was the name of the group. Those spliced crosses? Yes. Found out a little late. It was always that way. The way I found out about you. Yeah. I had a funny hunch about you and me. Found out a little late. But I know now, Patsy. Does that help?
John St. John was the name of an organization buying and selling government information. That old man tried to tell me, but he checked out too fast. I began to figure something like that when those spliced crosses started showing up. Shoney killed the old man in Sidney's car. He couldn't stop because I was around. The two girls and Walter Avery were both in on the deal. Shoney knew who I was when he saw me go into my office. He tailed me to my place and left Avery there to look for the letter. He killed that girl up in the rooming house, and then he found out she didn't have the letter. When Avery showed up, he took it away from him and threw him to the fish. Shoney was trying to shake Sidney by sending her up to my place after he had the letter. The scheme went haywire when I showed up at the sanitarium. He was trying to work himself out of that one when the payoff came. John St. John? Well, right from the start, Jocko said he was either dead or in the state pen, because anybody with a name like John St. John would have killed his parents as soon as he got old enough to find out about it. Worked out all right. They found the letter out at Schoenig's place. There were some plans for guided missiles and a few other trifles. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How come Shoney didn't kill me before I could talk to the girl? Well, it's always that way with a guy who commits murder. Either he goes too far or he doesn't go far enough. Pat Novak for hire. <laughs> I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak, for hire. It's about the only way to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco. Because around here, a set of morals won't cause any more stir than Mother's Day in an orphanage. Maybe that's not good, but that's the way it is. And it wouldn't do any good to build a church down here. Because some guy would muscle in and start cutting the wine with wood alcohol. All you can do is try to make the books balance. And the easiest way to do that is keep one hand on your billfold and the other hand on somebody else's. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else that'll buy a warm winter. Works out all right. It saves the government a lot of money. But if anything goes wrong, your trouble comes hard. It doesn't do any good to sing the blues, because down here, you're just another guy in the chorus. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. It started to rain up by Pier 19, and I knew there was a storm on the way. The bay looked flat and smoothed over. But you can say that for a lot of quarrels. So I closed the office and walked down to the barber shop for a shave. The barber lathered me up so I couldn't answer back, and... Started to tell me how Dean Atkinson ought to handle things. About five minutes later, somebody walked into the shop and started to tap on my foot. He got tired of that and moved up to my chest. Hey, you listening? Hey, stop pushing. That's my chest, not a buzzer. Are you listening? Yeah. What's on your mind? Hey, I want to talk to you alone. He's a barber. He won't listen. Let's go alone. All right, let's go. I'll be back in a minute. How do you like that? I got a 14 to go my wife. He says... I want to hire you tonight. Will you do something for me? Not for friendship. I give you $200 to follow a woman. I've done it for less. Not this kind. Her name is Agnes Bolton. You'll find her at 7 o'clock tonight down at this bowling alley. Here's the card. Mm-hmm. Address is there. How do I spot her? Read it off an ankle bracelet? You won't have any trouble. She's a large woman about 50 years old with a reddish face. Well, that's no help. For 50, she sounds normal. Not Agnes. She couldn't pass for 90. She'll be playing in the last alley with a woman's team called the Playmores. Yeah. You'll follow her out of the bowling alley. Somewhere along the line, she'll pick up a green leather bag. After that, I need your help. It doesn't sound like love. She'll go to the yacht harbor. Get aboard a boat called Seventh Heaven. I want you to have your boat ready and follow her into the bay. She'll leave that bag aboard some ship. I want to know the name of it. Now, is that $200 worth? Yes. I'll wait for you in your office. Contact me there and be careful. Is she that tough? No, but her friends are. With a figure like that, how come she's got any? They're holdovers. I just be careful. Yeah. Well, it sounds easy at these prices. That depends on your luck, Mr. Novak. If it turns bad, you've been cheating. (laughs) 
He stood at the door for a minute and his eyes swept the shop like a $10 broom. And then he turned around and walked off. Now well, you couldn't tell anything from his face and his smile was as smooth as a pound of liver and a bucket of glycerin. Well, after I finished, I went down to Pier 19 and I took the boat up to the yacht harbor. I tied up near the 7th Heaven and I started downtown to that bowling alley. It was ladies' night and I stood against the back rail and watched the women bowl. Most of them were wearing slacks and... If I ever get a few bucks ahead, I know the right business. At least the demand is there. About ten minutes after I got there, Agnes Bolton showed up, and I knew right away Max Hunter overrated her. She was at least fifty, because you can't get that ugly without years of practice. She was wearing a green woolen dress, and her figure wasn't any worse than a bale of cotton somebody's cut the wire on. The fat hung down from her arms, and there was so much of it you knew even her bones were plump. And Max was right about her complexion. It was red and scratchy as if she used a bag of sand for cold cream. Well, I must have stood there about ten minutes watching him bowl when the other girl came up. I didn't see her, but I felt her as she brushed up against me from behind. She leaned on the railing close to me, and when she started to talk, it was like grafting a hot iron onto your spine. You look sad, Mr. Novak. Is it the view? Well, what are you, the repair squad? No. I want you to do me a favor. You do me one. Hmm? Slide over. I bruise easy. No. No, what's on your mind? I want you to do me a favor. Don't follow Agnes Bolton. You're pretty, but I got Max Hunter's dough. I'll help you spend it. Don't let Agnes Bolton get to that boat. Look, Angel, go warm up an armory. I got a deal. Suppose I tell Agnes Bolton you're going to follow us. You tell her first without tagging by here. Now, if you got something on your mind, lay it on the line or relax. I want her worse than Max Hunter does. When she gets that green bag, I want you to bring her to me. I couldn't move her that far. You better rent a derrick. Please, Mr. Novak. It's important to me. I want to talk to Agnes Bolton. I can give you more money than Max Hunter. You haven't got enough to cover, lady. You're talking about kidnapping. That's a federal rap. The answer's no. You're sure? Unless you want to change the offer. I hope you make it, darling. I may. Don't bet you $200. It's bad to die broke. Is anybody that tough? Now it's my turn to brush you off. Go ahead and follow her, Mr. Novak. But I'll bet you have to roll her the last couple of miles. Hmm? And unless you can prove it's an election bet, the police will cause you trouble. <laughs> Watched her as she turned her back and walked out of there. She looked real good. She was wearing a tight jersey dress that gave you the idea she either thought the weather was warm or she wasn't much on details. Well, I turned around and looked for Agnes Bolton. The game was breaking up and she started into the dressing room. A few minutes later, she came out and started down Market Street. There was no trouble following her. You could see her in the crowd and she rolled from side to side as she walked, and when she bumped into anybody, they looked back at her as if they'd been hit in the chest with a sack of jelly. She crossed the street at Stockton, went into a little coin shop. She came out about five minutes later with a green leather bag. She strapped it over her shoulder, and she held onto her purse with the other hand. At Powell Street, she got on the cable car up near the front. I moved up there to be safe. She looked heavy enough to tip a cable car uphill. In that light, she didn't look any better. Part of her hair had come undone and hung down in her face like the branches on a dead tree. I noticed her eyes for the first time. They were small and so close together they could have saved time and put them in one socket. Well, she got off the cable car at Geary and walked into a hotel. I followed her and watched her squeeze into a telephone booth on the other side of the lobby. The way she fit a sardine ought to be happy. She took some money out of her purse and started to dial. A couple of people moved in front of her, and I didn't get a look at her for about five minutes. And when they moved away, she was still talking to somebody. I looked up about ten minutes later, and I knew something was wrong. Her head was pressed against the phone. She'd run out of conversation. I walked across the lobby and opened the door to get to the phone booth. She fell out as old as she'd ever get. Hey, there. Hey, help me get over the couch, will you? Yes, sir. Was she your wife? Yes, well, she was. This is the way I'd want her. Her purse is spilled all over the floor. Sure is a mess. Yeah. She's some relative, huh? Look, mister, stop trying to pair us up. I was around when she tumbled out, that's all. Yeah. What'd she die from? I don't know. I just figured you might know what she died from. No, I don't. It's a simple question to answer when you know what all she right, died all from. All right, let me through here. Come on. All right, stand back. Give her air. She can't use any more, Copper. Huh? She quit about five minutes ago. Who are you? I'm not dead. She is. Then who's she? You better check on her stuff. And don't forget that green bag. Yeah. I... What bag? The green bag over there on the floor. Well, it was over there a minute ago. The same one the little guy had? What little guy? 
The one who was talking to you. He just walked out of here carrying a green bag. Well, I got out on the street, and the little man had just crossed Geary. He turned and looked back once, and I saw him melt into the crowd and disappear quick like the wake of a ship on a dark night. When I came back to the lobby, the copper was over to the couch, making noises in his throat as if he was trying to eat a pound of cellophane. The manager of the hotel was wringing his hands and making little steps like a ballet dancer with a hot foot. The copper took my name, put in a call to homicide, and a few minutes later, I got into that phone booth. There was a number on the pad, and I took it down. It was Greystone 42961. Well, it didn't prove much, but Agnes Bolton wasn't out to prove much tonight. I began going through the phone book, but there was no Max Hunter listed, and when I called the office, nobody answered. I knew there was as much chance of him showing up as a second piece of butter on a 50-cent lunch. I ran down that Greystone number and found out it was an address out on Post Street. I walked through the lobby and out the side door. Some of the people were out of the dining room, and they looked mad because Agnes Bolton had died during the roast beef instead of later. Well, I walked down Geary to the Union Square garage and gave the guy my ticket. He started down the ramp for the car, and I stood there waiting. I must have looked lonely, because Hellman from Homicide shoved up near the cashier's cage and started over. He made his way through the cars, and as he squeezed by the last one, he looked like a sea lion. Hello, Novak. We identified her. Well, you had lots to work with, Hellman. Where are you going? Out on Post Street. I'll go with you. Her name was Agnes Bolton. You read it somewhere? She was a government agent. They got their money's worth. Barner says she died of quick poison. How quick? Five minutes. You're working him too hard, Hellman. He's got a license? He says five minutes. She was in that phone booth ten minutes. Nobody got to her. She looked dead to me, Novak. I don't believe you. Well, I'm hurt. I don't believe a thing you say. That's up to you. I'm not starting a religion, Hellman. I watched her for ten minutes. Nobody got to her. You better check on that little guy. Yeah? She was carrying a green bag. A little guy walked out of there with it. He sounds hard to find. You don't. Hey, mister, is this your ticket? Yeah, it's a blue nag. Now you better come down and drive it up. Why? I can't get to the wheel. The guy on there won't move. Huh? I don't blame him either. When you're dead, you got a right to rest. <laughs> Hellman stood there a minute, wiping his teeth with his tongue, and it began to sound like somebody beating the bathtub with a piece of steak. When he finished making noises, we walked down the ramp to the car. It was the little guy who had taken the green bag. He was hunched over, and he was grabbing the wheel as if he'd just married it. Hellman lifted his head up and laid him across the seat. The light was bad, but you could see a little of his face. It was watering around his forehead, and the damp hair was plastered down under his hat brim. The perspiration had broken up and started to run down his forehead like tears, and you got the idea he cried out of his hairline instead of his eyes. He didn't look surprised or pained. He just stared with a puzzled look as if he'd missed part of the conversation. Hellman stood there trying to wipe some egg off his coat and turning to look at the guy to make sure he didn't leave. So what happened, Novak? So he had an automobile accident, Hellman. I don't know. He's your passenger? He bummed the ride himself. When I saw him, he was on his way with that green bag. Where is it? He got talked out of it. You better check on a guy named Max Hunter. Uh, whose cousin is he? He gave me 200 bucks to tail Agnes Bolton. I got another offer, too. Yeah. A blonde biscuit, and she said everything on the beat. A total stranger. You sure met a lot of people. You better meet a lot of them, too, Hellman, because one of them got to Agnes Bolton. How about Junior here? Did he crawl down the ramp and die on your seat covers? I don't know how he got here. Well, maybe you left him here and forgot. No, he wouldn't slip my mind. I haven't murdered anybody in the front seat. I bet it's lively, though. You better get a story, Novak. You already got mine, Hellman. You won't like the ending. No, but I bet you do. I like it fine, Novak. You're the only lead on Agnes Bolton. I'll shop around and get enough to pin you down. You couldn't pin down a dead butterfly, Hellman. You better look up Max Hunter and check on a boat called the Seventh Heaven. I will, and I'll put a tail on you, Novak. Follow you all over San Francisco. He'll go any place. That's fine, because I got a suggestion. As soon as Hellman left, I took a cab out to that address on Post Street, but it was a waste of time. I might as well have been peddling tip sheets in a monastery. There was a brown house on the corner, and there was a big curved window that stuck out from the rest of the house like a wart on the back of your neck. A toothy old man answered the door and said he didn't know Agnes Bolton. I was pretty sure he was on the level. He just kept nodding his head and rubbing the wrinkles on his face. There were enough of them there to bundle up and sell as a canal. I left no downtown again. On the way, I went by the yacht harbor, and the seventh heaven had moved out into the stream. Well, it was raining harder now, and the 
box looked shiny as if somebody had given him a coat of egg white. Well, I had a couple of places to hit, so I looked up Jocko Madigan. He's a good guy who never learned that if you keep your foot on the bar rail for 20 years, it'll do more good for your arches than it will for your brain. I finally found him in the hunt room of the Bellevue Hotel. Well, let's see. A drink for Mr. Novak. Something to take off the chill. No, I don't want to drink, Jocko, and you've had enough, too. I refuse to shiver to death, Patsy. I'd look terrible with a blue face. Will you stop drinking, Jocko? I hate whiskey, Patsy, but I'm drinking tonight with a purpose. I made a deal with Charlie, the bartender, to buy every eight drink, and I got him on the run. By morning, I'll have him in bankruptcy court. Look, Jocko, I'm in trouble. I always know when I've had enough to drink, Patsy. When I tilt the glass up, the rim rubs against the bridge of my nose. It's a sort of safeguard so that when my nose begins to break out in blisters, I know I've had enough for the night. Will you listen? Patsy, you sound like a young girl coming home from boarding school. You'll never be on the right side of things. You'll always be in trouble because you're a bad citizen. You're a shabby half-step in the march of progress. All right, Jocko. You don't know the difference between good and evil. For you, all of human endeavor is a vague blur in high heels. And your vocabulary is a few gutter terms sandwiched in between yes and no. You'll never be any good, Patsy. Yeah, yeah. You might as well try to recapture melancholy or ventilate a swamp. You haven't a chance, Patsy. You'll never be any good. Are you all through, Jocko? Yes, if you're going to be touchy. Hellman wants me on a murder rap. Yes? Some tubby woman died in the hotel lobby. Sounds like his mother. She was a government agent. I followed her in there. Patsy, you've got to start trusting the government. I was paid to follow her, but she ate some poison somewhere along the line. Uh, that's the trouble with food. I got hired by a guy named Max Hunter. Look him up and resign. That's the best way out of this thing. I don't know where to find him. And I think that Max Hutter's a phony. Oh, you gotta help me. Yeah? Now, he gave me this card. His prints must be on it. Check it down at headquarters, will you? Find out if he's got a record and then tag by my place. Yes, uh, I better have a drink first. There's an ugly taste in my mouth. I, uh, I think it's saliva. Will you hurry up, Jocko? All you do is drink. That's all I have left, Patsy. I'm too young to die and too old to do almost anything else. Yeah, sure. It's true, Patsy. When you get to be my age, most of the quiet pleasures are fattening, and most of the active ones would kill me. Good night, lover. <laughs> Jocko, I dropped by the Chronicle Morgue to look up Max Hunter. There was nothing under Hunter. I looked through every Max from Bear back to Beerbum, and I couldn't find a thing. Well, it was close to 11 when I rode down to the office for a final check. It wasn't raining hard anymore. It was a nice, easy drizzle. You could hear it playing against the sheds along Pier 19. It sounded quiet, almost private, like the sound a woman makes when she runs her fingernail up and down her stocking. It got on your nerves at first, and then you began to enjoy it. The minute I got to the door, I knew something was wrong. There wasn't any reason, but I got the feeling. The same way you know sometimes when you're going to get the busy signal on the phone. I could see her lying there on the floor before I turned on the light. You took one look at her, and you knew she was the sort of girl whose name ought to be Pearl or Myrtle. Somebody would sapped her, and she was lying with one hand stretched out and the other under her hair. It wasn't really hair. It looked more like a pelt or a... Raccoon just after a shampoo. It was fuzzed up on the sides, and on top she'd combed it back so tight it was about to go under the scalp. She began to move a little. When I bent over, she started to mumble. What do you want? The red, if you're going to stay long. Here, put your head up. Are you Mr. Novak? It's too late to change. Where's Agnes Bolton? Where'd she go, Mr. Novak? I don't know where she went. Was she a good girl? Something's happened to her. Don't worry, it won't happen again. Who sent you here, Max Hunter? Yeah. Please help me out. All right, come on. I'm Francine Kane. I came to find out about Agnes Bolton. You're a deep sleeper. What happened? You wouldn't know her. I would if she's a tall blonde on the make for that green bag. Who is she? Joan Haywood. You can find her at the Geary Theater. Is she an actress? Not exactly. Yeah. Her stray talents, Mr. Novak, are dimensional rather than dramatic. If you're smart, you'll stay away from her. Don't tell him anymore, Fran. He's paid up. Hello, Hunter. You oversold me. You give me back the 200. I'm going to give you lots for your money. Don't include Agnes Bolton. I don't know anything about her. Is that a lie? Might be. There's a green bag. Joan Hayward has it. Is that a lie? The little guy didn't think so. She left him dead in my car. Let's go, Frank. No, you're in a hurry, Mac. You're not. I hope you like your office, Novak. Huh? Because this is where you're going to spend the night. 
Don't let him feel bad, lady. It must have been his turn. When I left, he was crumpled up against the desk and she was staring down at him as if she forgot to water the plants. When I rode by the Geary Theater, it was dark, so I looked up Joan Hayward's address. When I got out to her place, I knew I'd made a mistake. The landlady clutched her bathrobe like a bar of solid gold and told me Joan Hayward left the house ten minutes ago. There was a cabbie at the corner, and he said he dropped her at the gold bar club a few minutes before. I got down there about one o'clock, and Hellman was wandering around, stopping every few feet as if he expected to hear something. The bar was dark except for a light over on one side, and over near the jukebox, Joan Hayward was stretched out as dead as a deer on a fender. At first, Hellman didn't pay any attention when I walked in. I stood there for a while and looked at Joan Hayward. She still looked pretty, except in the dim light her skin looked coarse and reminded you of a piece of felt that was almost worn out. But the rest was all right, and Hellman came over for another look. What did you forget, Novak? My black tie. How'd it happen? The bar was closed. Where were you? Crawling out from under your thumb. Yeah. We're going to keep that coroner. It was quick poison. Yeah. We found a needle in her coin purse. She didn't know about it and ran into trouble when she started to call up. You better find this guy, Max Hunter. That's going to be hard. Yeah? There is no Max Hunter. Does she believe that? Your shaker friend came in with a card. We went over the fingerprints. They belong to Jackie Wren. He's wanted for espionage. For more than that now, Hellman. Maybe. Where have you been? Look, Hellman, stop needling me. I won't go on the block for her. Don't you like her? I got an alibi you can't break. I've been all over town. Ask your tail. Ask your tail where I've been. That won't get it, huh? He reported in at 11.30. You got the wrong idea, Novak. You don't raid over time. <laughs> When I left there, I knew everything was downhill. Hellman could stick me for everything but Dan McGrew. My only out was to find Jackie Wren, but you can't ring that many doorbells in one night. I went through the book, but there was no Jackie Wren or Max Hunter listed. I went home to get some sleep, and if they turned Gabriel loose tonight, it was all right with me. Jocko called up about nine and said there was still no trace of Wren. Well, some mornings you can't trust yourself with a razor, so... I got dressed and went down to a Greek's on Geary Street for breakfast. The murder was all over page one, but there were so many pictures of Hellman, you couldn't tell who was dead. I was about halfway through breakfast when I noticed the story down in the corner. A girl named Tony Pritchard had been found dead out in the marina. The story said everybody liked her. The police didn't have a lead, and they couldn't find a reason. Seemed kind of funny, but when I got to the last paragraph, I began to wonder... It said she was employed by the Musatone Company and worked the late shift as a switchboard operator. I wasn't sure, but you can't pass the dice when you only got a buck left, so I jumped down to see Frank Lupo. He said the Musatone Company owned the jukebox in the gold bar club, that it worked like all the rest. People use a little microphone in front of the box. They call into a main switchboard for songs. I grabbed Jocko, and we got up to the Musatone Company. The guy in charge said, sure, they recorded some of the talk just to check on the girls, and sometimes the girls did it just for laughs. Well, we started through the recordings, and about a half hour later, Jocko rolled a seven. No, Patsy, they're all old ones. Try this. Yeah. Well, put it down. I'll handle the needle. Uh, there. Crazy, Jackie, she'll know something's wrong. Let me handle it, friend. You'll just get into trouble. I don't want you to get into trouble, Jackie. Will you let me worry? You get back to the hotel. I'll meet you to Kenwood right after. It's too late. She's coming now. You made a mistake, Joe. It's one time you shouldn't have hurried. That's enough, Jocko. Let's get up to Kenwood. Why don't we think it over a while? Put the record down and come on there at the Kenwood. You heard the shots. That's what I'm worried about. If that fellow's any kind of a mechanic, he's had time to reload. <laughs> I got down to headquarters and told Hellman why that girl, Tony Pritchard, lost her vote. We rode out to the Kenwood, and Hellman started through the register. There was no Jackie Wren listed, and we didn't have any better luck with the girl. I briefed the desk clerk, and he said he thought there were two people in the hotel who looked like that, but he didn't know their names. Well, all we could do was wait for him to show. So Hellman and I walked down the street and slid into the car. must have been about 3 o'clock, and for the next four hours, we sat in there. About seven o'clock, it began to rain harder. It wasn't easy to see the front of the Kenwood. 
I got out to wipe the windshield, and that was a mistake, because just then the door of the hotel swung open. The girl came out first, and then Jackie ran. He saw me right away, and the two of them jumped over to the curb and got into a car. Riding with Hellman's, just about as safe as eating an arsenic sandwich. When we got to the corner, they turned east and started down Bush. It wasn't easy to stay behind him. The rain was hitting a windshield, and it was like trying to see through a mint julep. When we got past Jones, Hellman began to close in. It must have scared Wren too much because it stopped and he swung the car around with Hellman a few feet behind and it was a dead end both ways. You can't get out now. Open the door. Yeah. There he is. Over to the wall. Over here, Hellman. He'll go down that embankment on the other side. Well, he can't. It's too steep. Stay on this side. Can you see him? No. But he's around, I think. You got a chance now, Wren. Come on out. I don't like you that well, mister. Over there by the embankment. Can you see the girl? She's with him. Over to one side. Move up in front. Oh, you're confused, Hellman. I pay the taxes. It's gonna hurt from now on, Ren. I'm coming over. I hope you make it, copper. All right, copper, unless you want a medal, I'm through. You don't need the gun, then. Get rid of it. Just toss it over there. Can't even lift my arm. Throw it down, mister. Jackie, Jackie, please. I'll throw it right at you, cop. Ah, good. Francine, you crazy woman, you crazy. You let him kill me. He's going over that embankment. You let him kill me right in front of you. Ah! No. No, Jackie. Please, Jackie, I tried to stop you. I tried to stop you, Jackie. Grab her, Novak. She's going over. Leave me alone. Come on, man. Jackie, I want you. Forever. I want you, Jackie. At least they can let me out there. Jackie! Long way down. Yeah. Too bad her name wasn't Jill. Last I saw Francine, she was lying down at the bottom in the rain. Her head was over to one side, and you knew with a little push she'd roll around as easy as a ball bearing on a plate. Her face was clean, but the rain was beginning to wash the dirt down, and when I left, she wasn't pretty anymore. Jackie Wren outlasted her by a few hours, and Hellman used them all. Agnes Bolton was carrying government papers bound for China. The four people were split into teams. Jackie Wren and Francine were trying to outbid Joan Hayward and the little guy. The way Jackie had it figured, he'd find out what ship they were going out on and pick it up from there. Joan Hayward knew he was dealing with me, so she followed me after I left that barber shop. She saw me park the car in that garage and tailed me down to the bowling alley. She planted the needle in Agnes Bolton's purse, and the little guy tagged along behind waiting for something to happen. Just to be on the safe side in case anything went wrong... Joan doubled by the office and gave Francine a headache. When the little guy got the green bag, he took it to Joan. It was too good to split, so she killed him and left him in my car. Well, then she made a mistake. When Jackie called her up and asked her to come down to the gold bar club, she bought the story. Oh, it would have worked out fine for Jackie if he hadn't talked in front of that microphone. But a nosy girl heard it and tried to put the screws on him. Well, Hellman asked only one question. About that conversation between Jackie and the girl. Why would a person say anything that private in front of a microphone? I don't know. But I told him about a couple of others Jocko and I heard. He didn't say anything. But I'll bet he gets a hold of those records and plays them every night before he goes to sleep.
sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. Oh, sure, you can spell it 50 different ways, but down on the waterfront in San Francisco, it all means the same thing. You pay and I'll do, and the customer's always right if he's got an open wallet. Then I'll match it with an open mind. Unless he's after murder, then the price gets out of range. And down here, you're either high on your toes or flat on your back, because most of the time you get only one kind of pitch, fast and inside, and you don't try if you're foul because nobody cares. Even then, you can't complain. During the summer, the morgue's the coolest spot in town. Oh, I rent boats and wrap up small sins and $20 bills. The money's good when you get it, but there's no retirement plan, and you can't buy vaccination for trouble. I found that out last Wednesday night. I closed up shop about 8 o'clock, and I started walking home. The city was down on its hands and knees trying to crawl through one of those San Francisco hot spells that blast by every five years. From up on the hill, the Chinatown tenements lined up down below like sweaty little kids waiting for a shower. It was heat and headaches all the way. But when I opened my front door and stepped inside, who wanted to talk about the weather? She was standing in the dark, smoking a cigarette, and the silhouette her figure cut against the window was something you'd never believe. Then she reached over and turned on a lamp. It was a fast, dizzy trip, but when I got around to her eyes, they were the kind that made you think of hard-working geysers. Deep and warm, and you knew you could count on some fast action when they came to a boil. The smile was familiar, and the lips were red and moist, like a sweet that rose waiting for a bee. Oh, she did lots of nice things with her mouth, and talking was one of them. Patsy, welcome home. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's good to see you, Georgie. What's on your mind? Patsy, can't you ever take your time? It's not mine, it's borrowed. Anything special in mind? Mm-hmm. Easy business. Got a drink? Mm-hmm. How easy? Just a boat ride. You can't get hurt. That's what they told the Spanish Armada. Getting soft, Patsy? No, not in the head. Now, look, if it's work, let's talk. Otherwise, let's just be cute, huh? All right, Patsy. The last time you saw me was a year ago. As far as you know, I'm not in town. Fine? You tell me. Go on. Tomorrow night, a freighter's due in here from Shanghai. The SS Calcutta. I want to be on the welcoming committee. Who says you can't? Nobody yet. But the ship's going to anchor in the stream, so I need a boat. I need you. I'm not the social type. I don't think I'll go. Believe me, Patsy, it's an easy trip. So is falling downstairs. Come on, let's deal or drink. All right, Patsy. My stepmother's going to meet the Calcutta, too. Who's she? This is Sheila Lampson. She likes parties? She likes a package she's going to get from somebody aboard the Calcutta. Uh-huh. What's in it? That's her business. I just want to make sure she gets that package ashore, all right. You were on it? She doesn't even know I'm in town. Who picks up the check? Here. The $40 covers. It's too much for an easy job and not enough for a hard one. Where do I find you if I need bail? Here's a phone number. You can call me there tomorrow. And Patsy. Thanks. I don't forget easy. Quite a rush. Because you scare me, Patsy. You really scare me. You remember the party, Patsy? Yeah. But memories are like everything else. They wear out. Then let's make some new ones, Patsy. at the door and watched her move down the hall toward the stairs. The white dress she had on was plain enough, but it didn't have a mind of its own. It just did what it was told and tried to behave, but Georgie and nature wouldn't let it. There was only one cat in seeing Georgie. She always left too soon, like a small bottle of fine whiskey. Well, it must have been a good five minutes after she left when I heard the buzzer. I was looking for the white dress when I opened the door, but I was looking the wrong way. <coughs> side of my head. I went down like mercury in a quick freeze. The trip wasn't nice, but it was long. Halfway there, I came up for breath, and I found the deck of one of my own boats under me. The Bay Bridge lights were still around, and that made it kind of cozy. When my eyes got in focus, the smooth-looking bundle laid out next to me shaped up like Georgie Lampson. She wasn't looking her best. I had just enough time to remember a pair of women's shoes standing next to my face, and then I must have moved, and they punched my ticket for a return trip. The next time I opened my eyes, I was looking up at the lights on Pier 19. Oh, the shoes were still there, but this time they were black, and the feet inside squashed out wide and flat like tired beefsteak. That meant only one thing. Hellman from Homicide. You can stop playing mouse, Novak. Get up. The party's over. Yeah, Hellman. I thought they'd never go home. Your boyfriend here isn't talking. 
Are you bashful? Yeah, no, back. He's real shy. He's dead. Who is he? That's what you get paid for. What about the girl that was here? County Hospital. You better pray she makes it, Novak, because you like blonde Hellman. Because nobody beats two murder raps, Novak. Well, you talk funny. So does this hunk of lead pipe. Your prints are all over it. What, does that make me a plumber? Better than that, Novak. The pipe fits the dent in that guy's skull like it grew there. Well, maybe he's the plumber. You're smart, Novak. Now, come on, who's the guy and who was the dame? He's Georgie Lampson, the guy I don't know. Who will, Novak? We'll take care of that. Oh, you try hard, don't you, Hellman? You move your lips when you read, you use your fingers when you count, but you never get the right answer. Don't tell me, Novak. I'm not my cherry best in the morning. You don't have a best, Hellman. You tried thinking once, but it gave you a headache. Now when you get in a squeeze, you have to pound your way out with your fist. I warned you, Novak. Now talk nice and save teeth. Yeah. I'll talk when that blonde tells her story. If she makes a grade, how does she figure? She met me in my apartment last night on business. Five minutes after she left the doorbell rang. When I answered it, somebody sapped me. Now you take it from there. Yeah, I will. Right to the DA. Go ahead, Hellman, but don't look hurt when the case blows up in your face. You giving on? That's all I'm giving, Hellman. You figure it. I took the gal and this girl I don't even know for a ride at three in the morning. We had a party and I killed a guy. But the gal I only messed up good because I like the way she talks. You sound scared, no Well, I'm not, Hellman, but you are because it doesn't add. Why did I beat my skull with that same hunk of pipe and how did I drive back here to meet you? Keep your mouth open, smart boy. They got a little green room up at San Quentin. Gets awful stuffy when they close the door. Well, after I left Hellman, I figured I'd had a bumper crop of trouble for one day. The sun was just beginning to stagger up over the Berkeley Hills when I caught a cab uptown. On the way, I stopped off for coffee and a 6 a.m. chronicle at one of the little Greek joints off Geary Street. The windows were blind with grease and the light was bad, but the reading was money from home. The story made me stop counting the lumps on my head. Professor Burton Lampson had gotten himself murdered in a Shanghai hotel room a month ago, and they were sending his body back on the SS Calcutta. It was due to anchor in the bay that night, like Georgie said, but the shipping page didn't agree. The Calcutta was listed inside the gate at 7.30 the night before. How did that check out? And what about that package that had everybody worried? Well, when I got back to my apartment, I called the hospital to check on Georgie. They were still giving odds, the long, thin kind. A little later, I was in the middle of a cold shower, adding up rows of zeros and getting different answers every round when the phone rang. It was Hellman, and he was selling nothing but smiles. You feeling any better, Novak? Oh, don't tell me you're worried. We just identified the dead guy. His name's Warren Haynes, local socialite. You know him? Yeah, I'm an old friend of the family's. The guy's from one of the old families in town, the important kind. His blood wasn't blue. No, but we are. We're feeling the pressure already, so I'm calling you in today for a little talk. It's a great job, Hellman. You keep right on smacking your fat lips because you're going to get more answers than questions. That's funny, Novak. I didn't think you knew the difference. When I hung up the phone, I was seeing more red than the bleachers at a bullfight. I probably would have walked right by him if he didn't open his mouth. Even then, it wasn't much more than a loud squeak. He was a skinny guy standing against the door with a half smile twisting his mouth and a bright, wild look in his eyes. You seem disturbed, Mr. Novak. Where's your invitation, mister? This should prove sufficient, Mr. Novak. All right, so you want a gun. What happens now? Now, Mr. Novak, I use the gun unless you hand over the package. Sorry, mister, you're in the wrong laundry. Mr. Novak, I've been crossed once today. I don't intend it shall happen twice. The package... Now, look, you, I'm going to spell it again. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, take that can on your pointing and... I think you realize I'm about to use this gun, Mr. Novak, for the last time. All right, all right. You'll find it right over there. Now here, right next to me. Now, come on, give me that gun before somebody gets hurt. He stood there for a minute, shaking his head as if he wanted to go back and wipe five minutes from his life. All of a sudden, he jerked around on his tracks and he stumbled for the door like a timid drunk when you tell him he's had enough. Then he folded up hard against the wall on his knees. But it was a little too late for prayers. I stood there for a minute trying to think of a good lawyer who owed me money, but all I could see was a courtroom and a picture of Hellman smiling as he listened to the verdict. Well, accident or not, if Hellman dropped in with a body on the floor, he'd bury me so deep in San Quentin he'd be bringing me air in paper bags. When the knot in my stomach untied, I dragged the little guy away from the door and I rolled him on his back. His eyes were still asking for the package, but the rest of them didn't care. Outside of a few bucks, his wallet was empty, not even a laundry tag. Well, I got dressed, and I pulled the blinds and locked the place up. And then I went out to look for the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor by the name of Jocko Madigan, who was a fine surgeon until something made him decide life was temporary at best. 
Now he's got a permanent post on a bar stool looking for answers at the bottom of whiskey bottles. Well, it's hard on the liver that way, but you're never short on dreams. I finally found him with a bourbon halo and a musty little Italian joint over in North Beach. It was a long stretch from Easter Monday, but he was still celebrating Irish independence. He looked like he was on the wrong side because his nose was a bright orange. Ah, Patsy, my boy, you're just in time. These simple but honest Sicilians have agreed to embark with me on a crusade. And as honorary past president of the Sons of St. Patrick, the uh, Power Street chapter, I invite you to join us. Come on, Jack, I'll sober up. i got to talk to you. Oh, to fittingly observe the occasion of old Ares' joyful victory, we're first fortifying ourselves with grappa and bushminnows. Then we sally forth to chase all the snakes out of Long Beach and the cockroaches out of Chinatown. How does that strike you, Patsy? And uh, why aren't you smiling? It's a glorious day. Because I'm in a jam and I want to talk, Jock. Oh, now cut it. Oh, Patsy, you remind me of that devil era fellow. You're sitting on the curb and pouting just because they won't let you march in front of the band in the victory parade. You're sour, Patsy. Admit it, Jocko. Will you snap out of it? I'm in big trouble. You're always in trouble, Patsy. You're a child of adversity, a son of scorn. The fates spit in your eye and you try to retaliate, but the wind's always blowing in the wrong direction. You're a lost leaf in the mortal storm, Patsy. You're a pebble shaking a tiny fist at the mountain. You would like to fight for some strange, fantastic cause, wouldn't you, Patsy? But you can't find anybody your size. Men are too small and the gods are too big. Patsy, you're lost. Are you all through? Yeah. What kind of trouble? Oh, it's a pair of bum murder reps, Jocko. Somebody sapped me in my apartment last night and I woke up this morning with a dead guy. That sounds interesting. Uh, what was it you were drinking? Hellman's out to pin this on me. Oh, a dubious honor. You uh, mentioned two murders. A guy came in my apartment this morning waving a gun and asking for a package that I never heard of. We started wrestling for the gun. Ah, mildly exciting. Now, who got it? He did, right in the chest. Patsy, you have absolutely no excuse for losing your temper. Why, you're not even Irish. Still, you're always getting hot-headed at the wrong time. It was an accident, Jocko. I didn't even know the guy. I'm sorry, but I can't cry. Sure, that's what the British general said after he hung Robert Emmett at the dock. But he didn't straighten out the Marcel in his neck. What are you doing out of jail? Well, you knock it off, Jocko. Now, look, did you ever hear of a Mrs. Sheila Lampson? Certainly, and uh, I'm very offended with her. In the past year, she set up drinks for every eligible and non-eligible in San Francisco except me. That sounds good. What else? Not much, but I often wonder what that poor old professor she married does with his evenings. He stop worrying, Jocko. He's dead. Now, look, will you hop down to the Chronicle Morgue and check with Steve Nagel? Have him dig out all the old clips on the professor and Mrs. Lampson, will you? And while you're there, check on a guy by the name of Warren Haynes. You got that? Yes, but uh, what do I do for money? Half a buck for car fare and nothing for booze. Patsy, surely you're jesting. Jocko, will you quit clowning and get going? If you say so, Patsy, but you've broken up a beautiful party. My Sicilian friends have gone to sleep and I'm thirsty again. Let's have four or five for the road, shall we? Later, Jocko. Oh, all right, Patsy, but only for you. Uh, by the way, where can I find you? I'm going to tag by the county hospital, and then I'm going to look up Sheila Lampson. If I remember the story correctly, Patsy, you'd better reverse your schedule. Good night, lover. When I left Jocko, I tagged by Mama Lupo's on Kearney Street, and I called the hospital again. Oh, George, was a little better. At least the undertakers had stopped bidding. Mama Lupo clotted up for a storm when I asked to borrow her new car for a couple of hours, but a few pats and a pinch, and she was all giggles and car keys. Ten minutes later, I was fighting traffic on Potrero Avenue. The south wind out there brought the slaughterhouses right into your front seat. I found the hospital out on the far edge, and it was a nice-looking pile of dirty red brick. The nurse in the ward didn't believe I was Georgie's brother, and so I asked her if she was busy Saturday night, then she saw the resemblance right away. I found Georgie behind a couple of screens at the end of the ward. For a dying woman, she looked pretty good. She smiled a little when she saw me, like she was saving up for a bigger try later on. Patsy, I'm glad you made it. Look, I'm going to keep it short, baby. Who was it last night? Sorry, Patsy. Big deal. You can't tell her you won't. Can't, Patsy. Later I will. And that package, same deal? Same. Well, I got a deal too, Georgie, a murder rap. They want to hang it on me. Who was it? Warren Haynes. Do you know him? I remember. Good corpse. Now, look, you're slicing it awful thin for 40 bucks, Georgie. Patsy, 
Patsy, trust me. No choice, baby. You're driving. Don't go through any red lights. I won't, Patsy. Charles wanted us to know that. They said it was urgent. That's it, Georgie. I'll see you later. Yep. Having a good time, Novak? You know any phone numbers besides mine, Hellman? Not today, bright boy. You near a streetcar or do I send a chauffeur? What's your beef? Our beef, Novak. We'd like it fine if you paid us a visit real soon. Sorry, Hellman. Book solid. Come in, performance, Novak. I wouldn't disappoint. What's the matter, Hellman? You want it in blood? I told you I don't know anything about last night. I never saw Haynes before. You got me wrong, Novak. This one's about a knife. We just found it in your office down on the waterfront. That's fine. Feel yourself an apple and keep busy. You better come down, Novak. We found the knife in some guy's back. <laughs> Houdini couldn't get out of that one in two hours with both hands and a can of olive oil. It was like chasing cyanide with a bucket of brandy. Well, it tastes bright, but it's only a matter of time. Well, I headed for Sheila Lampson's place, and on the way, I pulled up by a drugstore out in the Hate Street jungles and called the Chronicle Morgue. They said Jocko had just left, so I called the nearest bar and asked if they had a customer with a bright orange nose. They did. Jocko Madigan speaking. Jocko, this is Novak. What'd you find out? Ah, Patsy. Just enjoying a small refresher after some very excellent reading. For instance? Sheila Howard Lumpson. She started seeing the professor back in 46. There was a scandal, the, the nasty kind. And the professor's first wife, Barbara, jumped off the bridge, the uh, Bay Bridge. Yeah, go on. A month after she married the professor, Sheila was mentioned in every gossip column in town. So the professor took off on a scientific trip to China. A month ago, he was murdered in a Shanghai hotel and a hat full of emeralds was stolen. The authorities figured that the murder was premature. What do you mean? Well, the professor had had three major operations, and at the time of the murder, he had less than a week to go. What about Haynes? Haynes is one of those black sheep that wealthy families have, uh, cut off without a penny. He's one of Sheila Lumpson's escorts, and he's now on his way back from the Orient on the SS Calcutta. Anything else? Jocko, I could kiss you. Patsy, you stick to your line, and I'll stick to mine. Well, the puzzle was still a sack full of holes and question marks, but at least Jocko's leads had a little juice in them. I found the Lampson house in the best part of the Seacliff district. It was one of those big, nervous joints hanging by its shutters to the side of a steep drop that slid down sharp into the Pacific. All green trim and stucco the color of mortgages. The front doorbell was wearing out in my hand when the maid showed up, and then she was tongue-tied. She didn't know a thing except good money when it was offered. And then she told me I'd find Mrs. Lampson in the second floor sitting room. She went away. I found the sitting room all right, but Mrs. Lampson wasn't there. So I followed on through till I came to a bedroom with a bright red ceiling and a lived-in feeling. Reminded you of something Henry VIII might order for a bridal suite. She was sitting next to the couch holding a martini and making noises like a leopard on a honeymoon. Hello. Don't call me baby. Yeah. You always wear handkerchiefs to parties? Mm-hmm. Saves time. Dressing. You're nice. Have a drink? I'll fix them. Oh, you are nice. What's your name? Novak, what's yours? <laughs> Billy. Is that a name or a game? <laughs> You're just like Mike. He's my new boyfriend. This is night off? Oh, no. He just went downstairs for a minute. <clears throat> hey, you make a nice drink, Mr. Novak. <sighs> I'm warm. Yeah, you got a fever or something? No. Must be the weather, Mr. Novak. You feel it? You're a big spender, aren't you? What do I do when Mike walks in? Smile? Oh, Mike's broad-minded. How about Sheila? You picked a good drink, Mr. Newback. She asked a lot of questions, too. Yeah, well, that's because I like answers. Now, what about Sheila? Hey, you're going to get rough. I'll call Mike. All right, all right. I'm Sheila's sister, and it's much better when you're nice to me. All right, then let's start being nice, huh? <sighs> Mr. Newback... What was that for? I'm a big spender, too. Here, have another drink. I think maybe I'll have another you, Mr. Novak. Is that Mike coming upstairs? Could be, baby. Now, come on, where's Sheila? Oh, Sheila, Sheila, who cares? She's downtown, anyway. She won't know. Sheila? Hey, where are you going? Sorry, baby, I got a date. I'm not busy. Well, I do. Don't let him leave, Mike. If he does, he's going to walk through me. Don't stop. <laughs> 
sorry, baby. He's not my type. <laughs> Mike was a tall, wide package, so I gave him a bargain offer. He didn't fold after two, but he had a kind of hurt look in his eye when I hit him the third time, like I didn't know he could take a hint. When he wound up and hit the floor, every window in the house rattled, and I figured the Berkeley seismograph got a cheap thrill. I made it as far as the front door when I heard a car pull up in the driveway. When I got to the window, a dame and a guy were getting out of a new Nash and heading for the door. The guy was a middle-class gunsel, but if the gal was Sheila Lampson, she made nice opposition. Well, I couldn't wait around to see. I finally managed to make my apartment without having one of Hellman's men pick me up, and when I got in, Jocko was just pouring himself another glass of green dreams and posing in the mirror like a man of distinction. The step was still there on the floor next to a glass of ice water. Archie, I don't approve of your choice of party guests. The guy's dead, Jocko. Oh, well, in that case, I'll overlook it. This is the friend you were telling me about? When are you due at the gas chamber, Patsy? Any phone calls? Oh, now that you mention it, yes. Hellman? Regularly on the quarter hour. Not very coherent, but I got the idea he's looking for you. Also a call from the hospital. They wanted to know the whereabouts of a Miss Georgie Lamson. What do you mean? It seems she disappeared a few hours ago from one of their wards. Oh. Patsy, you look worried. Uh, perhaps a sampling of this delicate dollar ambrosia would help. Uh, try it. No, thanks. Suit yourself, Patsy. Myself, I'm an old subscriber to the Socrates plan of self-destruction. If you want it done right, do it yourself. Uh, by the way, uh, have you noticed our friend's hands lately? Huh? It looks like he's entertaining a scrap of paper in his right hand. Yeah, I see it. Oh, I see it. Uh. Hmm. He seems kind of stingy with it, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah I got it. Uh -huh. Oh, an old envelope. Not even a coded letter to puzzle over. I'll settle for the address, Jocko. Take a look. Uh, Captain Edward Small, SS Calcutta, Paramount Line, Shanghai. Well, that's nice. Uh, shall we have another drink? Later, Jocko. Right now, we haven't got the time. Well, that's who I think it is, Patsy. You're going to have lots of time. I'll just whip up a short one. No back talking. Listen smart, boy, and listen hard. This is for the last time. You check in here in ten minutes, or I'll send out an all points. Dead or alive, no back. All right, Hellman. There's a dead guy here in my apartment right now. His name's Captain Edward Small, off the Calcutta. I don't need any more bodies, Novak. I can hang you twice with what I got. All right, Copper. But if you want your picture in the paper tomorrow, you can meet me out in C Clip in 15 minutes. 48 Camino Drive. <laughs> Most of the puzzle straightened out like wet wash in a dry wind. Now there's one thing you can count on. When you bet on miracles, you buy a ticket straight through. I finally pulled up at the Lampson place, and I started looking around for Hellman. The joint looked about as crowded as a Kremlin breakfast for Senator Taft. I was taking a fast check trying to figure how far they could have gone when Hellman fought his way through the box hedge by the driveway. We circled down behind the garage and around the back of the house. We just made it in time for the curtain scene. Sheila Lampson was backing down slow toward the seawall, waving her arms in the air and begging every inch of the way. And Georgie stumbled after her like the avenging angel when she had a gun. She had a coat tossed over her hospital gown, and the look in her eyes told the whole story. Tears and hate and lots of both. No, Mike. No, I just got a stab her. She's crazy. She's crazy. She wanted to kill me. What's so crazy about that? You're sweet, Patsy, but you weren't invited. Don't get too close to the animal. It's your gun, Georgie. Don't let it hang you. This is Hellman from Homicide. No good, Patsy. This one's for me. Isn't it, Sheila? Georgie, Isn't it for me? Please, Georgie, don't. No, they stop her. Stop her before it's too late. All right, girls, let's break it up. Be good, copper. You too, Patsy. It's your neck. It won't look good stretch. Please, Georgie. Don't eat that, Sheila. Not yet. First, I want to tell you how clever you are. How sweet you looked at my mother's funeral. How you ruined my father. How to screech with other men, Sheila. Oh, it was magnificent. Georgie, Georgie, please. I didn't know, Georgie. I didn't know it. I swear I'll make it up to you. Please. One other please. thing, Sheila. Listen to me, Sheila. Those emeralds you've got. The ones you sent Haynes to Shanghai for. The ones he killed my father for. They were glass, Sheila. Ten cent green glass. You hear, Sheila? Glass. Please. Georgie, please. Georgie, watch her. Sheila's got a gun. <laughs> Let's see. 
Just take it easy, baby. You got a long trip. She's dead. Isn't she, Patsy? She's dead. She didn't die, baby. With that much lead, she sank. Ooh. It burns, Patsy. It burns. A little cool. The fog's starting to come in. Remember the party, Patsy? Yeah, I remember. Then say it, Patsy. Please say it now. Say it. <laughs> Yeah, Georgie, I'd say it, but you're not listening. We found a letter in Georgie's coat pocket that told most of the story, and then Hellman grabbed Mike and Sheila's sister and sweated the rest out of them. Well, it wasn't a pretty story, but it moved. When Sheila spent the professor broke and he checked out over in China, Georgie decided to blow the whistle on her. She made up that phony yarn about the emeralds, and then she let Haynes murder her father and walk off with him. They were glass. To make it look good, Haynes played Paul Bear and took the boat back with the body. But not before Georgie tipped the captain and the first mate about that sack of emeralds Haynes was supposed to have. So they went to work. They robbed Haynes and planted a fake for a fake. It was a real cat and mouse game. Georgie only made one mistake, but sometimes that's all it takes. She flew back here a few days before the Calcutta got in so that she could be around for the payoff. One of Sheila's pals must have spotted her and trailed her to my place. And then the sapping started. That was the same night the Calcutta got in and people started checking packages and pulling triggers. When Sheila found her package was a fake, she figured Haynes was being cute, so he got it first. And then she went out after that original fake. She tried to double up and hang Haynes' body on me and get rid of Georgie at the same time. But Georgie didn't die easy. I don't know how the captain got on the moon, probably through Sheila. But her gunsel friends took care of the first mate with a knife when he got anxious. Well, when the dust lifted and they counted cold noses, it was a real devil's game. Wherever he was, Georgie's old man must have been holding his side and rolling in the aisles. Yeah, a real plum. And Sheila found out when you get close enough to the seed, the taste gets bitter. Well, Herman, that's only one question. How come a smart girl like Georgie bought something as stupid as revenge? I don't know. She was a lot better at a lot of other things. <laughs> Cast included Lois Andrews, Steve Brody, Herbert Litton, Jerry Hausner, Ivan Dittmars, Ray Erlenborn, and Hal Sawyer. This is a Larry Finley transcription. Draw to you from Hollywood. entire network, one of radio's most unusual programs, Pat Novak, for hire. (laughs) 
sure. I'm half Novak. For hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak, for hire. If you're trying to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to run things like a smorgasbord. You take a little of everything you can get your hands on. Even then, it's a bumpy ride, because down here, everybody tries to pad his park. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else good men pay bad men to do. You don't get many gold stars that way, but you pay the bar bill, and it's about as safe as a closet full of tigers. The only way you can make friends down on the waterfront is to die. I found that out Tuesday night. I went to the wrestling matches and watched gorgeous George throw some guy around like a poker chip in Tijuana. I was in the middle of the crowd on my way out of the place when this guy stepped up behind me and started talking. You got company, you know that, huh? I said you got company on both sides. Mm. Did your friend get his face at a fire sale, too? Can't all be pretty. Keep walking, Novak. The gun in my bag supposed to help? It's up to you. Straight ahead and out the side door. You got the right growl, but the wrong guy, mister. You keep working your mouth, but nothing comes out. All right, this way. What are your plans? Shall we take the kids? The car, right down here. Now, look, big shot. In a drugstore, I get all the mystery I want for two bits. You want things explained? Yeah, besides Shovelhead here, I don't understand a thing. We just want Joe Deneen. I never heard of him either. We just want Joe Deneen. All right, you can have him. You're welcome. See his wife. See anybody you like. I don't even know the guy. You're full of talk. As soon as you want to make it the right time, you can go home. Here we are, into the back seat. You drive, Eddie. You boys run on. I'll grab a cab. Get in! I'm not going to take a boat. That's good. Just be a good mouse. You've got a lot of time to waste it this way, mister. You're too gabby, Novak. And you're too tough, Junior. And this noise is beginning to give me a headache. Oh. Let's go, Eddie. Novak's going to sulk a while. <laughs> Spread out on the back seat like a bowl of cake batter and tried to think of a guy named Joe Deneen. There was nobody on my list for that name. But the way these two gunsels acted, he was supposed to be a blood relative. I could hear him talking dimly and I tried to follow the conversation, but it was like trying to put a smoke ring in your pocket. I don't know how long the tour lasted. It must have been about 30 or 40 minutes when the car pulled up and the big gun up started to yank me. Wake up! Wake up, sweet boy! Come on, it's time for your ten o'clock feeding. Uh, yeah, wait till I borrow some legs, huh? Come on, you never look better. <laughs> All right, down the dock here. Are we playing a new game or hunting a guy named Deneen? That's right. Good, now I know the rules. Yeah. Well, is that your boat, Novak? It's got my name on is it. Is that your boat, Novak? Well, what's it look like, the Normandy? Of course it's my boat. Who threw the blood all over it? One of your friends? Maybe Deneen. Now, look, you better back up and start a recap. I never heard of Deneen, and from the size of his friends, I'm just about as happy. You mean he didn't rent a boat off you? If he used that boat, he stole it, mister. I closed up tonight at seven. You make it sound good. It is good. I've been off the waterfront four hours. In the meantime, somebody takes my boat and gets a chock full of holes and sends you around a week. Who is Deneen? A friend. I don't blame either of you for hanging on to one. You were supposed to meet him at your landing at ten. He was going to rent one of your boats, and we were going to meet him at ten. There's the boat. You want to pay the damages? We came early and found the boat piled up blood all over and no Deneen. You got any ideas? Maybe he cut himself shaving. Drag the bay, mister. I don't know your guy, but somebody did. They met him out there in the bay and cut him down. You sound happy. Now, look, I don't care one way or another except to use my boat. If he wanted to die, he should have hired a Davenport. That's all I know. I never heard of Joe Deneen. Yeah. You and your friend here better go sap somebody else. Sure, Novak. We'll look around, but hang on to your cards because you've still got a hand in this game. Thanks, Mother. I'll remember that. Watch out, Eddie! Watch out, Eddie! You all right, Eddie? Nice curve, Novak. You're wrong, mister. My friends ride the cable car. You made a bum pitch, Novak. Can I trust you? All right, let go. You can't afford a fight now. I want you for Eddie, Novak. Sorry, fellow. The water's going to be cold. <laughs> Hey, what's the trouble? Trouble going on? No. Whatever gave you that idea. I'm a night watchman over here. That fellow lying on the dock there dead? Well, if he's not, he's going to catch cold. What about the other fellow? Maybe he can't swim. What do you care? He doesn't. Oh. 
They come here looking for something? Yeah. Guess they didn't find it, huh? Somebody satisfied. They were trying to find the guy that came out of that boat down there. Oh, you mean the funny-looking guy? Huh? A guy got out of that boat a few hours ago, all banged up. I think he was in a fight. Yeah? Sure, somebody shot him. I think he was in a fight. Where'd he go? Down the dock toward the street. He asked about a fellow and went down the dock. Oh. He asked about a fellow named Novak. Do you know him? Yeah, but I'll do my best to forget. <laughs> It wasn't going to be easy to forget. I knew there was a guy wandering around San Francisco waiting to jog my memory. And before long, somebody was going to find out those two dead guys weren't doing light housekeeping down on the dock. Once homicides smelled that red meat, they'd turn Inspector Hellman loose. That's like pouring a bottle of cyanide in a wedding cake. Oh, he's a smart cop with a heart the size of a full-grown pea. I got off the dock in a hurry and I went home. When I left, the watchman was still standing there waiting to check in the next murder and smiling like a vulture with the first option on a massacre. Well, I had to get home and look sweet in case Hellman showed up. When I opened the door to my place, Hellman was on the couch with a pencil in one hand and a movie magazine in the other. Hello, Novak. You busy? No, I'll just stand here and watch you. A little more of that pencil and movie magazine routine and you'll break out in a cold sweat. Where have you been? Staying out of other people's apartments? I got an answer for that. You haven't got an answer for anything, Hellman. You can't fill in the return address envelope. What's on your mind? Can I make a call? No, not to play cat and mouse. You want to know about that bloodbath down on the dock? Say so. Yeah. They're close strangers. I never saw either of them before. You're getting loose around the mouth, Novak. Huh? That's right. If some of your playmates stub their toes, it's news to me. You better tell me, though. It'll save time. Well, what's the use? If a fact walked up and sat in your lap, you'd lose it. Suit yourself. Have a drink? Yeah, I will. Where's the bottle opener? Huh? The bottle opener. You got teeth for it. I need a bottle opener, Hell. I don't know. Try the kitchen. All right. Yeah. Try the light. Well. About this guy on the floor, Novak. Don't tell him to move because I don't think he can. <laughs> When I looked down at the guy on the floor, I felt like a burlap sack from the neck down. He was a big guy lying on his back, and you got the idea he took it hard. He didn't like the way the vote came in. Because he wasn't relaxed the way most people are when they're on the prowl for the harp. He was about as rigid as a coil of wet line on a steamer deck. His face was pockmarked in the color of an old piece of abalone. Hellman was standing over him, and the shadow cut across the lower part of his face. It almost blocked out the gun, a big thirty-eight lying about four feet away. Uh, the rest of the kitchen was a mess. It was torn up worse than a Japanese lantern in a high wind. Hellman was leaning against the cabinet and smiling like the banker in a crooked blackjack game. Does he belong to you, Novak? No, he's not pretty enough. Roll him over. We'll find out who he is. I've already been through his stuff. Wipe your hands. The green still shows. His name is Joe Deneen. <laughs> you sure we're popular, Joe. Why? The scavenger hunt. Every gun up in town's been looking for him. I figured you for the prize. Two of them picked me up and lugged me down to the waterfront. Yeah? I told you about them. They ran into bad weather. Why'd they take you? Because I looked like a bird dog, maybe. I don't know why, Elman. They just took me. In the meantime, Sunshine here took my boat out and got shot up. And he came up here to borrow your adhesive tape. That's all I know, Hellman. He must have figured me for a part. I got the same trouble, Novak. That gun on the floor helps, too. That gun second lead at best. I never saw it before. It's a murder gun. How'd it get here? I don't know. Maybe the skull remade left it. Come on, Novak. You're in the spot. You better start digging. If I do any digging, the dirt's gonna go in your face, Hellman. You've got a nice face, too, Novak. <laughs> you better buy a big shield, Hellman. You've got a lot to hide behind. Stop beefing. You're the host. What about the safety deposit box? You're ahead of me on that one. You ought to have your picture taken. He was talking about a safety deposit box when I got here. It was alive when you got here? That's right. Show more joy. The neighbors heard the shooting and phoned in. Well, who did it? What did he say? He said, tough luck, copper. That's all he said. Something about a safety deposit box and tough luck, copper. Oh, that's real fine. You let him die clammed up. You're smart, Hellman. You let him off with a third-rate tagline. You're lucky, Novak. This way it's going to take me 12 hours to wrap you up. I'm going to run that gun through and check a couple of things, and I'll be on your tail. I want to see you follow something up, Hellman. With that big nose of yours, you couldn't find a moose in the bathtub. Look, Novak, you're a small-time waterfront punk. You've been lucky so far, but you're still a punk. I don't like you, and I'm going to hang you by your heels. I'm going to get you. If it's the last thing I ever do, I'm going to get you. Hellman, if I thought you were on the level about that, I'd give myself up. <laughs> When 
snowman left danger about as dim as a glowworm at high noon. All the leaves were tucked away in the morgue. Those two stiffs on the dock checked out with nothing but a grunt, and the guy up in my place left a thirty-eight and some mild regrets. I had the funny feeling there was a lead up there in that apartment, but I couldn't get a hold of it. Something waiting to be understood, the way a thing gets balanced on the edge of your brain, half in, half out, like the melody, but not the words of an old song. Well, I didn't know where to turn. I was hunting for the shoreline on a dark night. So I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's all right, but he's got the idea that all liquid that isn't a hundred proof lacks character. I finally found him in a little bar down near Union Square. He was talking to a blonde girl and a sailor when I walked in. Ah, Pepsi! You find me in the late October of my life, trying to recapture a few April moments. Yeah, Jacko, I gotta talk to you. That's what I like about good whiskey. It makes you too sentimental to be mad at yourself for growing old. Now look, I'm in a jam. Lay off that stuff long enough to listen. Patsy, you underrate the grape. It's a terrible mistake. It's thrown off the whole perspective of history. All right, Jocko. Like that story about young Washington and the cherry tree. They blame him for that. But actually, it was his first hint of future greatness. Yeah, yeah. They talk about vandalism, whereas the truth of the matter is he was just preparing a few Manhattans for the family. The whole perspective of history has been altered, Patsy. Well, stop it, will you? I'm in trouble. Will you help me out? Yes, if you'll allow me to get a word in edgewise. What kind of trouble? There's a dead guy up in my place. Well, I don't know why you're in trouble. Think of his bleak outlook on things. Hellman's nosing around and he thinks I did it. Did you? No. He got shot in relays, but he picked my place to quit. And there are two other dead guys down on the dock. What were their practices? They strong on me about 10 o'clock and took me down to the waterfront. We were supposed to find a guy named Joe Deneen, but they looked too ripe to somebody. How about Deneen? He's that guy up at my place. When Hellman got there, he was muttering about a safety deposit box and staring at a big 38. Oh, come on. you got to help me, Jocko. Yes, sir. Where would you like me to spread the ashes? I want you to get out and find out everything you can about Joe Deneen. He's your house guest. Why don't you go? Hit the Chronicle and the Examiner Morgues and try to find out if he has a safety deposit box in any of the banks, huh? Where are you going? Uh, before prison, I mean. I'm going down and lie in Hellman's shadow until something turns up. I need every minute, Jocko, so hurry. Well, I'll, uh, I'll need a quick one for the road first. You'll get going right now, Jocko. Let's see you have a defiant attitude for a man on the doorstep to the next world. Try to be sweeter until you discover your normal disposition will do. You can uh, start by paying my bar bill. All right. Will you hurry? How much do you owe? Oh, about $11. What have you been doing all night? Are you crazy? I may owe $11, Patsy, but so far I've had a better night than you have. Good night, lover. I had to get started on some answers because once Hellman checked on those two guys at the dock, he'd go to work on me. He'd keep hacking away and finally cut me down like a piece of flint in a cigarette lighter. Well, after I left Jocko, I started down to headquarters. It was a little after midnight and the streets were wet and silent. Except that now and then you could hear a woman's laughter coming out of the dark as you passed along. That's the only sound the night keeps whole. Well, I was cutting down Leavenworth Street when it came to me. I knew what my lead was up in that apartment. It didn't hit me suddenly. It kept shoving in like a piece of old seaweed on the water, moving in and out and finally brushing up against you. If that guy was alive when Hellman got there, that meant that maybe he could have phoned somebody. And if he did, then they'd have a record of it down at the desk. Well, I got back to my place and asked the operator. Well, it feels good when you got the right sweepstakes ticket. She said a call had been put in for my place at 10.15 to the Ambrose Hotel, room 204. Well, at last, things were beginning to make sense. They must have made sense for about five seconds because Hellman called. The girl handed me the phone and he started in. I got news for you, Novak. We checked the prints on that murder gun. They don't add. Take your trouble to the chaplain, Hellman. I got my quota. Yeah. You got fancy friends, too, Novak. The prints belong to Jake Fidello. Yeah? How do you spell that? F-I-D. You're cute, aren't you, Novak? To Jake Fidello, I'm nothing. Who is he? Cheap punk like you, Novak. He's working out a 20-year stretch in Alcatraz. Huh? Yeah, Alcatraz. So there's no tie between the murder gun and the murder. Maybe Fidello bought himself a two-day furlough. We already checked. The guard saw him in his cell at 11 o'clock tonight reading the book. Guards pay the rent, too, Hellman. My boat was out in that bay tonight, and it came back full of bullets and blood. Now you're trying to tell me there's no connection. You better find out if a guy can skip Alcatraz for a few hours. I'll wait, Novak. If you can tell me how it's done before long. <laughs> Well, nothing.
Something matched now. It was like the chorus girl's legs in a cheap nightclub. If Jake Fidello was smart enough to beat Alcatraz for a couple of hours, then he wasn't dumb enough to leave that murder gun behind. And what was the connection between Deneen and Jake Fidello? And who lived at the Ambrose Hotel? Well, I went up there to find out. It was a small place up near the top of Telegraph Hill, and when I rode by, I could see Alcatraz sitting out in the bay, a lonely island full of birthdays. The Ambrose turned out to be a high-toned little joint, the sort of place with a welcome mat printed in old English. I went up to 204. The card in the door said, Frederica Sims. I knocked, and when the door opened, it was like shaking hands with a flamethrower. She was a tall number, and she screamed final edition all over. She stood in the doorway for a minute and swayed in a nice, contented way like a snake on the right diet. And then she said hello. He wanted to hand her your arm and say, twist. Good evening. Yeah. My name's Novak. I'll remember. Why don't you come in? It'll save an argument. Get in. I hope you don't mind crowds, Mr. Novak. She means me, Mr. Novak. I'm Mike Trevor. And I'm Freddie Finn. Well, that brings us up to date. A drink would do so much more. You need a drink, Mr. Novak. You look a little dusty. Don't mind her, Novak. She addresses all people as peasants. All right, now suppose you two landowners tell me who killed Joe Deneen. You know, Mark, I don't think he wants to drink. We'll all celebrate when you get around to Deneen. I don't think we know a man by the name of Deneen, particularly if he's dead. Yes, I'm sure we wouldn't like him. Come on, let's drop the smart talk. Come on, back in the saloon. A guy by the name of Joe Deneen died all over my kitchen tonight. Don't get tough, Novak. If you miss your dinner, all right, but don't come up here screaming about your dead friend. Now, look, I'm about ten feet behind a phone call. Deneen put in a call for this number just before he died. Then it was whimsy, Novak, or anything else you'd like to call it. We don't know the man. You can mull it over on your way downstairs. Yeah, and you can use the time to think over that safety deposit box. What safety deposit box? Oh, you're jumping your cue, lady. Make it more casual, huh? Do you know what you're talking about, Novak? You think so. I'll tell you what I'll do, Novak. I'll buy that key from you. You got a deal, unless you want to pay it off with money. You mean Joe, didn't you? That's right. I'm running front on a murder rap. You want that key. If you want it bad enough, come on down to headquarters and we'll make a trade. No, thanks, Novak. You didn't look bright, but I thought you might be hiding your brain somewhere. This way you lose money. You lose even more, Trevor. I was going to ease you into that murder rap, but the offer's out. You'll have to struggle in and you'll be too tired to get out. Can I loan either of you boys a pickaxe? No, thanks. Well, I'm going to run along. Can I uh, drop you anyplace, Novak? I'll stay. You know, I didn't think I could drop you anyplace. Novak, you ought to sell that gleam in your eyes. Some airport could use you. Good night, buddy. Be careful. Good night, Mike. I can take care of myself. Yes, if you try. That's all I was worried about. Your friend reads the wrong books. I'll bet you never wasted your time that way. Why don't you sit down on the couch here and have a drink, Patsy? Now that the argument's over. Is it? Well, at least we need a drink. Yeah, sure. That'll make the talk come easy. About that key. You think I want the key? Like nothing else in the world. No. That's a little rash, Patsy. But I do want it. I want it very badly. Those are famous last words, lady. You heard the round with Mike. The prices haven't changed. Mm -hmm. That's too expensive, darling. Here's your drink. What are you looking at, Patsy? You? The way you slide around on that couch? Yes. Yeah. You belong in the Everglades. If I were you, Patsy, I think you're the kind of the guy who'd be right around the next bend. You sound pretty sure. That's a good way to lose your shirt. I am sure, Patsy. I know that about us. We belong in swamp. Yeah. We belong together. Because we're the same kind. We're neither good nor bad. We just are. And that has to do. You make it sound corny, baby. Try to hide, darling, but I can see you peeking through your fingers. I can see you awfully good from here, Patsy. Watch out, you're backing into a corner, Angel. But I've got you with me. Make some more noise, huh? I like it. It's true. I've got you with me, haven't I, Patsy? I can still struggle. I'll bet you don't struggle good. I'll bet you don't struggle good at all, Patsy. I still got that key, baby. Yes, you see. It stays at my place. I could eat you, Patsy. You're wonderful. Yeah. You never inhale my drink. We'll throw it at the end of the table. Sure. That's it, darling. Oh! 
It doesn't pay much to fall in love. I spent enough time on her rug to work my way into the design. And when I finally came to, it was morning. There was nobody around the place, so I started for home. On the way, I tried to fill in the blind spots, but it was like trying to match pearls in the dark. Somebody had killed the name for the key to that safety deposit box, but where was the key? If the girl or Mike Trevor did it, then why were they still on the trail? Well, when I got to my apartment, the place was torn apart. It looked something like a mop closet after a New Year's Eve party. Jocko was sitting in the middle of the room listening to the water fizz. Good morning. Where'd you get the bump on the head? Romance. What'd you find out, Jocko? Janine had lots of friends and enemies. Yeah, one of them's Jake Fidello. Uh, he's number one on the list. Janine had a brawl with Fidello two years ago. Jake promised to square the beef. He's in a bad spot for it now. Maybe. Janine has no safety deposit box. Oh, that was my out. Perhaps you can take up folk dancing in prison. I'll send you diagrams of new steps from time to time. Uh, Fidello has a safety deposit box, though. Yeah? Yeah, he's got a lot of money floating around somewhere. Well, well. And a lot of women doing the same thing. We're getting a better shuffle now. Is the girl's name Freddie Sims? That's right. Fidello loves her like the last 15 minutes of life. That's why he won't like it. Get to the point, huh? She's supposed to be waiting for him, but she's got married in Mexico to a guy named Mike Trevor, Fidello's best friend. Does it make sense? No, it doesn't. Suppose Jake's found out about his sweetheart and best friend. Why would he kill Deneen? I don't know, except you'll find out, Patsy, that sometimes the difference between your best friend and your worst enemy is only a matter of opportunity. Yeah, Novak talking. Yeah. Uh. How's the dent in your forehead? Oh, you get around, Hellman. Yeah, we picked her up at your apartment. She tell you about that key? A little. She made a confession, too. She's generous. Not to Mike Trevor. She pinned the whole thing on him and signed a statement. We're going to have to pick him up now. I'll see you in ten minutes. Why? In case he wants to shoot somebody, I'm offering you. <laughs> <laughs> Things were moving fast now. I sent Jocko down to start repair work on the boat, and Hellman picked me up five minutes later. We drove out Geary and turned on Van S. Oh, Hellman was real subtle. He stopped right in front of the rooming house where Mike Trevor was living. The girl had mapped it out for him. Trevor was in a first-floor room. It was a quiet neighborhood. But as we opened the front door and started in, I got the idea it was going to be a tough place to get any sleep for the next few minutes. Down on the right side here. Stay ahead of me, Novak. You're one copper who will die in bed, Hellman. Down the hall and be quiet. Yeah, this is it. On this lap, you go first. Stand back while I throw it open. Got empty, Hellman. Girl said he was here. Uh, what's that? The boy's up at the top of the stairs. You see him? Oh, he's not wearing neon pants. Go up and get him. Come on down, Trevor. Your girl talks. Come on down and sign a confession. I've got a better idea, Copper. You come up and hand me the pen. All right, Novak. Move over, Hellman. He's going to argue. He's heading for the roof. Let's go. Hold it, Hellman. If that door up there is locked, we'll run right through the barrel. You get one more chance, Trevor. Come on down. That roof door is locked. All right, Copper. I'm coming down. Make a hole. <laughs> Now you got your hole, Trevor. Yeah. No, then I... You better get to that safety deposit box. Get there in a hurry. Before the girl. Oh, no, city of the metal, Hellman. Let's get to that safety deposit box. Let her have the key. What do you care, Novak? She's Fidello's girl. No, uh, no. There's a queer twist here somewhere. How do you know what's in that box? So, Fidello's in love with a girl. He's grateful. What do you care? That's what makes it good. That's the way it is with love and gratitude. The love goes on, Hellman, but the gratitude changes. <laughs> well, the way things stood, there was only one place that he could be. I got to a phone and called Jocko. I told him to check out on the boat for a key somewhere on the floorboards. 
Jocko seemed happy when he said that some girl had come by 15 minutes ago and nosed around the boat for a while. Well, Helman and I rushed down to the bank. When we got downstairs, Freddy was just starting into the vault. Hello, Patsy. You look rested. If you're on your way to that deposit box, you better think it over. Can he stop me, Copper? No, but we can hold the dough until, until we check with Fidello. Go ahead. I don't think he's going to like it. Oh, we'll have to see. I'll be back in a minute. Let's go, Novak. We can hold the dough upstairs. Well, let's hang around. I just want to see 18 carat greed when she opens that box. There's a strategy to help me. is directed and produced by William B. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and In our cast were Don Fady, Paul Avery, Harley Bear, and Kurt Evans. This program is being released to our worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is George Fenneman inviting you to be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations will bring you Pat Novak. For hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.